What is up, everybody? You caught me dancing. I think Aaron did that on purpose. Uh, welcome to Friday. I, I continuously do things on this event that I'm never going to live down. Uh, I don't know if you all saw me rip my microphone off my table yesterday, but I think it's just a trend of Elliotisms to the, uh, throughout the next uh, eight hours. Anyways, uh, we are halfway through a major event, one of the best agendas I have had the uh, pleasure of working on uh, at this wonderful company, Benzinga, and specifically in the cannabis industry. Starting off today with a really cool company out of Colorado, Tweedleaf. Uh, we're going to hear from Tim Seymour. Uh, we're going to hear from Jason Wilde and Chris Weber. Yes, that Chris Weber, a Hall of Fame basketball player. Uh, but first, I do want to say a major thank you to the Benzinga team, the Benzinga events team, uh, Nicole, Chelsea, Aaron, Rohan for being on with us, Kelsey, Sarah for helping us as well. Uh, everybody behind the scenes, logistically, sales, uh, graphic designers, anybody that helps us on these events. Thank you so much. And a huge shout out to our YouTube shows team. We had 100,000 subscribers this morning. 100,000. We have been working toward that goal for several months now. Uh, we have been putting together content, uh, education, discussions, news uh, about you know things that you all find valuable for your investing. So we'll continue to do so. Feedback is always appreciated. Please send feedback. Uh, events at Benzinga.com. You can send that any point during the day. Uh, I get it. Our team gets it. Uh, but please do send us any questions, any feedback, any way we can help you today throughout this event. Uh, all right. So a uh, little bit of housekeeping, please. We are giving away free things all day. Uh, so we're going to give another lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro, uh, the best data platform for retail investors out there. We're going to give away a lifetime subscription to our options newsletter. We're going to give away a lifetime subscription to our breakout newsletter. Uh, all you have to do is take your phone, uh, put the camera over this QR code, click the link that pops up, and participate in our polls throughout the day. Super easy. Uh, the more you participate, the more options you have to win any of the three items I just mentioned. Uh, the questions are all about cannabis. Uh, they are, you don't have to get it right. Uh, you just have to participate. That's all we want. So please take a picture or, uh, you know, hover your camera over the QR code. I'll bring this up throughout the day. Uh, we'll have another, we'll, ha we'll start with our first question here in the next hour or so uh, to get that participation rolling. Uh, we're going to hear from awesome companies uh, in the psychedelic space on this track today as well. Magic Med, X Fido. Uh, we're going to hear from Mindset Pharma. We're going to hear from Defiance ETFs. This is going to be a really exciting day to hear about uh, the potential similarities, comparing, contrasting between psychedelics, uh, between cannabis. Uh, it, I, I'm super, super excited to hear from them. Uh, on the other track, we started with Kim Rivers. Uh, from TCNNF, you all know truly one of the leading operators globally in cannabis. Uh, on this track, on this track, we're going to hear from Les Sundial. We're going to hear from the CEO of Sundial uh, in a 20 minute fireside discussion with Jeremy Burke uh, from Business Insider. Uh, very much awaiting that discussion. It's going to be awesome. Kushko. Just announced a major game-changing merger with Greenlane. Nick Kovacevic is going to be with us later on today. Uh, it's a full day of exciting content. So, again, please take uh, take your phone out, scan the QR code, uh, make sure you are participating throughout the day. You could win a major value just by participating in a few polls. Um, Y'all, we're going to talk about consolidation. We're going to talk about M and A. We're going to talk about capital flowing into the space. Uh, and the value opportunities there are for investing in it. And with that, I think I'm done. I think I <laughs> hit everything. Um, but if you have any questions, again, uh, events at Benzinga.com. With that, let's get started. Let us start on the day's event. Let's bring up our friend John Koweski. Uh, I need to stop trying to bring people up. Nicole's going to fire me. Uh, John, how are you, man? Great. Good morning, Elliot. How are you today? I am good. I'm very well. I'm I'm super excited. It's going to be a great day of content. You're starting us off strong uh, with a really cool uh, brand and retail footprint out of Colorado. So with that, I'm going to let you take it away, sir. All right. Well, thank you so much, Elliot. And we really appreciate being back on uh, Benzinga uh, for the third time. And, and thank you guys for for all your support uh, and, and what you're doing for the, for the industry. Uh, we're going to go ahead and share our 
uh, corporate uh, presentation and, and talk a little bit about what we're doing in uh, Colorado and uh, a little bit about our company. Uh, founded in uh, 2015, uh, we, we now have uh, been operating uh, in Colorado as a entity. Uh, I personally have uh, eight years of experience in the uh, cannabis business here in uh, Colorado. And uh, we're, uh, we're, we're a vertically integrated business. Uh, we, we cultivate, uh, we manufacture, and we sell to the uh, end consumer. Uh, so we're, uh, we very much focus on the experience for the end user and quality for the uh, end user. Our uh, North Star company values are to optimal uh, cultivation. Uh, we use a simple and sustainable process, all natural. Uh, made with organics. Uh, we, 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 we're we cultivators. We're the people that have been cultivating for uh, uh, quite some time and we take pride in the products that we produce, uh, whether it's cultivated products or manufactured. And uh, we work very hard to give our customers and our medical patients uh, the highest quality uh, possible cannabis for, uh, for, the, for their experience. Uh, some other things, uh, we're 100% tested and safe, uh, non-GMO and vegan. Uh, we, we do a lot of pheno uh, separation and looking for the best quality genetics uh, to produce for our customers. Uh, we, we do the following things. So we are in uh, cultivation, dispensaries, manufacturing. Uh, we have our own line of brands and we're now uh, in research and technology. Today, we have 11 dispensaries, eight cultivation facilities, and two manufacturing labs uh, and, and growing. Uh, our 11 dispensaries are all in the state of Colorado. Uh, our cultivation facilities uh, that are currently operational as well are all in Colorado and our manufacturing, although we are expanding into uh, Nevada and California uh, right now. Cultivation summary, we have uh, 204,000 uh, square feet of indoor cultivation. Uh, we have 45,000 square feet of greenhouse cultivation and 110 acre farm for uh, future development. That is all entitled for uh, marijuana. Uh, we, we grow in all three methodologies. Our indoor cultivation is our craft cannabis, uh, our highest quality, our, our greenhouse, uh, comes very close to our indoor, uh, but it's a sun-grown product, uh, which uh, also has uh, some, some benefits. And of course, our outdoor cultivation where we're growing primarily biomass for uh, extraction. Uh, some of our uh, cultivation facilities and, and expansion, uh, just uh, some, some pictures of, 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 how we, uh, of how we grow the one on the left is a, a facility uh, in Colorado Springs. Boulder was an acquisition. Uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, retrofitting that facility uh, to look more like the picture on the left. Uh, Trinidad is our, our greenhouse uh, grow. Uh, that picture on the right, that Colorado Springs 2, Baby R's Us, that's a, that's a conversion of that building to, uh, to a, to a uh, 50,000 square foot cultivation facility that's currently underway. Uh, in Denver, uh, these are some pictures of our of our grows in Denver and our outdoor farm in Ordway, Colorado. Uh, we opened our second dispensary, uh, this location in 2017. Uh, we currently uh, offer and cultivate uh, more than 100 different genetic varieties of cannabis. Uh, we manufacture uh, vape pens, distillate, wax, uh, shatter, butter, gummies, lotions, tinctures, uh, and, and of course, pre-rolls. These are some of our existing uh, tweed leaf locations uh, throughout Colorado. Uh, going left to right, Colorado Avenue uh, was our first location. North Academy, Cedar Street, Federal Boulevard in Denver, Jason Street in Denver and Park Avenue in Denver. Uh, new tweed leaf locations uh, coming right now uh, for uh, 2021 in different phases of, uh, of acquisition or uh, but going left to right, Arapahoe Avenue in Boulder. That was an acquisition we closed on January 1st. Uh, Central City, uh, that was a recent acquisition as well. Uh, that's now been converted to a tweed leaf. 
Uh, Harrison Boulevard, we're converting a uh, old village inn into a uh, tweed leaf dispensary here in Colorado Springs. Uh, the next ones are uh, future expansions that are uh, coming online as well for dispensary locations in the next couple of months. So we, we pride ourselves on, on our high quality flour. Uh, that's really the, the driver for our business. Uh, we got into this business to produce the highest quality flour at a reasonable price for consumers. Uh, we, we work very hard uh, to bring uh, both high quality flour, high quality products, and uh, great customer service to, uh, to the industry. Some of our uh, brands, uh, ranging from uh, Power Flower, Star Rocks, or of course our Tweed Leaf Flower, uh, Craft Cannabis, our edible brands, and of course our extracted brands, uh, Leaf Labs. We uh, average a very high uh, consumer rating, uh, and that's because, of, I, as mentioned, we take a very great deal of pride in, in what we produce and what we offer to the consumer, and we want the consumer to be a return customer at Tweed Leaf. Uh, that's a very high focus of ours, and, and making sure a consumer is always happy with our, our products. On research and technology, we recently filed uh, seven applications with the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. We're hoping to get a few of those approved for uh, production of uh, research-grade cannabis. That's our foray into starting as well our own uh, biotechnology company and uh, supplying as well universities, biotechs, and pharmas uh, with their the supply of cannabis for uh, R&D. Uh, we're very excited about this uh, uh, space, and we think that this is a multi-billion dollar opportunity within cannabis uh, that will we'll be uh, a leader in, in, in this space. Uh, where's our opportunity in the uh, research is, is of course, uh, we're, we're looking to develop our own in-house uh, drugs, taking formulations that we've been serving the medical community uh, for, for years. Uh, we, we're also, uh, working on IP registration of uh, some of our genetics. And uh, we do have a patent uh, that was uh, received as well uh, for the use of uh, blockchain technology and cannabis uh, that we received that patent in the uh, third quarter of uh, last year. Our DEA supply chain is to supply 261 uh, potential universities, 4,300 or sorry, uh, total universities, 25,000 biotech and pharma companies, and admin hospitals and veteran admin clinics. Uh, moving along, how we uh, see the collaborations functioning between research universities, pharmaceutical companies, biotech, Uh, we feel that uh, we, we've received several uh, letter of intents from uh, pharmaceutical companies already uh, looking to purchase a research grade, grade cannabis. Uh, we're uh, getting a guaranteed uh, supply uh, agreements in place right now. Uh, we're working on uh, offering these uh, biotechs and pharmaceutical companies and universities all of our uh, genetic varieties. and. Uh, looking at also uh, intellectual property uh, transfers and potential royalty agreements uh, with, uh, that, uh, with those markets. We're gonna talk a little bit more about our uh, expansion plans and where we're uh, looking to target. Uh, we're currently in the uh, state of Colorado. We're, we're doubling down in the state of Colorado. That's one of our main focuses. So we're looking to grow from 11 dispensaries uh, this year to uh, 20 to 25 by year end and uh, eclipse uh, uh, 30 by uh, first or second quarter of uh, next year. Uh, we're also expanding into Nevada and California. We think our winning business model of uh, vertical integration and high quality products that we can bring that into uh, additional states. We are a, a profitable uh, business. I think that's uh, also a, a, of note. We've, uh, we've been a profitable company for, for the last two years uh, and we reinvest all of our uh, monies into uh, our expansion. So uh, 
want to talk a little bit more about uh, you know our, our products and our and our vertical integration and, and kind of what our goals are as, as a company for uh, cannabis. Uh, we we built a, a pretty amazing company with uh, eight million dollars in, in, in capital. Uh, so you can see we've we've achieved uh, eleven dispensaries, two hundred and fifty thousand square feet of total cultivation, and two manufacturing facilities with eight million dollars. Uh, that's the price of what a typical MSO pays for a single dispensary. Uh, we think we manage capital better. Uh, the, the facts are, uh, uh, are, are uh, speak for themselves. Uh, we think that we can continue to grow uh, exponentially. Uh, we built a company that's targeting uh, this year uh, revenue uh, growth of uh, about 1,000% uh, from uh, 2012. 20, and we see an additional uh, <laughs> massive uh, growth of, of revenue in uh, 2022. Uh, if you're interested in actual numbers, uh, you're welcome to reach out to myself or our president, Welby Evangelista, to uh, get actual uh, data if you're interested in, in the possibility of uh, becoming a partner with us uh, or a team member on our company. Uh, what makes us successful uh, in our business is our team members. We're very grateful that we're consistently able to recruit the best quality talent in Colorado. Uh, we, we, we think we're well poised uh, to uh, become uh, a, a significant leader here in Colorado, if not the, the leader, and uh, overtake uh, the, the competition. Uh, as well, we're, as mentioned, uh, we think our business model expanding into states such as California, uh, that's that's one where we're, we're looking to get started uh, immediately and we have acquisition targets uh, underway and essentially our business model when we look at a state like California that is built on distributorship uh, where cultivators cultivate a distributor distributes and we don't necessarily know what product ends up with the end consumer. Uh, we think there's a uh, an integrity issue in the supply chain in California that we can solve with our business plan uh, and we think that by supplying high quality flour uh, in a vertical uh, company, we can uh, uh, do very, very well in, in a state like California, just as we've done here in, in Colorado. Uh, I don't know, Elliot, if you wanted to do some, uh, some Q&A with me, uh, I think you had a few Let's questions. Let's do it. We'll jump in from, uh, from here. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody, if you have a question for John, please drop in the chat, but I do. Um, you know, I, I'd love to, kind of, I guess, a couple follow-up questions on what you were saying. Uh, how are you overall targeting these state expansions? Is it proximity? Is it, um, is it strategy? Uh, you're looking at the distribution network of a California. Is it similar to the New Jersey, the Missouri, the Oklahoma? I'm curious if there's like an ideal uh, target to the state markets you're looking at. For the most part, we're looking at uh, the West Coast of the United States as a uh, and states that are uh, in the same region. Just to, it's easier to, to manage. Uh, we're we're looking at we like California because we see uh, what I say what I call a, a, a lack of integrity in the experience for the consumer in California. I think that's why the black market is so strong in California. Uh, I, I personally have uh, shopped at uh, I want to say about twenty dispensaries in the last. A uh, couple of months in California to experience uh, and and to build our business plan, and and every time I I, I go in I I, I see uh, a, a, an experience that focuses on to me on a single sale and not a repeat business. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they're they're building customer loyalty and return customer visits uh, very well, and I think that's why the black market continues to thrive. Uh, we don't want to give away all of our all of our secrets and plans of what we uh, of how we uh, see ourselves uh, eclipsing uh, other other companies in, in, in that market. But uh, we're in a very competitive market in Colorado and we continue to uh, thrive. Our month over month uh, revenue grows uh, here in Colorado. Uh, we continue to gain market share month over month uh, versus competitors. And we uh, feel very strongly that we can bring that same uh, proven business model to uh, other states and uh, and succeed. Fantastic. Uh, and then I had one follow up question about your in-house brands. I'm curious what the percentage is uh, of the revenue that you're driving from these dispensaries with those. Yeah, great question. Ellie. Thank you. So uh, today we we uh, are about 85 percent vertically integrated. 
our, our total revenue, about 50 to 55% of our sales uh, are generated from flour. And uh, the remaining percentage of about 45% of our sales are generated from uh, a, a, a array of, uh, of other products. The majority of that 45% is, uh, of course, uh, concentrates uh, and, and edibles. Uh, we think that uh, uh, our brands, uh, are, we, we put our brands uh, in our dispensaries alongside of uh, all of the major brands in Colorado. We don't necessarily carry every major brand. Uh, we kind of view ourselves as a, uh, uh, you know, a Whole Foods model where we're, where we're acting a bit as a uh, gatekeeper and controlling quality of what we're bringing in. I'll give you an example. I was trying a, uh, an eye test out every product that we put on our shelves uh, because I want to know what the quality and what the experience is for, for the end consumer. But I was testing out a gummy uh, from, a, from a top brand in Colorado uh, just yesterday and, and with our uh, chief operating officer uh, to see what we thought about the, uh, the, the, the flavor and the experience. And, uh, you know, we do this of course at the, in the evenings, but, but, uh, we, we tested out this gummy and we felt that this is one of the top brands in Colorado. And we felt that there's a minor headache in the experience. And we said to ourselves, you know, that's, that doesn't meet the quality criteria of what we're looking to put in our stores. We want every product in our stores to be of the utmost and highest quality so that the consumer knows that when they come to a tweed leaf, the products that we're offering are safe and effective. Fair enough. John, I love that answer, man. I appreciate your, your forthrightness. The DEA update's fantastic. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from you and, and seeing where this goes and maybe potentially entering the public markets in the next few years. Your footprint seems to be growing well enough that uh, I, I know I would personally be interested in, in the story here. Um, Appreciate you being here, man. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're completing our uh, our audited financials uh, as we speak uh, this month. We complete our audited financials, and uh, we do have some opportunities uh, in front of us to uh, to possibly go public or uh, uh, some some uh, some large investors coming in uh, while we're still private right before we go public. So, so we're very excited about our future as as a company. We're we're very grateful to uh, our investors, our 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 employees, and team members that. Have helped made us successful and uh, made Tweed Leaf a company that uh, you know people want to work for in, in in the state of Colorado. I love that. Hang the carrot, man. Hanging that carrot for for our retail audience here and myself Absolutely. too. <laughs> John, Absolutely. appreciate you, man. We will talk to you soon. Uh, TweedLife.com. Uh, please reach out. Uh, obviously, a fantastic company. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Take care. You too. Awesome, y'all. What a great way to start the day. Uh, with Tweed Leaf, uh, that's TweedLife.com, but Tweed Leaf, I believe, is the is the company name there. Uh, regardless, awesome, awesome company. Uh, John is obviously uh, leading some exciting expansion plans. We do have two minutes before an awesome presentation from Magic Med. You know them. They've been in the news recently. Uh, but we're going to do our first Slido poll. All right, so take a quick uh, scan with your camera. Uh, let's drop that link in the chat as well. Uh, for my peeps, but we're going to activate this. Um, so, <laughs> cannabis or psychedelics? Uh, all right, y'all, what do you think? Cannabis or psychedelics? I think both. We didn't put a both in there, but for me, it's a both, um, you know, for different reasons. But this is a cannabis capital conference, so I would expect cannabis. But I got to tell you, don't sleep on psychedelics. Uh, I'm excited for Dr. Joseph Tucker to tell us why uh, here coming up. They were recently a part of an interesting M&A uh, a deal, I should say. I don't want to say deal. I feel like that under, undersells it. Uh, and Dr. Tucker is going to tell me why. Uh, but y'all, participate. If you participate in this poll, you have a chance to win a lifetime subscription to a couple of our newsletters, to Benzinga Pro, best data platform on the market for a retail and, and investor out there. So please, please take a moment, fill this out. We have five people so far. We can do better. We can get more than five people. We have... Uh, we have tons of viewers here. All right, so I'm gonna leave that up for two more seconds. Dr. Dr. Tucker, cannabis or psychedelics? <laughs> what are you gonna say? <laughs> Hi, Elliot. I think you have to do both. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, I'm with you. We, we, we missed out on the both on this one, I gotta say. Uh, all right, y'all, I'm gonna close the voting in three, two, one. All right. 73% cannabis, 27% psychedelics. And I bet the people 
would have liked to both answer there. So you know what? I'm going to take this off. Dr. Tucker, it's fantastic to have you. Some really exciting news uh, in your uh, neck of the woods, we'll say. And I'm, I'm going to let I'm going to step out. I'm going to let you take it away and tell us what's going on. Awesome. Thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate that. And hi, everyone. Thanks for listening today. Uh, as Elliot said, I'm Dr. Joseph Tucker, the CEO of Magic Med. Um, and, and I am going to jump straight into that first piece of news that Elliot uh, referred to there. We did just announce uh, less than two weeks ago now, signing a definitive agreement to be acquired by Enveric Bio. They are NASDAQ listed. Their ticker is ENVB. Um, and we're, we're really excited about it because we really think this is a very much a transformative event for both companies. Now, Magic Med, uh, we have been focused since inception in the psychedelics medicine space. And I'll tell you about that uh, in a moment. We've been focused really on the creation of new molecules, again, based on psychedelics, but designed to have better attributes and to take those molecules through the discovery and the preclinical, but we didn't have in-house our own clinical development capabilities. And that's where we're super excited now to be working with Enveric. So Enveric, they're in the cannabis space, just like we were talking about, Elliot, we're in psychedelics and Varic is in the cannabinoid space and they're doing clinical trials. They don't have discovery. They do clinical trials all the way through new drug approval. So together, I think that's truly transformative. Now we have a complete end to end company from discovery all the way through clinical trials with psychedelics and cannabinoids and focused entirely on central nervous system, diseases, disorders, and what we like to say, mind and body. So let me now jump in and I'll tell you a bit more about Magic Med specifically. Uh, we've been focused on the mental health market. This is, of course, you know, a massive market, a quarter of a trillion spent every year just in North America trying to treat a variety of mental health challenges. And, you know, this, of course, is very prevalent. Everybody's either had something or has somebody in their family or a close friend had some kind of challenge. We, we all are touched by this. But I think the really kind of scary to me, the scary statistic is that when you ask people, how's the treatment going? Pretty much half say, it's not working. I need something better. And I think that has really laid the groundwork for the psychedelics, this new paradigm that's been so exciting, really kind of blown up in the last couple of years. It's because psychedelics seem to provide a new way of trying to treat, you know, this, this ubiquitous mental health challenges that our society faces. So on the dollar side, you can see on the slide, north of 50 billion, 50 billion is being spent every year right now on drugs. But, but those drugs to treat psychedelics, those are, those are pills you put in a bottle and you send home with a patient. And what's going on right now in the psychedelics sector mostly isn't that. It's mostly about let's take these old molecules like LSD or magic mushrooms or ayahuasca. Let's take these old molecules and in an in-clinic setting, highly controlled setting with a psychologist, psychotherapist to take you through the experience, let's administer to a patient like that. And while I think we all hope that that becomes a, a very potent you know, new paradigm, I think also everybody recognizes that you're not going to get to the largest number of patients with that kind of a setting, you know, in part because of the very potent hallucinations that you have to experience going through that paradigm. Where the big opportunity is to get the most patients, and of course the biggest market, is to improve those psychedelics, make them more like the classic paradigm of pills in a bottle you can send home with a patient by muting the side effects and, and really just making them more amenable to daily use. So that is what Magic Med is focusing on. In order to make those modifications, those new molecules, we have to work with academic institutions because we need leading edge science, technology that doesn't even exist in big pharma, in the industry. You have to go to the academic institutions. We work very closely with the University of Calgary, their biology department, their chemistry department, and their faculty of medicine are all working with us in this program. So let me just, I just, I don't want to get all crazy and, and, you know, science propeller head, but there is an important distinction on what we're doing versus other companies in the space that also recognize the need 
for better molecules, better drugs. So your standard, your go-to strategy is chemistry. It's been around for hundreds of years. Everybody uses it. And chemistry is great up until you need to make some difficult chemical reactions that are maybe expensive or, or difficult. And then we go, and this is where we bring in the secret sauce, if you will, synthetic biology. So what that means is we go to nature. Nature makes enzymes. Enzymes do to, to you know, take 20 years of, of research and distill it into a sentence. Enzymes make difficult chemical reactions easier to do. So we take enzymes, we take chemistry, we put them together. Now we're able to create molecules that nature never made and that chemists are not able to make. And we put all of those new drug candidates, those improved psychedelics into a portfolio that we call the Cybrary. And uh, by the way, I came up with that. I, I very clever, I know, psychedelics library, but I think it conveys the message, which is psychedelic derived molecules, many, many, many new psychedelic derived molecules, new drug candidates, plus the patents that protect them. Because this is another important thing in, you know, in pharma and in particular in the psychedelic sector is those new molecules actually give you the opportunity for patent protection because it's a new molecule. It didn't exist in nature, as opposed to the companies that are unfortunately stuck working with the older molecules like LSD, magic mushrooms. You really can't patent those. And frankly, you shouldn't be allowed to. Um, so why do we care about a new molecule? And, and so here's why. Why do we need the cyber? Basically, if you think about it, a, a drug is, you know, this, this molecule you're taking to make yourself better. It's like a key that you need to fit into a lock, the lock being the receptor in the body for it. And in order to get that key to fit perfectly, you have to have the teeth exactly right. And that's where the companies that are stuck working with just a small number of existing molecules have a challenge, right? If, if you've got to open a, a lock on a street and you happen to have four keys, what are the chances those keys are perfect? Not, not super high, but if you can go and modify those keys and the way, of course, you modify a key is you change the teeth, right? You have your core key blank and then you change the teeth. So if you can change the teeth, now you can actually design that ideal drug candidate. And so that's exactly what we do. We start with the core molecule of psilocybin. In this case, you can see on the slide. And we change the teeth, the little red letters on the outside. And we can change all those different, you know, all these different permutations until you get the teeth that exactly fit into the receptor, exactly that lock. And that allows you to make the exact right drug that you're looking for. So the cyber is actually very large. We started with the psilocybin key blank. And then we're adding the mescaline, the ibogaine, and the LSD. These are all, let's say, key blanks that we're changing the teeth on that allows us to file many patents, but more importantly, to make millions or, or even hundreds of millions of possible new drugs. And that's a really big pile of keys to fish through. So, you know, we're pretty excited because we think this is great. We've solved the big problem somewhere in this pile of keys, somewhere we're going to have you know, exactly the right drug for each different mental health indication that we all want to target. Of course, we realized after we did that, that we created a new issue for ourselves. If we're going to pull that needle out of the haystack. That's going to be tricky. We need to come up with something clever. We don't want to screen 200 million different potential drugs. So that's why we have the second part of our platform, which we call Psy AI. It means psychedelics, artificial intelligence. And the way it works is we start with the cyber, these new molecules that never existed before. We make several hundred of them and we test them in a whole bunch of different locks, a whole bunch of different receptors in the body. Again, these molecules never existed before, so no one was able to test them before. And we take all that information. How do these different molecules work in the different receptors? We plug it into a proprietary artificial intelligence program that asks the question, okay, based on all of these, how should I design my next few hundred drugs, my next few hundred keys that I want to then try and run through the cycle again? Because what's my goal here? Make the best possible drug, gives you the best possible outcome for the patient with the least side effects. And then you can actually go and make them, test them, get your AI to tell you some more, make it again, you can tell that if you do just a few cycles of this, 
what you're going to do is narrow, rapidly narrow down to get to those ideal keys, those ideal drugs, as if you'd screened all 100 million possible drugs, but only having to screen a few hundred or a few thousand. So another benefit that comes out of this is because we're creating all these molecules and testing them on all these different receptors in the body, that's going to enable us to be much more rapid about the early parts of drug development, which typically are very time consuming, that R&D in the preclinical stage, that should move much more quickly now. And now this one is, this is new. This is, you know, thanks again to this exciting merger with Enviric Biosciences. I mentioned before that Magic Med has never had the clinical development capabilities in-house. But now by merging with Enviric, we can actually go from research, from discovery, all the way to clinical trials, all the way through clinical trials, ultimately to new drug approval, all in one entity. So we're, we're super excited about that transformation. So one other thing that you may have realized, we've realized it, is that between the Cybrary making so many potential drugs and the Cy AI making screening much more powerful and much more rapid, that we anticipate we're gonna make more high value drug candidates than we can test even with our own internal clinical development program. And so those excess high quality, high value drug candidates, we intend to partner off to other companies, big biotechs, big pharmas, which of course will be a great revenue generator and, and royalty down the road, but also I think a very important validation of what it is we're doing. So the management, one of the, you know, there's so many great things about this merger, but another one is the management. Because of the complementarity between the two teams, there's really very little overlap, very little redundancy. So the, the new combined management team really has folks from both sides. So you see myself on the left there, Dr. Joseph Tucker, CEO, uh, and I will be the CEO of Enveric when we combine the two companies. Uh, Dr. Peter Ficini and Dr. Jill Hagel, I've been working with them for the last eight years. I, I've been myself a biotech drug developer, mostly in the CNS sector for the last 20. But the last eight, I've been working with Peter and Jill specifically in this field of taking high value drug candidates from plants or, or nature, for example, opiates, um, for example, cannabinoids, and now psychedelics. And we've been using synthetic biology to make better molecules. We actually had a cannabinoid company a few years ago that we took public, Willow Biosciences. You may have heard of it. Uh, and then moving on to the board, I'm not going to spend much time here, but I do want to point out that David Johnson, the current CEO of Enveric, he will be elevated to executive chair once the two companies are combined. And as I said, I will become the CEO. But the other thing that I really want you to pay attention to in the psychedelic space is it really is about drug development. It really is a pharmaceutical. And so what you need are people that are not necessarily folks that have spent 20 years experimenting with psychedelics. What you need are people that have 20, 30, 40 years of drug development, of getting things through the clinical trial process. And that's exactly what our board is comprised of. So I just want to end off by really sort of painting a picture. Where is this company going? And again, so excited about the transformation, the Enveric Magic Med combination. Now we've become really an end-to-end -end from discovery all the way through to approval, clinical development program with a very robust pipeline. And, you know, that's how you have big, successful companies. You know, anybody can tell you, you take a look and say, how do you have a big successful exit? Well, you need to have a big, robust pipeline with a lot of great data being generated. That's how you get there. That's what we're building. So in 2021, what's the combined entity? Well, you know, of, of course, there's the closing, the, the uh, uh, shareholder approval that you have to go through. But, you know, very importantly, our first clinical trial, uh, we call EV101 in glioblastoma, our first phase one, two, that's cannabinoid-based drug. That's going to start this year, 2021. 2022, we'll complete the enrollment on that, but we'll also add our second drug, EV102 for radiation dermatitis, another cannabinoid drug. That's going to start its phase one, two next year. 
And our first psychedelic drug, so you can see we got them both, our first psychedelic drug is going to start lead selection in 2022. And then 2023, I think we're really going to see this pipeline start to explode. We're expecting the data readout on drug number one, enrollment completion on drug number two, uh, beginning of first uh, phase one, two for drug number three, another cannabinoid-based drug for chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. We're going to see IND enabling studies for drug number four, cannabinoid, drug number five, psychedelic. Our first psychedelic and our second psychedelic will be in lead selection by 2023 as well. So you can see very quickly, you know, what a transformation I think this, this has enabled us to have psychedelics, cannabinoids, full robust clinical pipeline moving forward very quickly in the next few years. I'm super excited about it. Um, and I hope you find it as, as exciting as I do. I think what I'll do there, we've just got a few minutes left. I'll stop sharing my screen and I would be very happy to, oh, if I can, I'd be very happy to address <laughs> any questions. Thank you. Dr. you Dr. That was fantastic. Uh, super interesting. Congratulations to you and then the whole Magic Med team on the Inver Inveric or Inverich? Inveric. With a Inveric. Uh, I have, I've been going back and forth myself. So no <laughs> thank you for clearing that up. Inveric, E-N-V-B, the proposed CEO, Dr. Tucker, uh, current CEO of Magic Med. I'm curious, uh, maybe if you could help me on a broad scale here, because I think a lot of our investors are probably a little newer to psychedelics. So if they're considering investing in a company uh, that has psychedelics activations, um, you, you know, what, what, should, what do you tell them? What do you tell them to look for in that company? Obviously, I think you were talking about uh, patents, R&D, drug development, things of that nature. But what, what should they specifically be looking for when they do their research and due diligence? Yeah. Awesome question, Elliot. I, I really think there's two things that an investor should be paying attention to in this space. Um, for the classic psychedelics, psilocybin and LSD and those kinds of things, I think there's, there's really only a first mover advantage. I think if you're not one of those first few companies, you're at great risk. Uh, again, with the classic psychedelics, and it's because of the inability, honestly, to put patents on those molecules. So it's very going to be heavily weighted towards first mover. I think the second thing to look for is as this industry is maturing, which it is doing very rapidly, the investor base is shifting. So initially, a ton of retail investors in particular in Canada. And what we're seeing right now is I think a very powerful shift. We've seen it reflected in the market towards sophisticated life science investors who recognize that this is a pharmaceutical play. And that's why you see this great desire to move to the NASDAQ. That's how you get the attention and the focus of the sophisticated lifestyle um, life science investors. There's two. Right now, psychedelics companies on the NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. Within Veric, we will now be in a very small group of psychedelics companies listed on the NASDAQ. And that's, you know, you got to get the sophisticated investors paying attention to you. And you got to have patentability for that second wave. That's what I'd be looking for as an investor. Man, that was wonderful. <laughs> Honestly, it helps me because uh, I am currently invested in some psychedelics companies. So it definitely changes what it, I mean. It emphasizes what I should be looking at, we'll say. Uh, we are about at time, but you're going to be joining us on a panel uh, a little bit later today uh, discussing psychedelics within the public markets. Uh, so I think, please, uh, we'll continue that conversation there. Uh, it's a wonderful panel. Looking forward to having you back, Dr. Tucker. Awesome. Thanks very much, Elliot. Thank you. Fantastic, y'all. Uh, incredible uh, presentation. Very excited um, to to, to hear more uh, about the psychedelics investing uh, about investing within psychedelics. So um, we, we have a couple presentations on different sides of, of life when it comes to psychedelics, uh, to cannabis. Uh, we are going to be hitting the public cannabis side of life here uh, with somebody you may have seen before. Uh, his name is Jesus uh, Quintero. I'm going to bring him up and let him correct me uh, on <laughs> <laughs> how to pronounce your name, but you are the CEO and chairman of Marijuana Company of America. You know, Javier has been working with me on name pronunciation. Uh, so I just want to see if I can do this. Jesus Quintero. You did a great job. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Jesus, it's a pleasure to have you back. We had a wonderful conversation with you on Cannabis Hour uh, a month or two ago, and I, you were the hit, the, the hit, the talk of the party. 
So I'm gonna let you take it away, get started on your presentation. If we have time for questions, I'll be back on uh, post. Excellent, thank you so much. And it's thank you and it's great to be back. Uh, we had great responses to our last presentation on the Benzinga conference, and it was great. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. We've had a lot of uh, exciting things happen to us over the past uh, couple of months since then. Uh, just kind of roll through that just quickly. As we talk about our company, uh, basically a lot of things have occurred. We've made some initial investments in uh, the cannabis industry. Once again, for those of you who don't know who we are, we're Marijuana Company of America. We trade on the OTC markets under the symbol MCOA. We're a diversified company with operations and investments throughout the cannabis industry. Uh, we basically, the core of our business is we grow a lot of premium CBD organic products, which we we have different types, and we basically <clears throat> offer those products to our customers, and we've expanded our customer base. We've kind of changed the way we've been. We used to be a R&D company, which now we're a product marketing company, and we're really looking to diversify ourselves. Um, you know, we have a co we're a company with a mission as we want to become an international leader in the cannabinoid industry. We're trying to grow our business organically as well as through acquisitions. What our goal is to grow as an organization and be able to provide high quality products and support to our customers and work as partners with our partners, our vendors. And, you know, we want to be able to expand. Basically, when we talk about um, Marijuana Company of America, the core of what we do is basically hemp smart, or not hemp smart, but hemp products. Our brand name is Hemp Smart, which we sell different types of products. And we believe, you know, where our philosophy is, our more, our brand is a brand you can trust. And Hemp Smart is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, MCOA, which sells all the CBD products. And a lot of products that we have are. We have drops, we have um, a brain pill that's patented, and we have pain creams, body lotions, and face creams. The key to our products is that we do something that many competitors don't do. We double test our products. We test the products at the organic at the organic level, or excuse me, the, the how should I say the ingredient level, and we also test it after formulation. So we basically go through two processes. It's uh, we invest a, a lot more because we wanna make sure that our products are, are durable, that they're you know excellent, safe, and customer confidence is extremely important to us. And we've been able to really do that over the years. Now in 2021, we've rebranded our products. We've come up with a new website. We develop a new e-commerce website for our customers so they can buy directly from the company. Uh, it's at hempsmart.com. We've rebranded, relabeled, and now what we're doing is we have a different philosophy. In addition to selling the products, we're trying to ex extend ourselves in the market to our customers. The pandemic has brought a lot of depression to people and you know, life is not as good as it used to be. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to do more than just sell the products. We wanna offer the products which affects the lives of people. But in addition to that, we wanna extend ourselves. So now we're working a lot with social media as a new marketing strategy, we're working with um, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, to offer customers social media interaction so that not only do they have the products, but we send Twitters, we send our, uh, messages out to let them know that they're not alone, to let the customers know that, hey, you know, not only are we putting products in your hands, but we're also reaching out to let you know that we're with you. We want to be able to do that so that we can help grow our customer base and not only grow it, but also really establish a bond between our customers which, um, you know, I consider uh, MCOA, uh, you know, a diversified business, but by the same token, we consider ourselves a people business. We care about our customers. We care about anyone that works with us, be it vendors or strategic partners for that matter. So on this screen, as you can see, we have our products that we offer, uh, which you can see we have the Smart Drops. We have the NeuroSmart, the patented brain pills. Our brain pill is patented, and it's one of the few in the industry that is patented. We're very proud of that particular product, and it does help with uh, focus. And uh, you know, we want to be able to really expand that product across the globe. Uh, we have a smart cream that is very effective; is one of our more popular products, as it penetrates the skin and be able to provide uh, less, you know, to help you with pain and discomfort. And all these products are organic and they're plant, you know, they're plant-based, and they try to help with anxiety, pain, and in some cases, insomnia. 
And of course, our products do not have any THC. Uh, one of the more exciting news for us, uh, which just occurred recently, is we made an acquisition of a company called CD Stro. CD Stro is one of the leaders in the hemp industry in terms of distribution. It works with a lot of distribution companies. It sells a lot of different types of CBD brand products. Uh, they have their wholesaler base is about 250, and they work with C stores and other retailers and dispensaries. Uh, this was a major acquisition for us because um, this is a company that's really growing. It's really on the move. They have great partner relationships, and they're really expanding. And uh, the synergies between the two companies is enormous. We believe together as partners, we're going to make a really big hit as we try to expand on hemp products. That's the base of what we do. We do CBD, we do hemp products, and they are going to help us in, in those lines of achieving that goal. In addition to our, to our acquisition, we continue to work with our strategic partners, companies that are kind of in line with what we do mm -hmm. and how together we can actually um, kind of have great synergies and partnerships that can actually expand businesses, not just for us, but also for them as they themselves start to grow and offer their products to the marketplace. Um, one of our, one of our um, strategic partners is Cannabis Global. Cannabis Global, Cannabis Global is a Los Angeles-based company. It's a public company under the symbol, symbol CBGL. And they offer a lot of different products. Most of the products is basically within the area of science of cannabis with IP, intellectual properties, and innovative R&D. And they've offered other types of uh, products such as the uh, Comply Bag, for cannabis storage, transport, and tracking, which is really going to be very revolutionary, and they're going to make a big difference. We work with them exclusively. Some of their products they offer, we incorporate in our product lines, and it's been a great partnership so far, and we see it growing even bigger. EcoX, uh, Eco Innovation Group is another company that's also trading on the OTC, and they work a lot with new investor technologies that can promote environmental and social well-being. We're extremely excited to work with them because they they also offer product lines and they offer unique opportunities for us to really expand our product base and opportunities to you know make a difference in the cannabis industry. Their technologies that they're offering and their inventions are going to be really really exciting, and we're we're working with them you know diligently, and we're we're excited to move forward. Natural Plant Extract is, an, is a manufacturer and a distributor of a, a licensed cannabis manufacturing distributor in California. We have an investment in them and we try to work with them strategically. And we're very excited. We are actually, we just signed an agreement. We're leasing them equipment that they can use in their business, which will create revenues for us as well, which increases our revenue base uh, to include now leasing opportunities, which is great for us as we continue to expand. One of the things that a lot of people have asked me the question, what's the difference between MCOA and other type of CBD companies? What, what makes you any different from anybody else? One of the things that we want to be is, one, we want to be a leader uh, in our industry. And one way to do that is not just to focus on the saturated markets, which we are involved in the saturated markets because we, we want to compete. We want to be out there because we have a lot of great products to offer. We have great business strategies. But in addition to that, we also, what makes us really different is we want to expand and go where we can be market leaders. For example, we expanded now, we have a new, a new joint venture now in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, with our business partner and one of our board members who's helping us expand into the country of Brazil, which is very exciting with the population there. And CBD is extremely popular. We're working through the distribution channels and making sure we're in compliance there. And we're very excited. We already have, without selling a product yet, and but working through social media advertising, we already have over 2,200 followings in Brazil and we've only been doing it for about 30 days. So we're very excited about that and we really want to make a significant impact in that market. What's important is that CBD can really help and enhance the lives of people. And in Brazil, there's a big need. There are people that really need the product. Um, in their history previously, CBD was actually considered illegal because of the way it was being processed. People were, some people were actually getting sick from it. Whereas here we come with a product that's double tested. We've actually given away products to people there uh, through physicians, of course. 
And it's been a tremendous hit. The physicians are very excited as we work through them to offer it to their patients. And it's been fantastic for us and it continues to grow. And we're looking to be really fully operationally there within the next 45 days. And by then we should be able to in, be in the market. We have people with boots on the ground already there. We're very excited. Another country we'll be expanding into is the country of Uruguay, where we want to be able to go into that market, which is very receptive to CBD. In addition to that, we're trying to strategize and see if we can put some of our manufacturing there, which would make our costs more effective for our products, which makes us more competitive. And that way we can offer our products to countries like Brazil and Uruguay at a normal local price instead of using US dollar rates. Obviously, with the economies of scale, people in those countries could not afford products at U.S. price levels. But by being able to manufacture locally in one of the countries and being able to distribute it locally in Latin America, it's more cost effective and it you know, gives us the opportunity to sell our products and introduce ourselves. In Uruguay, we're, like we said, we're already establishing a company and we're trying to and we're working with our lawyers to establish ourselves in a fee trade zone, which means we would literally have no sales or exportation taxes. We're very excited about that as we continue to try to penetrate those markets and become leaders in those markets. We have a new investor website and as we launch our e-commerce platform, we're very excited about that as people now can see more of the company in terms of our investor site, as well as our HempSmart e-commerce site as well. One of the things we want to do as a cannabis leader is we really want to diversify ourselves. We want to be able to expand ourselves and create a, a very enhanced and exciting um, investor and sales um, sales you know experience. We want to be able to grow that. Uh, I think we've I think in the past we haven't been able to reach out to our investors like we'd like to. Now we are. We really want our investors to feel the experience of watching their investment grow and diversify itself. With all that said, here's a picture of our management team. We have a diversified group of people, very dedicated to being able to provide the, the highest quality products, customer service, and we really dedicate ourselves to what we do. We believe in what we do. Um, everyone that's here is a big part of our team. We're all together. We all really do whatever it takes to make sure that our customers, our business partners, our vendors are you know, working diligently and successfully with us. We really care about everyone that works with our team. Here you see our leadership team, which is basically my board of directors, which we're very proud of. We have a lot of great individuals with high profiles, with a lot of experience. Uh, very exciting. One of one person that I'm always very excited about is Eddie Manolos. Mr. Edward Manolos was the first cannabis leader with the first dispensary in Los Angeles well over 30 years ago. And he's extremely successful, brings a lot of experience in sales, distribution, and we basically are very fortunate to have him as he continues to bring a lot of value to our board, as well as Marco Guerrero, who's our board member that runs Latin America and has brought us into Brazil. And we're looking to expand even more into Latin America with, with his help. And also on the other side, we have a lot of strategic partners. Robert Heimer is my strategic consultant, is extremely um, important in what we do. He's, he's my right-hand person, you could say. And he brings a lot of diversification, a lot of experience. He's been very instrumental in helping us to our success. And uh, of course, our medical advisor, Paula Vetter, is, you know, without a doubt, one of the most important persons we have in our company, as she is the catalyst and she reviews all of our products, formulations, ingredients to make sure we're organic and that we can grow in terms of being a real, real, um, people, company that can offer products that really will make a difference in the lives of others. She's also involved with our research and development to develop new CBD products that can make a difference. And we're very excited to work with her. We work hand in hand. When her and I work, it's not about only dollars and cents. It's about making the difference, which what is what CBD does and, and effect, as it affects the human body. And Tony Shore, who's a very instrumental part, he really works with me. Uh, in my investor relations, he's a great, you know, coach. He's a great guy. He really uh, steers us in the right direction in terms of being able to effectively, responsibly uh, communicate with our investors and let the investors know what we're doing, who we are, where we walk, how we walk, 
and he's very instrumental as well. Here is some information on our company. We're on the OTC markets under MCOA. You can see our information by stock price, market cap, shares, etc. You can also see all of our financial information if you go to our website. We have, uh, we have information on our financials that have been recently filed. You can also go to sec.gov and you can see our 10 Qs and 10 Ks, which pretty much talks about everything that we've, you know, we've accomplished. Um, and basically that's MCOA. Basically who we are is, like I said, we're a diversified company. We're, we used to be R&D. We're really trying to grow. We're really trying to be a real leader in the industry. And our goal is to reach out to our customers increase and improve our customer base by being able to interact, offer great products. We, we've enhanced our investor website so that our investors can have a better view and understanding of who we are and to see how their investments will be driven to enhance and improve their, their, their stock prices and investments. Our goal is to improve what we do in terms of not just from a stock perspective, our main goal is to focus on the core business, to be able to grow it organically and through acquisitions. And we will continue to do acquisitions as we go forward, where we find companies in the cannabis industry that may have distressed situations. And we can be able to step in to not just acquire them, but to actually enhance and improve what their situations are, to make them better than what they are, so they can reach their full potential. That is what we look for. We're looking to make MCOA a real leader in this industry, not just by increasing sales, but also by working through strong partnerships so that we can develop and actually create a circular wheel of success. So all of us together as a team can work and grow and build and do you know great things that can make a difference out there in the lives of people and also grow for our investors so they can see profitability and be able to see ourselves go financially. So with that and said, I'll leave myself we, open to questions. Yeah, we do have a couple questions here for you, Jesus. Um, okay. Let's show this one. Uh, yeah, so do you plan to use an RS this fiscal year and are you looking at an uplisting in any time in the near future? Whatever you can say there, of course. Um, right now, as we uh, work through 2021 and uh, we're trying to, yes, we do want to uplist. We want to go back to the OTCQB. Um, we're working to see how we can get there. We Our asset base, as we increased, we were like almost, I don't know, $500,000 in assets. Now we're almost three point, we're about almost $4 million in assets. So we're really trying to grow that as we work through our operations and our new acquisitions and communicate to the market. Obviously, you know, We've seen some interesting increases in our stock price based on the market's activity and fluctuations. Although we don't focus 100% on the stock market in terms of the pricing, I focus more on the core business because if we do well operationally, the stock price will take care of itself, so to speak. Fair so, enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, fair enough. You're you're absolutely right. <laughs> Successfully, successful operations will lead to re to rewards for sure. Yeah, we, try, uh, we try not to uh, lose ourselves in the shuffle. I think it's important to really, we have a responsibility to our shareholders to really build a strong business, be able to grow it, and be successful with it. Amen. Jesus, I love listening to you talk, man, and I love your approach to this industry. Much needed. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Um, if if uh, they'd like to reach you, to reach out, is there a, an email that they can they can send some questions to? Yes, my email is Jesus at hesmart.com. Fantastic. Or the, email, or the email here that's on the screen, you can see it, info at MCOA Investments. I have a person that actually works with the questions and actually steers them to me so that I can answer. Perfect. Awesome, Jesus. Very much appreciate you being here, sir, uh, and looking forward to hearing more out of you and you know just following your success because that's what it's looking like right now. Thank you so much, and it's great to be back, and I hope to be able to be back again. Yes, sir. All right. We'll see you soon, Hazers. Be well. Thank you. Take care. All right, everybody. Uh, that was uh, Jesus Quintero, the CEO and chairman of Marijuana Company of America. They really truly are making giant strides under his leadership. So please uh, add them to your watch list. Invest it if you find them to be a good opportunity. No recommendations here. Uh, We're here to facilitate the conversation uh, between you all. So 
Uh, all right, we're going to keep moving. I know we are going to drop the Slido link in the chat again, please. And then after Tim, I will do our next poll. Um, very excited to bring over Tim Moore, the CEO of Haven Life Sciences. How are you, Tim? I'm doing great, Elliot. I'm just having a technical glitch here with trying to share my screen. So I don't know why the window keeps disappearing. Take your time. Take your time. We will uh, get that shortly. It worked, it worked great in rehearsal. You know, that's what, <laughs> isn't that what magicians always say. Absolutely. I was better before you saw me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Tim, you are a Haven. That's H A V N. You are listed on the CSC, H A V N O T C, H A V L F. Um, so, uh, another amazing company, I believe, in the psychedelic space. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I'm, I'm very excited to hear from you. It's it's an interesting conversation we're, we're having around psychedelics today and uh, what we can look for to invest in them. Yeah, it's uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing my story with your uh, with your audience as soon as I can. Um, Don't worry, I'll, I'll bump you back down, and once your once your screen share is, is figured out, I'll do another uh, poll here with the audience, um, and then uh, maybe we can uh, once we get the screen up, we can we can continue here. Oh, looks like I see it. Yeah, you do. Sorry, I'm there. All right, we're good to go. All right, I'm out of here, Tim. I'll let you take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for showing some interest in Haven Life and uh, welcome to our, our story. Um, I'm going to start just with a little background on myself and why I'm here. Um, I'm a career packaged goods person. I've spent 35 years in the consumer packaged goods space, 18 years at Clorox, uh, seven years running the North America Brita business, a few other stops along the way. Um, I spent some time in the cannabis space uh, as a result of uh, personal experience. I, I've got five sons. My oldest is 35, my youngest is uh, 24. I've dealt with mental health issues with them over the last three decades. Uh, my middle son was hit with a, by a drunk driver six years ago, became an opioid addict. Um, and he's recovered now because cannabis saved his life and that was my motivation to get into the cannabis space. When I saw the promise that uh, psychedelics and psychoactives offer for things like uh, PTSD and anxiety and depression and so on, I was excited to be part of that industry, and so I joined Haven Life. I mean, I, I had a suicidal 14-year-old. I saw what that was like. I have two kids with anxiety disorder. So I've been, I've been, I've got the scar tissue, and now I'm in the industry that's going to help uh, a lot of people. So I'm really excited to be part of it and looking forward to offering hope to people because that's what I think we're in is the industry of hope. So um, we, um, our mission is to. Um, using um, evidence-based research, focus on quality controlled extraction of psychedelic compounds, as well as natural health products, where we're focused on uh, cognitive health and human performance. And we do that through uh, two uh, core business units. Um, our Haven Labs unit is um, uh, building a facility in Vancouver where we'll be cultivating mushrooms, extracting compounds. We're currently um, prototyping those and, and qualifying those uh, protocols in uh, Jamaica where we built out a, a smaller facility where we have our first crop and we're doing our extraction work. Uh, we've partnered with the GMP lab there which will allow us to export. What we saw was a, an opportunity in the market to create a library of naturally derived compounds to support uh, uh, researchers, clinicians and eventually formulators. Our second business is Haven Retail. Uh, That's a very traditional packaged goods business. We uh, just this week launched our first seven SKUs. I'll come back to that in several slides. But it's, um, uh, again, um, mushroom and plant-based products as an alternative to pharmaceuticals to assist people in a number of different areas. Uh, we're launching in Canada right now. We've got our e-commerce site up, and we plan to roll to additional markets, uh, the U.S. next year and, and beyond in, in future years. Um, to support that diverse strategy, we've got a, a diverse and complementary uh, team. Myself, with my packaged goods experience, our science officer, chief science officer, Gary Leong, um, who comes to us from Jameson Labs and from um, Afria. Uh, Dr. Ivan Castleman has, uh, is a third generation cannabis person who's been working in psychedelics uh, the last uh, five or six years. He has a PhD in plant-based compounds. Uh, Alex, the chemist, is our chief uh, research officer 
He's the one that's leading our extraction team. Uh, Jenna Poser has 18 years in the uh, uh, nutraceutical space, and she's our chief operating officer leading our, our uh, business on the uh, nutraceutical uh, nutritional supplement side. Um, our board and advisory board, with Vic Newfeld, who also comes from Jameson Labs, he uh, he's, uh, spent some time at AFRI as the chairman there, as the CEO there. Uh, Dr. David Mokler is on faculty at the University of New England. Uh, he's done research in psychedelics for, for, for decades. He teaches PhDs in the space. Alan Oberman has a pharmaceutical background. He was with Teva uh, Pharmaceuticals. He was uh, based in Israel for a while and ran their Middle East and Africa business. And then back in the US and ran their America's business, which is about a $13 billion uh, pharmaceutical business. Uh, Tim Laidler is a veteran. He serves on our board. Uh, he's currently the executive director of the Institute for Veterans Education and Transition, which is located at UBC. Uh, Sheila Copps is a uh, former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. Um, she worked with Indigenous people to get them uh, legal access to uh, plant-based and other alternative uh, remedies. And David King is with uh, King's College in the UK and is, uh, is a well-known um, uh, uh, expert on psychedelics as well. So what we're seeing is the convergence of some megatrends, which is why we're seeing the, the mushroom boom right now and, and why we see the opportunity for Haven Life to be so tremendous. First, we have mental health. Um, we have you know, millions and millions of people affected. 11% of the population has some form of mental health issues. That's growing. Um, and it's, it, it, the, the uh, COVID pandemic is going to lead to additional mental health issues, in, in my opinion. Um, we haven't seen a, um, uh, something of this scale since the Second World War that's affected so many people, whether they lost their jobs, lost a loved one, lost a business, someone died, they couldn't visit them in the hospital, they couldn't have a funeral, whatever it is, there's been some profound um, uh, events that have affected people and we can't expect that there won't be some mental health consequences from that. And then the healthcare workers that have been working with battlefield conditions. I mean, when, when was the last time we, we built temporary morgues? I, I don't remember it in my lifetime. So mental health is a large and growing issue. The second, and, and, and a very expensive issue. I mean, billions of dollars spent on, 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 on pharmaceuticals, on treatments, uh, billions of dollars lost in productivity. So it's a, a huge issue. Um, the second trend we're seeing is a change in the attitude towards mental health. It wasn't that long ago that we called these people crazy and put them in the silence and sanatoriums. Um, now it's okay to not be okay to seek treatment, to say you're getting treatment. So more and more people are coming forward and seeking treatment. There are also more and more people that are rejecting pharmaceuticals, whether it's uh, uh, weight gain or uh, sexual dysfunction or dependency or whatever. There's a lot of people seeking alternatives. So there's a lot of self-medication taking place. So attitudes toward mental health and treatment of mental health have changed a lot. And then the third trend is public policy, where uh, the policymakers are recognizing that the other two trends are taking place. In Canada, we're seeing an increased number of exemptions for end-of-life compassionate care or for psychedelic-assisted therapy. As that uh, continues to grow, the uh, government's going to be required to provide people with a safe and reliable supply. That's where Haven Life comes in, providing that safe and reliable supply. We were the first company to be granted a Section 56 exemption from Health Canada, which allowed us to um, do research in the last year on quality and um, uh, uh, quantity of psilocybin in our processes. We did that in a lab, and now we're, we're validating those processes, as I said, in Jamaica. Um, another major trend is functional mushrooms, which is the opportunity that we have with the uh, nutritional supplements. Functional mushrooms is a very fast-growing market projected to be $35 billion by 2024. And it's a global opportunity. So people are seeking an alternative, whether it's for pharmaceuticals or for functional foods or nutritional supplements. So our two paths to market, on, on Haven Retail, we've already launched our products. We'll be in revenue this month. We'll build that revenue as we expand our retail uh, customer base and expand our, our e-commerce uh, platforms. And we'll continue to um, build out our portfolio of products. We are also offering a white label service. We've signed our first white label customer. We'll be manufacturing products for them, um, and we're in negotiations with, with others. On Haven Labs, uh, because we're going to be a supplier of API to researchers, we'll be able to be in revenue this year. Our Jamaica facility will have a psilocybin API that we'll be able to export to our supply agreement customers. We have several of those agreements um, signed, and we've had several others in um, discussion. In addition to that, we'll be expanding that uh, 
that footprint to other geographies as well. So, um, you know, looking forward to this year, we're working on building out the lab um, in Vancouver and getting our dealer's license so that next year we can supply uh, our psychedelic compounds to uh, clinicians and researchers around the world. Uh, we're doing it in a GMP facility. Frankly, it's pretty easy to grow mushrooms. I mean, just unplug your refrigerator and wait a few days and you're going to be growing mushrooms. What's really difficult is to grow mushrooms in a GMP compliant facility so that it can be used as API in FDA approved uh, clinical trials and in pharmaceuticals. So we, we've spent a, a good deal of time in developing the protocols which currently don't exist for the GMP cultivation and extraction of naturally derived compounds. So we're building the state-of-the-art facility. Um, it, we expect to have it operational by the end of this year and licensed uh, sometime by the around the beginning of 2022. And in the meantime, we'll use the Jamaica facility where uh, psilocybin is seen as a functional food and falls under the Ministry of Agriculture rather than under the Ministry of Health. Um, one of our core focus areas is veterans. It's a sad statistic that more veterans have committed suicide than died in the Afghanistan war. Um, we partner with Heroic Hearts in the UK, the US, and in Canada. Um, they are a lobby group as well as offering uh, retreats for veterans. So we're a supplier to them as well as a supporter of, of their uh, programs. Um, as I said, there's currently no um, standardized programs, standardized protocols for um, cultivation of mushrooms to GMP standards. And, and that's really white space that we, uh, we're exploiting and, and see that that is a place that we can defend as a, a unique position. Um, a lot of the focus is on microdosing. So microdosing is uh, uh, a therapeutic dose that does not have the, the uh, psychedelic consequences. Uh, if you want to see what a psychedelic experience is like, on Netflix, watch uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's show Goop Lab, season one, episode one. She takes her team to a psychedelic retreat in uh, Jamaica. Um, and what you'll see is it's a very intense experience. You really need to have a guide with you, someone that, that is qualified to deal with the emotional consequences of that experience. So microdosing offers the promise of that therapeutic benefit, but without the consequence of losing a day or a weekend. And, and frankly, it's a better business model. So a lot of the research and work that we're doing is focused on microdosing. Um, on, the, on the nutraceutical side, we're leveraging a well-established uh, consumer behavior. 74% of Canadians take nutritional supplements on a regular basis. Uh, it's a growing business. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in Canada and the U.S. And so, you know, small market share can lead to a significant revenue. Um, our, our portfolio of nutritional supplements is focused on uh, mindfulness, stress, anxiety, and immunity. Our first seven SKUs are shown here. Um, they've now shipped and are available. If you want to go to our uh, yourhavenlife.com, you can see them. If you feel like ordering them, they're available there for shipment to Canada or the U.S. today. The uh, indications for them, mind mushroom against immunity and energy, uh, memory and mood support, mental fatigue, stress, anti-inflammatory antioxidant, brain and body balance, energy booster, and Zen support. All of our products are non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and we use extracts which provide a uh, greater concentration of the, of the active uh, ingredients and a um, better purity and a, easier to dose. We've recently acquired a manufacturing facility in Vancouver, which allows us to um, leverage their existing revenue stream as well as um, expand our, our distribution to those customers. It also lets us bring our um, some of our manufacturing in-house to improve our cost of goods and it will support our uh, white labeling program because we'll be able to do um, additional packaging work in our facility. Um, our roadmap, we, uh, as I said, we're working on getting our dealer's license this year. We're in the middle of that uh, process. We submitted to Health Canada uh, last year. Uh, it's normally a 270 days uh, application cycle, but um, Health Canada is currently distracted with the pandemic, so that's been taking longer. We're still on track, though, to have the facility ready. Um, on the retail side, we'll continue to build out a portfolio. We're going into the functional food space and looking to add additional SKUs this year to, again, uh, leverage the uh, growing consumer demand for functional foods with functional mushrooms. Next year, we'll be expanding our markets for both uh, retail and labs. Um, 
market cap right now is um, uh, slightly under $100 million, which leaves a lot of upside for shareholders. We see an opportunity for uh, building additional value through M&A activity. Um, we have already done one transaction. We're looking at, at some others. Uh, we see places to accelerate and amplify our business plan by acquiring businesses that are complementary to our business strategy. Our cap table, uh, we have 114 million shares outstanding. We have no debt. We have cash on hand to cover our, our roadmap through the um, balance of this fiscal year. And uh, we're looking forward to what comes next. With that, Elliot, I'll come back to you. Fantastic, Tim. You guys are doing some really uh, admirable things. I do want to point out for all you literal thinkers, I don't think he was recommending unplugging your refrigerator. I don't, I don't think that is uh, a part of the experiment of growing psychedelic. But that being said, Tim, uh, you have a very, very interesting company. We were talking to Dr. Joseph Tucker earlier from Magic Med, uh, and you know he was, he was saying if you're an early entrant into the psychedelic industry, uh, it, it bodes well for the company. And you already have SKUs. You already have uh, sounds like seven different lines, uh, you know, up and running. Um, you know, do you agree with that? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. So we, we think that um, first mover advantage is a big deal. I mean, we actually have a crop of psychedelic mushrooms growing in a legal facility in Jamaica under GMP conditions, which will allow us to export it. So I think that, you know, um, that does give us an advantage. Um, we are also, you know, we, we, I think it's important that we've taken the words and made them into actions. And I'm very proud of what our team has accomplished in getting these seven SKUs launched this week. I mean, when I got, you know, when I got my sample box, I was excited, right? And it's like, this stuff is real. And, you know, it's um, when, when people can say, here's my real product, right? And it's, you know, it's not words anymore. Um, and frankly, we, the team did that. It's a, we're startup. It's a small team. And we did that in less than a year and during a pandemic. Um, and so it's, it is going to be hard for people to catch up to us. So yeah, let's leverage the fact that there were a first mover and we've got things going. I love that, Tim. I love that. So what milestones are, are you looking for in the balance of maybe this year and next year? Uh, just so we can like maybe look for, look for some timelines uh, in terms of your future here. Um, the next uh, step, we're going to go live on Amazon in the next week or so. Um, that's exciting. So that will expand our audience for our, our retail products pretty significantly. Um, our website's up and operational. And it's funny, we turned it on the night before we went live and we had orders in the first few minutes. It was kind of exciting. So, um, but yeah, Amazon is an important milestone. Uh, additional retail customers that we'll be able to announce uh, will be important. Um, new SKUs, we have 16 SKUs that are currently in development. We just need to choose which ones of those we want to take to market um, on the nutritional supplement side. Uh, and then on the lab side, I think the milestone will be actually exporting API from Jamaica to another market um, to be the first company to have done that. And we're, we're expecting to see that in the coming months as well. Um, and as I said earlier, the, another important milestone will be the completion of our lab in Vancouver and securing our dealer's license. So that's what we expect to happen in the balance of this year. It's a lot, um, and uh, but we're focused. Yeah, no, I've focused and uh, obviously a lot of good news to come, Tim. So appreciate you being here and sharing your story now. Several people in the chat enjoyed hearing from you. Um, we actually, if you can answer in 30 seconds, we do have a question that just came up. Uh, sorry, does, does Haven have any patents or ongoing regulatory testing programs, if you can hit on that shortly? Yeah, we, um, we have one preclinical trial on inflammation and immunity that's in field right now uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Mokler. Um, and we um, are in due diligence on it. We just closed a transaction with um, acquiring a uh, IP, a patent on a combination of uh, drugs for treating cluster headaches. So yes, we have a patent and we do have a trial. Perfect. Tim, thank you so much for being here with us. Haven Life Science is obviously a great story, great company, lots of news to come. Uh, and I look forward to catching up with you again in the next few months to see what's, go see what's happened. Thanks a lot. Everybody have a great day. Take care. Yeah, be well. Fantastic. So that was Tim Moore, CEO of Haven Life Sciences. Uh, 
Uh, awesome company. Great story. I think if you're an early mover in the psychedelics companies or in the psychedelic space, uh, you generally have a great story like Tim's, but you know, he's put it into action and lots of, lots of news to come. So we've had tons of requests for the Slido poll and I'm here to grant your wishes. So uh, let us do this. Next question, which company are you most excited to hear from today? Sundial, CBD of Denver, True Leave, Columbia Care, Air Wellness, Magic Med, Gage, Slang, or other? I don't know how you guys answer that. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm imagining, you know, there, there's one company here that'll stand out just due to volume. But, you know, it, for me, all of these companies are incredible. We're going to hear from Gage right after our next presenter, who is one of the best educators uh, in the Benzinga family, Anne Marie Bain. She's going to be up here in just a couple minutes. Uh, but y'all participate in this and you have the opportunity to win a lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro or lifetime subscriptions to Benzinga's options newsletter or Benzinga's breakout newsletter. So if you participate, you might get free things. How fun is that? And you get to and you get to tell us who you're looking forward to hearing from. Uh, so I don't know if you guys know much about CBDD, uh, Columbia Care, Air Wellness, uh, but I mean, they're all doing great things in different markets. Uh, and, and are all going to be big players in this industry. Um, so I'll leave that up for a couple more seconds. I will close voting in 10 seconds. We have 10 seconds to participate. You just take your camera, hold it over the QR code, uh, hit the link and vote. So like five seconds left, I'm going to close voting. All right. Well, this is close to five and we are going to lock it in. Sundial Growers is the winner. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> awesome. I'm adding Anne-Marie Bain to the chat. I'm going to get out of here. They're here for you, not me. Anne-Marie, good to see you. I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you very much. It's my first time with you, Elliot, so this is going to be fun. Um, so sitting in this cannabis space, what we really want to learn about when we invest is where might things look like they're doing the best and what might we think about in terms of making the choices right because we do have choices our finances are not limitless uh, though we might like them to be and sometimes we trade like they are they're not and so being part i do want to apologize if you hear any noise there's construction going on the other side of the house and so I'm as far away, but I still hear it coming through drilling and stuff. So forget about that. Hopefully you can. So my thought is, as you look at through all of these uh, cannabis positions, you've got to come to the space where you go, okay, what do I invest in and what do I hold for long term or take the trade on? And so you've got to think about things from two perspectives. Am I trading this or am I investing in this? because it's got a future runway. Now, a lot of the cannabis and uh, microdosing psilocybin sort of spaces are very forward moving in terms of thought because they're still illegal in many states and certainly at the federal level. So what we want to see is our legislators First, making this something that uh, they're going to endorse. Because remember, at the end of the day, with the stroke of a pen, they can say, you know, I don't think so. Not that it might not turn around, but this is the thought that you should always have in the back of your mind. What do we need to see in terms of saying, where is the end of this road or is it continuing now um because i'm on a travel machine my office is back there elliot i need for you to come on when i have about five or ten minutes left so i can Done. thank you so yeah, much of course and uh, are you going to share a screen just in case uh you I... are we're not seeing it yet okay so i i do have a Share, share file. Okay, in Chrome tab. All right, 
There it is. Okay. We'll Fantastic. All right. Great. Right. Great, great, great. Okay. So what we're looking at is one of the several of the choices that um, you went through in terms of looking at people want to hear from. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when you're thinking about how is a stock performing relative to the others, one of the first things you can do is use a, a big ETF that has a combination of all of the different um, companies that are liked or they should figure are sitting in this space. And you can see the form. It was doing very well in February. And then we had ourselves a little bit of a rollover. And in general, the ETF that corresponds to the broad space of uh, cannabis looks like this. So if you're thinking to yourself, all right, do I want one that looks better than this? Or am I thinking that there's one that might be underpriced that's going to rise? And so the, the last folks that we had on is a great one to look at because, is this one right? Yes, this is it. So this one that we just, the gentleman, the CEO, Tim, that we just heard from, this is their chart. And so you can see that compared to not Tokyo, but Toke, I think that's a hilarious name for an ETF, but it's definitely underperforming what's going on right now, right? I wish I had a compare so that we could see that more plainly, but this is an underperforming company in terms of what it is that's going on. Doesn't mean that it can't lift, and it's great that they've got things in the pipeline, but they're a little bit out of favor, and so you can think to yourself, well, wait a second, do I like that presentation well enough to go, you know, I'm gonna make a little bit of an introductory position in here and wait for it to rise because I think they've got a lot on the ball. Or if you're thinking about trading, you end up looking at something like, my goodness, my fingers. You look at something like Tilray, which looks very much like the ETF or the favorite sundial which also has the same shape, but at a really, a fairly good price. And so this chart I like because here's what's happened. When a chart moves, and remember this, we invest in the market to make money. If you believe in the product, then you buy it and you use it and you share it and you recommend it. But if you are looking for an investment grade product that you're going to buy and hold, you want to see how big hands believe that it's performing. And so one of the very interesting things that Sundial has done in the very recent past, it's had its opening, it faded savagely, raised savagely, pulled back, lost its breakout, but is now sitting right above it as we speak today. So the question then becomes, what's most likely for this price pattern? Notice it has the same shape as the ETF, and it also has the same shape as Tilray. Right? The same thing. What it hasn't done what Tilray hasn't done is retested any of its breakout levels and recaptured besides this highest one. So the big thing that we see in cannabis, me as someone who's looking always for investment grade vehicles, the thing that I like about what's happening in the cannabis space right now is there are mergers and shifts of strengthening boards on the uh, at the CEO and chairman of the board levels, these sorts of 
operations where people know what needs to be done to get business to market and to get it to market well, they're now starting to come onto these boards and making a real difference in how these products get to market. And I think Sundial is going to be one of those interesting ones that really has got exponential growth that could very well give us exactly what we want, which is a combination of a company that we like, a company that we might use its products, and a company that's showing from the investment world that it's holding a measure of frontline support. So we're going to look at it in a couple of ways. When you trade, the first thing that you want to look at is where is support and where is resistance? The two most important things you will ever learn from technical space is where is the last time people sold and then bought again? And that number is right here around 70. Now we're sitting at maybe a buck 20. And so that's about 60, 70% away from where this support zone is. So if you're saying to yourself, listen, I want to take an introductory trade that says my old support is new resistance. And can I make this bigger that way? Nope. Candles. All right. If I want to make old support that was resistance to become support again, I'm going to think to myself, well, wait a second. Last time they did that, they broke all the way down to this wick at 92 cents and then they started bouncing. So for me, I'm going to look somewhere around 92 cents to 93 cents to take an introductory position. Is that aggressive in terms of saying, wow, what if it turns around and runs without you? Yes, it is. And that is risk. But here's what I want to share with you. If I were to put um, a line here, and that is, you know, can I really do that? If I were to draw a line from high to lower high to lower high, I would see that I've got a trend that's still negative. If I use a line from here to here to here, I also have a trend that is still negative. And when you have a trend that is negative, what will happen is the following. And I'm going to show you this way. Let's say you've got a trend that just fell off a cliff. Everything's negative. And you're looking for the chance that it's going to break back out. So you're going to go to a gap or anything like that, and you're going to say, okay, wick, wick, I'm going to draw this line, and what I have to see to show strength to hold long-term is a hold over 171. That is still going to be your number to watch. So if you happen to make it on dip or you own it from very low, when it gets here, take some profit and wait for it to rotate backwards so you can add to your position again. That's called a rounding, trading around the position and watching the rounding that holds as support. So watch this, wick, wick. This is the one we got. So we're right up here and we're thinking to ourselves, oh my goodness, this is the breakout. But in any negative rotation, what a chart will do is first, stop heading lower. The second thing it'll do is bounce into resistance. And then the third thing it will do is pull back to hold support. And guess what happened here? If we look at this as support, it broke right through it. What does this mean for you and me as we are trading and looking for a good investment level to trade here? It means that we have to wait as it comes up into this area. Let's say we catch it here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve days to figure out whether that's the breakout pattern or not. If it held here, 
you could have said, all right, as it bounces up over here, I'm going to take it and my new stop will be $1.34 right there under the old wedge. But remember this, whenever a chart is breaking out of a range or a trade action event that's got negative drift, you're going to see the same thing every single time. If you're a bottom picker, this is what you'll do. You'll go, you'll say, ooh, I want to see if it holds this level right here. What it has to do is stop holding lower lows and lower highs. And so here's what happened. We had a low and then a lower low and a lower high. And boom, there's our first thing that says, I could be changing direction. I've stopped holding lower. I've bounced up and I've now closed above these levels. And we'll expand it some more so you can see that. It's above these levels. And so for the next trade, if this old support gets jammed through, I'm going to put an order in and I'm going to try and buy it at that old support. Some of us rush out and just buy and then things fade back onto us. But here is the absolute truth. When a chart has negative pressure, it is absolutely going to bounce into resistance and fade into frontline support if it is doing a normal rotation. And if that negative drift is very high, it's going to move from one level of resistance to the next. And so this tells you where your target formation is if you're trading from one level of support to the next level of resistance. And the moment you come to a day where you go, wow, I am failing to close higher. Your next spot will be, am I breaking my old resistance that now should hold as support? Well, it holds that area, opens and pulls upward, but does not break the high. And this is the formation that you look for when you're going short. It looks like this. One, I fail to close higher than the day before. You go to the next candlestick, just two candlesticks over, and you say, all right, what's the low to the close there? That's going to be my support zone. If I bounce off of that zone, but I do not break the last high close, my next candlestick tells me I can short. Where am I going to short to? My last area of support, if it holds, I can now move this as a stop and I can walk down the level. Again, how do you know when to stay in a trade? Oh, it's bouncing. Yes, but does it break resistance? Old support, new resistance, I'm staying in the trade. Down, down, bounce. Does it break resistance? No, I'm staying in the trade. And this is how you stay in a position. Many traders will say, I don't know when to get out. This is how it looks. Especially if it's got downward pressure and you're trying to trade long. For the opposite, it's going to look just like this. One, you're going to fail to hold lower. But you're not going to be able to close a candlestick over, here it is, old support. Old support resistance. One, I hold my low, but I can't break resistance. It means it's still a short. I hold my low, but I can't break resistance. It still means my bounces are shorts. Holds the low. All of this says, listen, I can stay in this short. The big thing that you start seeing is the following. Where is the support level and as am I going lower? If you're not headed lower, that means that buyers are starting to pile in at the support levels that make people go, yeah, I can't get it lower than that. Everybody, anytime I send it out there to sell, the buyers go, absolutely, I'll take it. So this area 
in this sideways pressure of many, many days is really forming a base that says, you know what? I've got some good support action sitting right here because every time I come into 69, somebody buys it. I buy it 70 and I'm holding on. So what do you want to see? One, here is the resistance zone. So if you want to be certain or as certain as you can be, you wait for it to break the zone. And then the first pullback into the area gives you the buy point and the edge of your last area of congestion becomes your risk. Could you get stopped out there? Yes. But it's already told you, hey, as long as I don't lose this level, meaning I don't close the day under this level, I'm going to be all right. What's happening here today is the bounce is pulling us into a gap fill. Listen, anytime you see price action gap up, anticipate that there are groups of traders that will say, you know what, I'm going to trade the gap because we don't like a vacuum in our volume profiles. And so this is what's happened. They're trying to fill in this space. Now, let's say based on today, you have the, the uh, sundial folks coming on later. This chart's going to spike. People are going to say, you know, I'm going to buy a little bit here. I'm going to buy a little bit here. I'm going to buy a little bit here. It doesn't mean it won't fade. And if you do buy, remember that your stop zone is now this area that says, hey, I could come all the way into 80 cents. I really could come into 68, but 80 is where it might be going. And so this rotation of, hey, I'm not heading lower anymore. Let me draw a line right there. That's my support edge. So if I want to trade and try to pick a bottom, I want to see it bounce into the near-term resistance, and I want to see it pull back and hold a higher support level. And that might mean you buy it here at 73 when you know the stop is 67 or so, and you manage the risk in that sort of way. Or if you are the type that says, hey, I want to buy, and this is going to be an investment, it might wick down, but I know it's going to hold. If it wicks down and it can't get back up over your 80, then you know there's trouble. Are there any charts that you want to look at to break down, to compare against, to see in terms of the folks that are presenting how they might look in the grand scheme of things? Always. <laughs> um, what about, let's see, do we want to keep it to NASDAQ and NICE? We can do anything you like. Okay. Uh, what about consortium? C-N-T-M-F. C-N-T-N. M-F. M. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. So, wow. What happened here? That's interesting. <laughs> what a wick. <laughs> so, take a look at this. This is actually a very nice chart. So you might go, why? But it's a nice chart because the participants are very even-handed. You're not seeing massive motion in terms of, wow, I'm moving in, except for this crazy thing, don't know what happened there. But you're not seeing, um, savagery that makes you go, oh my gosh, I can't sleep tonight because I've got a thousand shares sitting here. What's interesting is that over the long term, how long have these guys been around? Okay, so they went live in June of uh, 2020. Wow, more part of them. And so they held steady at around this 38. And so they're really, what, three... 320% higher than they were here. And then they have these lovely lifts that come in and just about hold their support zone. And now they're really, 
they got some pretty good traction going, right? Now, is this a is this a, a formation that makes you say to yourself, "Ooh, this is going to make me a, a million dollars?" Not yet, because it's not moving uh, in terms of catching on. So, what makes a chart successful from a trading perspective? Well, from a trading perspective, we want to buy low and sell high or we want to sell high to open and buy low to close. Right now, momentum has not hit this chart. It's really range bound in the current formation and the high of $1.30 has not been tested since April of this year. And so this is going to be where everybody's gonna say, here's where the rubber meets the road. If it breaks out over this level, it's only got shallow pullbacks. And here's the thing. There's a saying in trading. It's the bigger the base, the higher in space. And so the longer it holds traction here without dipping below, when it does break, there are going to be a lot of people saying, here we go. Let's watch it. And so this is a great one to put on your list and say, all right, I want to see when it gets to 127. And when it gets back to 127, I'm going to start putting it on my daily ticker events that I'm going to watch. And once it gets up over there, because it's had a base that is so long, we can compare it to the last place that it had a base that went for a very long time. It actually moved, what, what is that percentage? It goes from 86 to 136. So that's about, I don't know, 87% or so up in the space. That's a big move, 87%, 85%. And then it comes right back down and take a look. Old resistance, new support. And that was the last time you got to add to the position at a really nice support level. So as it breaks out, you're going to look for really a little bit above where it is today at 112 or so. And you're going to wait for it to get up above that 130, 140 area. And then you're going to watch it spike and then fade. When it fades and holds this zone, let's say it fades, but it never comes back to the 140 level and it stays up above the 150 zone, you know it's going to hit a momentum space. So this is going to be a very interesting thing to watch. I would say put your alert to when it gets to about a buck 27 and then watch it move again how does a chart move when it's expanding the first thing it does it fails to hold lower second thing it does it breaks into resistance the third thing it does it pulls back and it holds its support zone from that area you get to go you know what here's my buy space how about another love that that was fantastic. Uh, we do have a couple that aren't presenting in this conference, but I am interested to see your thoughts on Hexo, H-E-X-O. Okay, so this one, this one looks very strong, comparatively speaking, right? Here's the open resistance slash resistance. Here's why this happens psychologically. You get in at the IPO and it starts falling and you're like, grief, I've got 10,000 shares here. I'm just waiting until it gets back to the old high and I'm getting out. This is exactly the psychology of the double top. That is the psychology of the double top. People get freaked out because they're trapped in the trade they lose the belief they had in the company and they just trim their gains and so what this has done is it did the lower congestion reversal but it held the lows always important 
Then it goes to the next highest rejection area and it holds a new support zone. Old resistance here, it holds this zone. And then everyone's thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, here's a head and shoulders pattern. Listen, head and shoulders patterns are relative motions and a very good chart guy named Tom Bolkowski says the most that you can really expect out of an out of a head and shoulders is 50% from the neckline to the head. Now we can measure that, we can eyeball it. So we have 670 to 1105, so that's uh what is that? 5 dollars not even five dollars right so four and something so the break should be half of that only two dollars minimum two dollars is what you're going to get so it's going to go from 650 to 450 doesn't even it goes to 514. do not use head and shoulders patterns to trade um they are anecdotal okay so they're bad and they give you no precision. You know exactly what's going on if you count your candle formations. And so this one looks really good. It faded a lot less than things like Tilray or Toke or a number of different things. And it's pulled back, look, old resistance, new support. So now it's in a little bit of a range. Here's the thing, high, lower high, lower high, low, lower low, lower low. Charles Dow gave us the definition of trend. So this is in a short-term negative trend with a clear base at 540. So when we are looking at this bounce out, like it did a few days ago, what should we be thinking? Resistance, resistance sellers are going to come in. What happens when a chart is changing direction? It bounces, stops heading lower, bounces into resistance, pulls back and holds the present low. So let's go here. It did the same thing here. Look, we think to ourselves, wow, that's a green candle, but it's still lower. So no, sorry. Next one, we know our resistance edge is right here, old support, new resistance. It's sitting here. What it starts doing is stop. It stops heading lower. And when it stops heading lower, we wait for it to break through resistance. And then on the pullback, we get to buy. Now, this is a daily chart. Here's the magnificent thing. You can do this on a four hour. You can do this on a one hour. You can do this on a 30 minute. If your brain is big enough, you can do it on a five minute. My brain is not big enough. It's really hard to do it over and over again on a five minute formation because you're constantly recalibrating what's going on with motion. And so starting from a daily formation and say, okay, where are these guys going? Listen, this is telling us we are likely to head higher just so long as we hold support. So if we're looking at this and we're thinking, ooh, we got a gap fill, all the cannabis had a ton of them gapped up four or five days ago, I think the fade is going to give us a good buy zone. And there's your support. Where is the big level that you don't need to break if you're in Hexo? Uh, you don't want it to break five. You don't. But the chart is clearly exploring where the last line of support was. That's really what they're seeing. The traders are saying, all right, show me the last area people were really enthusiastic about buying. I'm going to look back to the left and I'm going to say, all right, where did they try to buy? Even though they failed, they tried to buy here. And it held. And I say that's down here near 624, which really only gives you about, well, I mean, that's a fair amount if you say, hey, 560 is my stop from a trading perspective. But watch for these guys to pull back into the formation 
and begin to bounce here before you think about getting involved in the trade. Listen, if you use moving averages and VWAPs, they, they are meant to be guides, but they are the first and second derivatives of price. And anytime you use a derivative of something, it loses the essence of what it actually is. I hear you. Yeah, Anne Marie, that was awesome. I don't, I didn't mean to, I didn't want to like cut you off mid sentence. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> uh, that honestly, uh, some really wonderful breakdowns. We are at about time. Do you kind of want to leave us with a thought uh, on the cannabis industry as a whole, and maybe uh, your thoughts on investing in cannabis stocks right now? Okay, so my thought is the following: investing is a commitment. And a commitment to a belief in a company, a belief in a product, or a series of products, or a business line, right? If a portfolio manager is building something, he wants the business case from an investment perspective. And I believe that there are two places that the cannabis industry has. It's got a trading space and an investment space. And from an investment space, we really are at the kernel event. And so that means if you buy, you're going to have a great commitment to the business and that business therefore must deliver to you certain objectives because, uh, cannabis is traded the way that it is, I would say use it as a trading vehicle until there's more government backing. Because with one stroke of a pen, your investment could be completely nullified, essentially. Not saying that's going to happen. But you've got to prepare for, wait a second, what if this money I put in here gets gone? Is it going to be okay with me? Am I going to be okay with that? Yeah. Emery, really wise words. And thank you so much again for being here with us. It's my I pleasure. I love listening to you. It's my first time getting to uh, kind of navigate this, but I, I learned a ton just being able to listen to you firsthand. Thank you very much. I yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you. We'll Good see you luck. soon. Thank you, yes. Emery. Take care. You as well. Bye -bye. Fantastic. All right, everybody. So we went through Sundial. We went through Hexo. Uh, we talked a little bit about Tilray. Awesome companies. Uh, we talked about Consortium. Uh, fantastic. I'm super excited, right? A uh, couple reasons here. I'm going to put this poll up. I want you guys to answer this question for me as we talk. I'm going to unlock the voting. Go for it. Blank is the main psychoactive compound in cannabis that produces the high sensation. Uh, so as you all answer that for me, uh, we have two presentations coming up uh, from Gage Cannabis, one of, if not the leading player in one of the largest markets, markets in the U.S., being Michigan. Uh, and then after that, we have Merrimed, a company that's been around forever, um, led by our very own, I, I believe, Maureen, our new cannabis editor here. But they are uh, seeing a nice uptick in in cash flow, in operations, Merrimed is really uh, on an upward trend. And I'm super excited to hear from these two companies. Um, so what do you all say? THC uh, is the main psychoactive compound in cannabis that produces the high sensation. Uh, I'm going to close this down in 10 seconds. I do want to say we have two tracks, um, bounce back and forth. Obviously, my track is cooler. Please like and subscribe. We did hit 100,000 subscribers this morning. This morning. So let's hit a million subscribers. Why not? Um, well, probably because we have 237 people on the track. Um, <laughs> Y'all, uh, please uh, participate. You could win free items. I'm going to close this down in five, four, three, two, one. Great. THC. Eh, almost everybody was correct. But you know what? If you're not, you learn something. Fantastic. Uh, we'll do the next poll after Fabian. Uh, we'll get Fabian up here shortly, but please participate. You could win lifetime Benzinga Pro subscription or newsletter subscriptions. Mighty Soldiers. I love Andy. Uh, track two is where it's at. That's what I'm talking about. Um, all right, y'all. And then at 1210, we have Sundial. Never heard of them. 
Um, all right, let's bring Fabian up. He is the CEO of Gage Cannabis. The man, how are you doing, sir? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me on again. Good. Oh, it's always glad to have you, man. You are, I, I would say, new player, but like I feel like that doesn't grasp uh, the importance of Gage uh, in the cannabis industry right now. So I'm going to let you tell us all about it, man. I'm going to get out of your way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Appreciate you joining. My name is Fabian Monaco. I'm the CEO and director of Gage, also one of its co-founders. Uh, Gage is uh, solely focused on the Michigan market. Uh, we've been solely focused on the Michigan market since inception. We knew Michigan was going to be a massive, massive market. Uh, you could see from the 2008 caregiver program, that's when it was introduced. Michigan blossomed to the second largest cardholder system in the U.S. from a medical standpoint, only behind California. For, for many, many years, all the way up until 2020. And so for us, we could recognize early on that Michigan was going to be a force to be reckoned with. In 2019, it was outside of the top 10, catapulted itself to the top six in 2020, and now is already number three in terms of run rate, only behind California and Colorado. And this is in terms of yearly run rates, close to 1.9 billion as of April sales of 154 million. And that's ahead of Illinois ahead of Florida, ahead of a lot of other big states that people think are, you know, illustrious states to be in, which don't get me wrong, they are, they are great consuming states as well. But Michigan is really, really rising to the top here in terms of consumption. It has a great dynamic. Over 70% of the population is of age to consume. And frankly, this dynamic, in addition to the great medical patient underlying base, it's really Michigan blossom in, a, in, in, in an exponential way, frankly. You can see from just this chart, how fast Michigan has grown. Michigan State has it pegged at a $3 billion market over the next couple of years. I think it's going to be even double that. If you take a look at how Michigan has been able to progress from 2019 to 2020 to now 2021, it's, it, it's, a, it's a stark stark and substantial difference. Uh, we're very encouraged by you know, how the company is performing and not only how the state is performing in 2021, and we're really excited for, for what's to come. Uh, at Gage, we're uh, one of the larger vertically integrated companies in the state of Michigan. Uh, we have deep operational expertise with our team having a variety of North American uh, licensed producer experience. Also, on the other side of things, myself included, uh, a lot of deep capital markets experience. We know, you know, what take, you know what it took to take a company public. Obviously, we are publicly traded. We trade under uh, GAG, under the CSC. And on the OTC, uh, on G-A-E-G-F, <clears throat> again, that's G-A-E-G-F on the OTC. We're on the pink sheets now, hoping to upgrade to the QX, OTC QX quite soon. So as I mentioned, we're one of the larger vertically integrated companies in Michigan. We have three of our own cultivation assets, five contract manufacturing assets on the cultivation side. So there's eight different facilities that are growing Gage branded product right now. We have 13 uh, retail locations looking to move that to 20 locations by the end of this year. Of the 13 that we have, nine are operational. We also have three processing assets. One is operational and the other two are coming online very, very soon, especially as well, our processing asset, which is hopefully coming online near the beginning of Q3, which will bring a huge, huge influx and an expansion in margin for us. Uh, what makes us really special is just some of the operating highlights that you see here. Our average basket size is industry leading at 164. And that's a consistent basket size as well. I'm not cherry picking on you know one store here, one store there in a given week or a given month. That is across our full retail channels in the 2020 year. If you take a look at our Q1 results, we had top line growth of over 60%. We went from 10 million in Q4 to now 17.6 million in Q1. Further expansion is coming in Q2 as we've got it to 25 plus million in Q2 in terms of top line. And, I, and further margin expansion, we jumped from 17% gross margin to 26. And I think you know a commensurate jump is going to happen in Q2 in terms of gross margin as well. So we're growing exponentially. And the backdrop of that is our retail expertise. Our basket size in Q1 was also 158. Over the past 90 days, we've been averaging approximately a million a store on a monthly basis through our uh, retail channels. And so performing well, well above our, our weight. Uh, and you can see at the backdrop of that as well is the ramp up in our cultivation. We now have eight different cultivation, cultivation facilities growing Gage branded product. 
And more importantly, we're going to move to 13 by the end of this year. We'll be the number one cultivator in the state of Michigan, over 250,000 square feet of production. <clears throat> Uh, this is just a quick slide on you know how quickly we've grown as well. If you take a look at how prudent we've been with shareholder capital while we were a private company, we continue to be prudent with shareholder capital while also experiencing exponential growth. Our cultivation facilities went from one to eight, uh, soon to be nine, actually, as we'll have a new contract grower hopefully coming on within the next 30 to 45 days. Our monthly cultivation capacity has expanded exponentially as well. <clears throat> Our proprietary strains. People in the industry are always looking for a variety. They want that new flavor, that new taste. And we're always at the forefront of that. We're always kind of pushing the boundaries, coming out with new bags and new flavors for, uh, for our flower. And lastly, you know, on the operating stores, we had only one operating store in January, 2020. Moved to now nine, a uh, slide is slightly outdated uh, more recently. So really, really expanding and expanding at a, at a pretty exponential rate. Um, if you take a look at our strategy, we've partnered with also best in class brands and our strategy from a branding standpoint, that is. We partnered with best in class brands outside of the state of Michigan. And that includes Cookies. Cookies is the Nike of the space, so the Red Bull of the space, the Coca Cola of the space. They're hands down the number one brand in the space. We have the exclusive partnership on a cultivation, processing, and retail side of things with that brand. We were their first partner out of California uh, a little over two years ago. And continue to have a great relationship with that company and look to potentially do even more together outside of Michigan. But now back to Michigan, we've we basically partnered with Cookies to help elevate the Gage brand. Through that elevation, we've also been able to partner with other best in class brands, including Slang and Blue River. Slang being one of the top, top, top uh, extract based companies out there and Blue River, one of the top solventless companies out there as well. We're looking to introduce both of those brands to the market once our processing lab comes online. And you're going to see just a further expansion on top line growth, the product variety at our stores. You see on the right a couple of our product examples. We usually sell most of our product in bags of eights. Uh, we sell for some of the highest price points in the state of Michigan, which kind of brings me to my next point. We solely focused on flour when we started as a brand. We didn't try to be the jack of all trades. We solely focused on we knew Michigan as a state consume some of the highest amounts on a per capita basis for flour in all of the US. And we knew that's where we needed to build our brand. And so we built our brand on the back of flour and consistently sell for some of the highest price points in the state today. We hang dry, we hand trim and hand pack everything that we produce. It takes a little bit more time, a little bit more effort in that post-production process, but it really creates a premium product and a product that obviously people are hungry for as exemplified through our average retail selling price and also our average basket size that's industry leading. <clears throat> quick question, you know, sort of quick question, quick jump to, uh, to our operational cultivation assets. You can see on the left-hand side, those are three of our operational assets from a cultivation standpoint. You look at the other side, that's our contract row uh, expansion. Five of those 10 are already in operation. We'll soon have six. In fact, we just added an 11th so by the end of this year, we're going to have 14 different facilities growing Gage and Cookies branded product. That type of growth and that type of cultivation capacity will be number one in, in, in the space. In fact, if you compare it to some of the other in the space in Michigan, if you compare it to some of the other companies out there as well, a lot of some of the large MSOs, uh, you'll see that, you know, from a cultivation standpoint, we're really competing in terms of production as well. Uh, by the end of this year, we want to have a plan to have 7,000 pounds of monthly production coming out of our collective cultivation network. And that means at the start and sometime in Q1 of 2022, we're going to be having 7,000 pounds of premium product on our shelves. If you take a look at what we sell, you know, those pounds for, even if you be very, very conservative, we sell more than that, but let's say you just wanted to give a price tag of 5,000 a pound, you can actually see what type of monthly numbers we're anticipating for the 2022 year. <clears throat> uh, I briefly spoke about our, our, our retail experience and, and we really pride ourselves on retail. We spend a lot of time on our retail, really try to create a top notch customer experience. It's exemplified in our baskets that Michigan already has, you know, top, top notch basket sizes, some of the highest in the industry. If you compare it to California, high 60s, low 70s basket size. Now look at Michigan's in the mid 80s, uh, already, you know, it's indicative 
just how strong of a consumption market Michigan is. When you take a look at our basket size, nearly double that. Again, it's a great indicator of just the type of brand of you know that we are and the type of appreciation that the, the consumers in Michigan have uh, for our brand in Michigan. We sell the majority of our product through our retail channels as well. Uh, I would say you know 90 plus, 95 plus percent of our sales are coming from our retail channels right now. We really wanted to control the narrative, really control how our product was distributed. And so we solely focus on putting that through our retail channels. We generally sell out of everything we produce right now. I don't even have an opportunity to sell wholesale just because of the amount of demand that we have at our stores for our product and for Cookies branded product in Michigan. I'll jump now to our retail. Uh, it slides a little bit outdated, I apologize. We now have nine. We opened up our ninth location last week in Jackson, Michigan. Uh, that's the ninth gauge operated dispensary. We also operate two cookies branded stores. Uh, the Cookies Detroit, uh, that's one of the best performing medical dispensaries in the state. And if you take a look at Cookies Kalamazoo, that was the first adult use cookie store in the Midwest and obviously the first in Michigan. Right now we have 13, as I mentioned, slightly out of date in terms of the slide, 13 locations. We've reached 90% of the population within a one hour's drive uh, of our locations based on the current portfolio. We're looking to expand to close to 20 locations by the end of this year and have those in operation. More importantly, looking to drive down that driving time to approximately 20 to 25 minutes in terms of reaching 90 to 95% of the population of Michigan within a 20 to 25 minute drive. Really is gonna bode well for us as we expand our delivery program in Q3. We're gonna be introducing delivery, just dynamic delivery in Michigan. Really a great opportunity to continue to expand our same store sales and more importantly continue to expand on that million dollars per month that we're currently seeing approximately from our retail channels i think if you compare that million dollar a month to pretty much a lot of the other companies out there in the space right now you'll see we're punching well above our weight in terms of retail expertise and retail performance we really focus on good quality uh, you know, high-end uh, retail experiences with our consumers. And again, our consumers and our medical patients are rewarding us for it. <clears throat> we also like to focus on awareness. I encourage everybody listening, please follow us on Gage Cannabis on Instagram. We put a lot of time, put a lot of effort into our, uh, on, into our Instagram page and our social media. Generally. I think, you know, our social media is a great indication of, you know, how a brand is performing, how a brand is interacting with the consumers. If you take a look at you know who follows us, how much interaction in terms we have with our posts, we're constantly using this feedback to make ourselves better. If you look at the network and the ecosystem we are in with cookies, you can see you know cookies the amount of followers they have, cookies clothing, cookies Michigan, the, the social media we also run, just a vast vast amount of following. And at the backdrop of that, you have Burner, you know one of the founders of Cookies, over a million follow, a million and a half followers, and Rick Ross, you know one of their brand partners at almost twelve. Being part of this ecosystem has helped elevate the gauge brand and will continue to elevate the gauge brand as we're really learning from the best on the social media side of things. And again, more importantly, getting that instantaneous feedback from our consumers. I briefly talked about cookies and the relationship. We have two stores that we currently operate for cookies, one, in, one on 8 Mile in Detroit and one in California. Let's open up another two locations in, in uh, this year um, for the gauge and sorry, cookies branded. Uh, one will be a cookie store in Bay City and the other will be Centerline. Uh, that'll be a lemonade store. That's like Sprite to cookies is, uh, you know, uh, Coca-Cola. And so for us, um, really, really can't emphasize enough how great this partnership has been. Uh, really, it's, it's phenomenal to be part of a brand that is really leading the pack in terms of branding and just uh, getting deep within the culture, constantly innovating, um, you know, products and bringing new flower strains to market. Uh, we get the benefit from that relationship and those relationships that they build within their own ecosystem to help benefit Gage and help elevate the Gage brand as well. <clears throat> so just a, you know, just a broad summary here. I know I only have about a minute or two left. Just a broad summary in terms of the asset portfolio. Uh, take a look at, you know, what we have in play. A uh, majority of uh, uh, of these assets are obviously operational, as I've already discussed. Our dispensaries are going to be really expanding. We really want to get to 20 operational locations by the end of this year. And then more importantly, delivery. Uh, delivery is a huge, huge opportunity for us to really, really expand our portfolio. So I'll stop there.
Thank you so much, Fabian. Awesome update. 20 operational dispensaries by the end of the year, man. That's a big goal, right? Big goal, right? Sorry, said again. The the 20, 20 operational dispensaries. Uh, it's it's a good goal between now and the end of the year, uh, but a big one. Yeah, no, look, it's uh, we understand it's 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 pretty aggressive. Um, we do have a plan in place. We are executing on the plan, and we're trying really really hard to bring Gage and Cookies branded product to as many people in Michigan as possible. Really really want to hit that goal. Yeah. So last time we chatted, you were considering M and A outside of the state. Obviously, no specifics there. Uh, you know, it, it's a consideration. We'll say. Um, but it seems to me like you're still pretty focused on the depth of your presence in the state of Michigan. Um, so, you know, as your experience there with that state, do you expect to see a lot of consolidation in the state of Michigan or a lot more entrance? Um, curious more about the how you feel that overall state's going to look in the next year or so uh, with, you know, the competitors that are there. Do they start buying things up? Or do we see uh, a lot more licenses being uh, start to be capitalized upon? We'll say. Yeah. So I think you know Michigan right now is a little bit of a fragmented market. Uh, you don't have that many large players. Obviously, we're large players. I think if you take a look at Michigan as a market in terms of the ability to come into Michigan from from not like try to grow organically to the size of Gage, for example. Yeah, I would say it's nearly impossible. It's going to take you two, three years, maybe even four. Uh, it's an unlimited state license system, but very, very constrained when it comes to the cities. You need to deal with the cities on a case-by-case -case basis. It's similar to Massachusetts. So with that being said, it's particularly important that, that you know an MSO just can't come into Michigan and start operations and obviously become a competitor. It's going to take so much time to ramp up. So I think you're going to see more and more m a activity of larger entities the larger mso's coming to michigan and actually acquiring operators that are going to be successful and in terms of us branching out most definitely we want to branch out you know outside of michigan we want to bring the brand to as many people in the u.s as possible. we can go look at a lot of the you know the new states of michigan the ones that are obviously uh permit uh and more importantly looking to potentially partner with you know other companies within those uh, respective states and and you know start something special and so for us we're constantly looking at the opportunities outside of michigan but again want to stay focused really want to relief type model of you know winning our home state and then using that platform to really excel elsewhere fantastic fabian awesome i really appreciate it anything else you'd like to leave our investors with uh before we uh say goodbye for, for this time. Uh, I love getting updates on Gage because it always seems like you've made one more step uh, than the last time uh, you speak. No, I think, look, I appreciate everybody uh, everybody joining today. Uh, we're working really, really hard to achieve our goals. Uh, you know, if you want any more information on Gage, please go to www.gage.com or gageinvestors.com if you're an investor. Uh, we trade under the symbol GAG on the CSC in Canada and on the USOTC GAEGF. Awesome, Fabian. Thanks again for being here. Uh, always good to chat with you, my friend. And also always good to get an update. And good luck on the 20 dispensaries this year. I have no doubt you guys will get that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Of course. Fantastic. Thanks. All right, y'all. That was Fabian Monaco, the CEO of Gage Cannabis. They really are one of the up and coming players. They've listed on the CSE recently. They then uh, jumped over to the OTC uh, so that U.S. investors can be involved there. They have a strong investor base. Um, so I definitely recommend taking a look at that opportunity. All right. So we have a couple of minutes before we bring on uh, one of the OGs of this industry and Bob Fireman uh, and our new cannabis editor, who I'm very excited for this. Uh, but I did want to jump to one more Slido poll here. All of the above. Uh, we did that. Fantastic. Uh, you all were correct. Super proud of you all. Uh, all right. What was the first state to legalize recreational cannabis? sales of cannabis, excuse me, Washington, California, Colorado, or Vermont. If you participate in these polls, 
you can win free things. We've gone over this. I'm sure you guys are tired of me saying this, uh, but I love our data platform. Benzinga Pro is wonderful. You saw Anne Marie use it earlier. Uh, she is uh, fantastic. Uh, there's so many more things you can do with Benzinga Pro than I've ever seen uh, on a consumer database like that. So what are we looking at here? Colorado is a few. Washington, California looks like they both have one vote apiece. Come on, y'all, real quick. Let's get this. And then we're going to jump into the Merimed uh, story, fireside. Very excited for that discussion. Uh, I'm going to close this down in 10 seconds. Uh, you have 10 more seconds to win free things, uh, free information, free uh, <laughs> free news about Sundial. How about that? Uh, all right, y'all. Eight. All right, cool. I'm closing it down, and it is closed. Colorado, you all were correct. Nice. All right. Thank you all for bearing with me. It is my pleasure to bring over Maureen Meehan. She is the new cannabis editor here at Benzinga. How are you, Maureen? Hi. Nice to meet you online, Elliot. I see I you know. here all the time, but it's good to actually see you now talking. You're doing such a great job. I'm loving this. Thank you. We're, oh, yeah. we're, having, we're having a blast here. We have a lot of fun oh, with these events yeah, and yeah. bringing in uh, the leading executives. So, Maureen, I'm going to hop off. I'm going to let you introduce Thank Bob and get into it. Thank you. Great. Well, hi. Hi, Bob. Uh, yeah, I'm Maureen Meehan. As Elliot said, I'm the cannabis editor here now at Benzinga. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this the second day of the Benzinga Cannabis Capital Conference. And I am thrilled to be joined for this fireside chat by Bob Fireman, the CEO of Merimed. Um, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with the uh, company, Merimed enjoys a long history. Elliot called him an OG um, in the cannabis industry. Surely, as far as multi-state operators are concerned, um, Bob and his team founded the company over a decade ago, initially as consultants and advisors to license holders. Uh, before then evolving recently to a fully vertical uh, seed to sale company. Uh, the Merimed team has also developed and operates cultivation, processing, and dispensary sites in six states, including the, the company's home state, which is the great state of Massachusetts. Um, the company enjoyed a fantastic year of growth and performance in 2020. And that has continued now in 2021 as Merrimed reported its best earnings ever. Congratulations. Um, so Bob and Merrimed have been loyal patrons of Benzinga for many years, well, several years, uh, for which we're very thankful. And that's why I don't mind saying that we think the company, Merrimed, is one of the best kept secrets in the industry right now. So with that, let me say hello to Bob Fireman of Merriman. Well, Maureen, thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> and welcome, uh, we welcome you to the Benzinga family. Thank you. Uh, as we go across the country with our team, uh, your company, Benzinga, has been one of the most professional, most helpful uh, in this emerging industry over time. We miss the in-person uh, events that they ran. I mean, but as, a, as an emerging industry and a public company, they've been really helpful of introducing us to people. The uh, sessions are informative, they're educative. And as this industry gets more mainstream, it's a result of the work that Benzinga does with Patrick and Elliot and the great team. Thank you. Yes, and I understand soon we will be having in-person events. So, all right, well, I'll start. If you want to fill in anything about yourself or the company that I missed, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to start asking you some questions. Well, I think if, uh, I think as a company, uh, we are one of the best kept secrets uh, around, not always by design. Uh, we're very grateful of, of what we do. And maybe uh, as we get into more events like this, and get more chats with people like yourselves, uh, we will get known. I mean, we are Massachusetts based. I'm sitting here in Norwood, Massachusetts, our, our corporate headquarters. And uh, from Massachusetts, uh, we've developed uh, with the Marimed team, 17 cannabis licenses and businesses in six states. Uh, 
developed over three, 400,000 feet of uh, state-of-the-art compliant uh, medical uh, just cultivation with genetics, processing with state-of-the-art laboratories. And we know how to package and distribute things well. We uh, have developed our own proprietary brands, which we'll talk about a little later. And uh, we are now uh, had a transformative year last year in 2020. Uh, where we're in our, our consolidation strategy to roll up these businesses we've developed over years and merge them into our public company so that we can now report that revenue on our public filings. So we had a very strong performance this year in, in, in 2020. We, we, our core cannabis business approached $51 million and uh, our earnings were $16.5 million because of the team that we have and the uh, efficiencies that we create. So we're here and we're poised for growth. And uh, we think we're one of the top uh, growing companies in the emerging MSO space. Fabulous. Well, that kind of helps me segue into my first sort of question. Um, as you mentioned, you evolved from being an advisor to license holders to consolidating those businesses in order to become a vertical, uh, fully vertical MSO, which is part of a strategic plan that you uh, began about two years ago, correct? So could you just tell us more about that plan and how it evolved and what your current status is at the moment? I mean, you mentioned uh, quite a bit, but how did, what was the, the what were the, 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 what was the grit that, that sort of pushed you into that like evolution into uh, fully vertical MSO operators? Well, when we started uh, back in when, when medical marijuana was being put onto referendums up e in the Eastern states, um, there were competitive bids and it was a different environment than exists today. In, in those states, uh, some of them required that you be uh, not-for-profit, state not-for-profit, and you had to apply as uh, stockless companies. Mm. So we developed our structure that we learned in California, where uh, you know the states didn't want the pot guys making too much money, so they called it not for profit. Mm -hmm. uh, we developed a strategy that basically uh, allowed our investors to come in on the real estate side of investments. So uh, we helped people write licenses and built our validated experience around them. We won licenses, and as we won the licenses. Uh, we then started to site and develop the property. Our team had deep, uh, vast experience in business acumen, in real estate, in development, in science. And with that team, we sited property and we developed uh, uh, all these facilities in all these different states. Uh, our revenue at the time was coming from rents and percentage rents, consulting fees, advisory fees, and once we developed our own branded products, licensing fees and the like. And I think the industry sort of changed in 2017 and 18 when the Canadian Stock Exchange evolved uh, and this concept of multi-state operators and raising capital in public companies became more prolific. Uh, we didn't go the Canadian route. We stayed on the OTCQX and we've uh, been very successful in it. But I think um, at some point we needed to put the revenue into the public reporting so that we could look uh, as a full state integrated seat to sale MSO. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, we developed the strategy. And last uh, over the last 18 months, we, we pulled in Illinois and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And both of those states uh, were, were both now adult and medical. So we got the benefit of that. And, and in 2020, uh, we opened our third uh, adult use uh, dispensary in Illinois. And we uh, just opened our fourth in a place called Metropolis, Illinois, home of Superman for us people that remember DC comic books. And, uh, <laughs> wow, your persistence is paying off, isn't it? <laughs> it is, Superman. So we, Absolutely. So we Great got goal. revenue. That revenue we started to flow in 2020, uh, along with us finishing in Massachusetts, we developed, we have 135,000 
foot building. We've developed mm -hmm. 70,000 into cultivation and manufacturing, and we ramped up that production in 2020. That created this transformation year, uh, which we now uh, will have a full year of that. And uh, the success with that and the uh, comfort we have with our numbers, that's why we gave guidance for the first time in the in of last year. And uh, we've now guidance for 100 million this year, just okay. with what we started in 2020. And we're predicting over $30 million in EBITDA to our bottom line. Wow, fantastic. Again, congratulations. Thank um, you. I have heard you say, well, I've heard you quoted, uh, that consolidating the businesses that you developed versus acquiring other existing operators offers some real benefits to investors that aren't immediately recognized often. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Well, with all the money that was raised on Bay Street, a lot of these largest MSOs decided that they want to have their footprint in multiple states. And they went around and they uh, paid significantly high tariffs to acquire existing licenses from folks like ourselves or single operators in every state. Um, we did it differently. When you look at Marimed, when we talk about roll up and consolidation, we're talking about rolling up the businesses that we kickstarted, that we organically grew by finding the real estate, developing the licenses, hiring and creating this, the work staff, training them to all of our SOPs, integrating all our systems, all our back end software and reporting. And so now we're consolidating businesses for a fraction of the cost. And uh, we don't have some of the challenges of others trying to assimilate different systems, different growing methods, uh, different operating platforms, and different cultures. Mm -hmm. When you look at Marimed and the people that visit us, they see that as, as though we're considered a large multi-state operation, we kept the culture of the people that, that work closely as our team. Uh, the success of our businesses and the success of the people that come to work every day and the knowledge and acumen that they've created. It's mm -hmm. in the formulations of our brands and products that have become best sellers in most of the states that we're in. So we're right. very lucky to do that. And we think that our roll up uh, is a lot simpler, less risky, and more uh, easily obtainable to keep success and momentum than some of our other peers are doing these huge mergers of multiple states, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of states, um, I know that, well, of course, we've talked about your significant you know, presence in, in, uh, in states that garner a lot of attention because they're big recreational sales markets uh, like Illinois, Massachusetts. But you've also mentioned that your footprint includes some states that don't get so much attention, like Maryland and Delaware, small states. Can you tell us why you're so excited about those states and what your expansion plans beyond the, your, your current footprint did? Well, you kind of talked about that already, but these smaller states, let's hear about that. Well, bigger is not necessarily yeah. better. Good. I think we heard about that in the Kama Sutra which we won't talk about today. <laughs> uh, I think uh, states like Delaware. So we were the consultant and won an application for a not-for-profit in Delaware for almost four or five years ago. We did the pilot program for the state and, and, and we developed a 46,000 foot seat to sale building there, which we've now opened a second dispensary. And I think we hold two of the four or six licenses in the state and have the major market share. Um, these states with less than a few million people are very profitable because they have limited licenses and we can take advantage of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're also, uh, you know, every state in the country now is looking at some form of cannabis medical and, and looking at it moving over to adult use, which is now in over 33 states in the district. So we're developing 100,000 square foot new modern uh, production and, and cannabis uh, cultivation facility in a place called Milford, Delaware. Oh. And down there, uh, you know, we have our second dispensary open in Lewis on the Delaware shore, where I saw President and Mrs. Biden bicycling yesterday, 
probably, hopefully they went by our store oh. and, and they are 21 years of age. So they probably didn't have a license. Oh, God. Talk, please talk, to, talk is, to him if you get a chance. Yes. Talk to him. <laughs> well, his son, uh, when we were opening that program, his deceased son, Bo, was attorney general and was extremely helpful to our cause. Oh, great. Delaware is very profitable. Uh, we think it will even get better. They're looking at reciprocity. They're looking at adult use, and it's great. In Maryland, we developed a hundred and bought a 180,000-foot uh, production facility, and we uh, developed 100,000 of it. And, and our client's business is now running north of $20 million, and we're going to expand the balance of that facility. Right. So those exactly. states are good, and, and part of our consolidation strategy is to target uh, some of our team have developed a one of the three licenses in Rhode Island in a seat to sale operation that tracks uh, is probably one of the most acclaimed facilities in the United States. Great. Now you mentioned earlier your your um, your brands and your products, uh, your Betty's Edibles and Nature's Heritage brands. They are market leaders in a number of uh, of states, including Massachusetts, of course. What's the secret to building a great brand in cannabis today? Well, the the law itself of uh, no interstate commerce requires that everything made with cannabis THC has to be built in each state when when it's in. So keeping the consistent quality, uh, creating that product. Uh, is, is a challenge that there's really been uh, very little on a national brand. We know the future is branding and distribution, and we're sure. geared to that. But yeah. our, our team's been together 10 years. Our, our, the excess of our food uh, laboratory scientists have created formulations that are fast acting, that, that, that are geared to specific symptoms for specific remedies. Um, our Betty's Eddie's, is, is very popular, our Confusion, you know, uh, drinks, our new innovative products on our genetics that are top, creates the best flower sales in the markets that we have. So we need to develop, and our strategy is really to be a trusted uh, company making products that are safe, that are consistent, that are trusted, and that provide, the, improve the health and wellness of the customers and clients and patients that take it. Great, thank you so much for that, Bob. Now, uh, we're almost out of time, but I have one quick question. Uh, what are your predictions for the industry? Are you feeling bullish about movement in DC? You mentioned DC before, what do you think? We have about a couple minutes, so let us know. Okay, so I think, you know, waiting on Washington's always been a challenge, <laughs> but, you know, 20 years ago, it was a joke talking about legalization and all these bills before the House and the Senate. Exactly. Uh, we were excited to see the House finally pass uh, and propose a bill that uh, uh, allowed for ingestibles of CBD, which uh, was promised a year and a half ago. Right now, Senator Schumer is sitting on a proposed bill that will help safe banking, hopefully. It yep. will uh, do uh, this decriminalization and hopefully uh, do some more. I mean, mm -hmm. our goal of being on the OTC is to get to NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. We're debating with our friends at NASDAQ. So maybe the decriminalization uh, will take companies like Massachusetts, uh, like Merrimed here in Massachusetts and give them an opportunity to, to really be the U.S. leader in a corporate structure on a U.S. Uh, public exchange. Great. We hope that, too, and we hope it for everyone. Thank you so much, Bob. This has been brilliant. Um, it's, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much. No, thank you, and Elliot, and thank everyone at Ben Zinger. We yeah. hope that sessions like this will people know that we're a, a great investment as a stock with a great team, a, a balance-free, uh, profitable company poised for growth across the industry. Thank you all very much for the thank time. Thank you, and back to Elliot. Thank you both. <laughs> Appreciate you. My video is being weird, but Maureen, uh, Bob, really loved having the discussion. Uh, perfect. Uh, awesome. Oh, I think I caught up. I was like, I don't know if they're hearing me or not. <laughs> Maureen, Bob, again, thank you. All right, y'all. Uh, if you are just tuning in, welcome to Benzinga's Cannabis Capital Conference. Uh, this is the leading conference for cannabis 
stocks, operators, growers, ancillary companies. We have it all for you. Merimed, uh, OG company in the space. Sundial coming up in one minute. Right after that, Kushko announcing one of the major M&A activities in the space this year. Uh, so if you're interested in investing in the cannabis space, uh, it's right here at Benzinga. Benzinga.com slash cannabis. 25 plus articles every single day on this industry. Uh, with that being said, appreciate you all tuning in, throwing it to the one and only Jeremy Burke to get us started. He is back. Welcome back, Jeremy. How are you, man? Thanks, Elliot. I'm, I'm excited to be back and it's, uh, it's good to be back here at Benzinga. Fantastic. I was like freaking out a little bit because my, my video wasn't like popping up. So I'm going to get off. Nobody's here to see me. All They're right. here to see you and Zach. Thanks, man. Sounds good. All right, great. Well, I'm Jeremy Burke. I'm a senior reporter at Insider, the publication formerly known as Business Insider. Um, I'm here with Sundial CEO, Zachary George. And since we only have about 20 minutes, I just want to get right into it. Um, Zach took over as CEO in January of 2020. Um, though he's been on the board uh, since 2019 of Sundial. And his task over the past year, 18 months or so, has really been to turn the company around um, and to kind of take advantage of some of the changes uh, coming down the pipeline of, of the cannabis industry. So Zach, uh, good to be here and thanks for chatting with me. Thanks, Jeremy, great to be here. Yeah, so Zach, let's let's get into it. I mean, you know, Canadian cannabis companies have have posted weaker quarterly earnings than their U.S. counterparts this year um, and a little bit last year as well. You know, what in your mind are the factors driving that and, and what are the best ways to uh, chart a path forward here? Sure. It's a great question. Um, so, you know, the, the Canadian market is certainly growing. Um, but that being said, profitability has remained an issue uh, broadly for licensed producers of cannabis. And uh, we have certainly not been immune to that. As you're probably aware, the, 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 the level of uh, vertical integration that exists in the U.S. creates quite a, biz, a different business dynamic um, than what you're seeing in, in, in Canada. In terms, of, in terms of the drivers or, or the uh, you know, attribution around those headwinds, I would say there's really three main factors to point to. Uh, one would be price compression. So because of oversupply, we've seen over the last 18 months, in some cases, um, you know, flower prices down by over 50% certainly has an impact on um, realized uh, profitability and, and revenue across the space. Regulatory dysfunction um, also continues to be a challenge. Um, we've got conflicting provincial mm -hmm. regulations. We have a, a, an extremely onerous um, excise tax regime and uh, challenging Health Canada regulations in addition that have, have created some inefficiencies for, for operators. And I think those will evolve and become more industry friendly over time, um, but, but it's gonna be a slow process. And then also just sheer competition. So you've got you know, well over 500 licenses granted. Um, the, the space has largely been commoditized. You have um, simply too many companies vying for market share with very similar uh, product offerings. And I, and I believe that'll be solved um, over the you know, through the coming years um, with some combination of both consolidation and, and attrition, um, because not all of these companies are going to survive. In yeah. terms of, of our specific position, um, you know, we're working to limit the, the offering of discount products in markets where we view the economics as neither attractive uh, nor sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, we have no interest in pursuing, you know, unprofitable revenue growth um, just for the sake of, of putting up a, a, a good top line number. And we're not seeking to maintain market share at, at any cost. Um, we've also restructured our cultivation activities. Um, cultivation on a consistent and high quality basis is actually uh, much more challenging than, than many people would expect. Um, and we've seen some great progress on our side in terms of potency and the quality metrics for for premium flour. And we continue to invest in our library of strains, um, utilizing both you know, data insights um, and continued improvement in our, in our processes and operations to achieve uh, more consistent quality metrics, higher potency, which is, which is important to today's consumer. Um, and we're excited to commercialize some of our new strains in, in Q4 of this year. And, and just quickly, you know, for viewers who may not be in Canada or, or may not be kind of aware of, of the day-to-day -day changes, I mean, what what are the regulatory hurdles that you spoke about, um, you know, in terms of maybe retail store rollout and, and you know, complying with regulations? Like, what are some of the, the key things that you can pinpoint? 
Yeah, you know, ultimately some some uh, greater access to e-commerce and um, direct to consumer activity is really important. So, you know, some provinces currently um, allow for delivery, for example, others do not. Um, some provinces allow for uh, licensed producers to uh, own retail in some form, um, others do not. Some provinces have a cap on, on the number of retail locations that you can own um, as a private manager, um, others do not. Um, so there, there's there's a broad inconsistency. When you when you look at the size of the Canadian market with a population very similar to the state of California, um, the complexity that that introduces, uh, which which needs to be managed by um, Sundial and its competitors in Canada, um, can be quite challenging. Got it. Um, and I wanted to ask a question, you know, around the the volatility um, in, in the cannabis sector and with cannabis stocks, you know, Sundial included. Um, you know, despite this weak quarter that we discussed, uh, or, or, you know, we couple quarters in the Canadian sector, you know, by and large, cannabis stocks have been ripping, um, you know, this morning's hair back, notwithstanding. Um, but I'm curious about your perspective. I mean, what, what do you make of that? And what are the what are the kind of things driving, you know, this, this, these gains over the past couple weeks and months? Sure, look, that's a, it's a great question, and, and I know um, there's a lot of focus on that. I think what we can say for sure is there's a tremendous amount of excitement around the globe, the, the growth of the global cannabis industry. OK, so when, when you when you see a cluster of catalysts, as we have um, over the last say six weeks with recent uh, North American merger announcements, um, even you know a comment by Amazon um, supporting a federally legal regime in the US, you tend to see volatility increase um, along with trading volumes. And so <laughs> while there, be, there will be a host of factors that you know, go into you know, why our, our shares or others are trading um, at any given level on any given day, um, you know, we've seen a correlation there in terms of these <clears throat> catalysts and, and then interest in the equities. Got it. Um, you know, and, and part of that trend to me is this broader theme of the democratization, you know, of the capital markets, of, of investing in stocks through platforms like Robinhood and, and you know, chat groups, Reddit, Discord, et cetera. Um, you know, in, in, an, in a retail investor heavy sector like cannabis, I mean, how do you take advantage of the popularity of, of the stock with retail investors? And, and part of that question is like, what management challenges does that present? And how do you make sure that this is a positive and not a negative for Sundial? Sure. So there, there's certainly a number of opportunities that spring from this dynamic, but also challenges. So, you know, I think the, the, the retail investment market has changed a lot. It continues to evolve, um, but we've seen a lot of change over the last several years. Retail investors have become more and more sophisticated and have access to tools to express um, uh, their investment desires um, in, in new and in new and interesting ways um, that, are, that are very efficient. So um, I think the retail investor needs to be res respected and recognized as a, an important market participant. The mm -hmm. dynamic that we're seeing today um, uh, is, is potentially not fleeting. Um, and just a part of the evolving capital market landscape. Um, the fact that the retail investor, you know, often behaves differently from an institutional um, investor um, can also be valuable. In fact, um, I would, uh, we believe that the, the support from our, our retail investor base has really been key to accelerating the turnaround at Sundial. Um, so it's been very helpful to us. You know, in terms of challenges um, with such a, um, a disparate uh, shareholder base, um, some of which have um, you know, different investment horizons. You know, it can be very difficult to connect directly with your investors. Um, mm. We don't have um, any you know, individual really large minority holders, for example. So if you're looking to um, communicate on strategy, performance, um, and governance, um, we can obviously do this through, through public channels, but it's very difficult to con connect sort of one-on-one -on -one with these investor groups. And um, I would also Great say point. in some cases, a, a short-term mindset and a short-term investment horizon can actually conflict with a path to you know, long-term sustainable profitability. And so we need to continue to work to be as transparent as possible with our strategy and our path forward um, as we work to create value for our stakeholders. Now, the question of reaching shareholders, I imagine that's gotten a lot more difficult um, you know, with, like you said, this, this kind of retail heavy sector. Um, you know, how do you, how do you bridge that gap and what are, what are some methods you use? And, you know, part two of that question, I guess, is how do you kind of convince those retail investors who may be, you know, a little less patient than institutions that, you know, the moves you're making are the right ones. 
you look, it's 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 uh, something we have to wake up and recommit to every day. You know, I would say that um, you know, Jeremy, you and Benzinga are sort of part of the solution there as well with with uh, forums like this. Um, you know, back in the day, you used to see you know private investor conferences where retail investors could never have access, um, and so broad right. dissemination of um, um, web hosted events like this are, are a huge opportunity for for engagement. Got it. And then last question on this front, I mean, you know, what can you learn or what do you look at that managers who, who have similar dynamics, you know, on their stocks with this heavy retail investment um, companies like AMC, like what can you learn from how they've, they've capitalized on this interest and, and what, what learnings can you bring into Sundial and then, you know, I guess cannabis more broadly. Yeah. So the AMC case study is certainly a fascinating one. Um, and I think that in connection with their, recent capital raises over the last couple of days, you saw some really important and um, somewhat new commentary that that would be uh, unique in terms of um, messaging from a public company CEO. Yeah. Um, but but they publicly have acknowledged um, the extreme volatility, you know, that that's impacting the equity and flagged specifically to their investor base that that volatility could result in uh, material losses, you know, for investors. And so while, while flagging those risks, I think in a, in a responsible manner, but also using the, the attention and interest um, in the company to access capital, which will um, uh, ensure that they have more stability and optionality as a going concern as an enterprise um, is something they've done. Um, we've, been, we've, been on, um, we've been on that path for some time. Um, so, you know, we since since uh, uh, garnering the attention and profile that we have, we've been able to um, quite easily raise um, north of $1 billion Canadian, which enabled yeah. us to take our debt to zero. We have one of the healthier balance sheets um, in the Canadian sector and puts us in a position where we can really pay, play offense and contribute um, in terms of uh, industry consolidation and, and driving returns for our shareholders. Great. Um, I just want to move along here. I really appreciate those answers, Zach. But you know, looking towards the U.S., I mean, I, I listened in to, you know, the vast majority of, of Canadian LP earnings calls this past quarter. Um, and a key theme that came up is like, you know, the U.S. is moving slowly and in fits and starts towards legalization. But, you know, Senator Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, has a promised comprehensive bill that's supposed to hit the Senate floor any time. Uh, the Moore Act, another legalization or decriminalization bill, was recently reintroduced. And even House Republicans have reintroduced or, excuse me, introduced their own version of a legalization bill. So, you know, what do you expect sitting here as the CEO of Sundial to see in terms of federal change in the U.S. this year? And, you know, at what point, um, you know, will you feel comfortable kind of looking to the U.S. and potentially making some acquisitions or entering the market? It's a great question. I, I don't think I'm going to drop any big uh, predictions. Um, sure. Today, Jeremy. <laughs> no crystal ball. Um, I, I do believe, I, I think uh, it's not, not controversial to say it's really a matter of um, when, not if. So this this is a this is going to be a process um, and an evolution. Um, whether we get material movement um, this year, even with the safe banking um, proposal, or whether it takes you know twenty four to thirty six months for us to you know see real change, um, tough to say. I know in our case, I, I would I would say that we do get a lot of pressure um, from our from our stakeholders um, to make announcements related to entry into these large mm. markets like the U.S. and, and Europe, for example. Um, and we are actively assessing you know those opportunities. Um, that's an important part of of, of our of our job as fiduciaries. Um, but I want to make clear that our first priority does remain Canada. So, you know, we believe that the evolving Canadian marketplace is currently very dysfunctional and challenged, um, but that uh, you're going to see material change in a much healthier uh, market, uh, you know, just around two years from now um, and view the Canadian marketplace as a prize that's worth fighting for. You know, in, in, in addition, I would say that as a, as a Canadian domiciled um, NASDAQ listed entity, um, our NASDAQ listing itself creates some challenges for us to directly invest in plant touching assets. You know, in the U.S., so right. we think that opportunity set will evolve over time, and there are various ways that we can take advantage of opportunities in the U.S. As you've seen, some of our peers uh, do, in a structured manner, or through entering um, uh, distribution, product mix, or IP-related activities that are not um, necessarily uh, attached to THC. 
Um, but that's an evolving you know, scenario. So we're being presented with, with, with a number of opportunities. We're being quite careful and cautious um, to make sure that um, we're, we're focused on our strategy um, and taking on um, actions and activities that are accretive to that strategy. Um, so I would just say we're very committed to, to being in Canada, but seeing um, some opportunities that we, we expect to capitalize on in the coming years. Got it. Now, look, it's, it's, you know, cannabis is a quickly evolving sector. Uh, it's brand new. It must be really difficult to run a cannabis company, given all the stakeholders involved, um, you know, heavy regulations, media scrutiny, investor scrutiny, like we've discussed, you know, so what's your, what's your best advice to other executives who, you know, may want a job in the industry or who are about to start, uh, you know, at some of your competitors or, or companies in the U S as well. Sure, it's a great question. Um, you know, I can speak to my personal experience. I was really excited to work with the team at Sundial, really because of the challenges that they faced both internally and externally. You know, anyone to, to, that's looking to um, you know become a professional in this industry, uh, I would say needs to be comfortable with with a really high rate of change um, and uh, significant uncertainty. Um, so if so, if you're looking for if you're looking for certainty and um, comfort. Um, probably not the best uh, industry for you, um, but you know this industry is still in its infancy. Uh, possesses a lot of opportunity. It's just not for the faint of heart because the sands are, are shifting underneath your feet right now um, on a constant daily basis. You know, it's a great industry. It's extremely dynamic. Um, there, there's some incredibly passionate people you know working in it, um, and and our team at Sundial loves to wake up every day and work to connect and delight uh, consumers. Got it. Now, you mentioned uh, Amazon's public support for legalization earlier in our discussion, um, and I thought you had a pretty good, pretty interesting and, and somewhat contrarian take on that uh, when we were discussing the other day or yesterday, excuse me. Um, so, you know, in your mind, how big of a signal or not is it that Amazon is now publicly supporting legalization? Um, and, you know, do you expect other other companies, you know, tech giants or, or CPG giants to follow suit? Yeah, so um, I, I would expect that you see a similar reaction from um, large uh, corporate entities, both in U.S. and and beyond U.S. borders. I think you know, as a, as a starting point, we just need to recognize that you know a a Amazon's um, you know home base is really Seattle, King County. Um, cannabis is 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 illegal, um, you know, in, in that area. You know, I think that they're responding to a shifting uh, environment in an intelligent way. They're focused on um, employee rights um, and how they're going to engage and support um, their teams and employees going forward. And so they've they've acknowledged that um, their practices in terms of um, drug policies and testing um, are, are shifting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's just very much a sign of the times. Um, I, I would just be a little careful about extrapolating too far in terms of you know, um, Amazon very quickly becoming, um, you know, a category killer in, in yet another industry. Um, I think that um, if anything, th this can also be seen as a, as a passing comment. The optionality alone yeah. that accrues to, to Amazon through supporting this and even staying on the sidelines and observing and trying to figure out the best way to participate in the industry is an extremely smart move. Um, but the notion that we're going to see a rash of you know, acquisitions or other um, aggressive measures in the near term, um, I would be quite cautious in, in making that assumption. So, Zach, is it is it safe to say that no one is terrified yet of Amazon coming in and dominating the industry? I mean, there, I think in some quarters that reaction was was uh, was occurred, but um, yeah, um, from our perspective, um, we're not going to lose sleep over it right now. Gotcha. So I think we have about time for for one more question quickly. Um, and you know, Sundial notwithstanding, you know, what advice would you have for retail investors who want to invest or take advantage of the broader theme of cannabis legalization? That's a great question, Jeremy. So look, it, it's it's really research, research, research. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's many different companies and investment opportunities in the space. Um, you know, when, in, in terms of the retail following that we have, um, there's a lot of excitement. Um, but I think that, you know, people need to really do a lot of homework to assess the risk associated with these investments um, and whether those risks are appropriate for their individual profile. You know, we're not in a position to give investment advice by any means. But, sure. um, you know, my advice would be to ensure that you're reading um, companies' financial statements. 
you're reviewing their website, understand their products, their offerings, the services that they provide, um, read their press releases, how they're communicating with the investor base, listen to conference calls. Um, if you can't listen to the conference calls, listen to the recordings, grab the transcripts, understand the differentiated models in the space and their, in their various risk profiles and prospects uh, in the sector. Uh, and look, it's still a startup industry and um, with, with a number of startup companies, we ourselves are just about two and a half years old, um, right. you know, looking to compete with other entities that have, you know, for example, been in the medical space for, um, you know, as long as seven years. So um, we're trying to improve every day uh, and compete in the space. Um, but the, the only guarantee here, I think, in the near term is going to be more volatility. Um, and to some extent, there are winners and losers uh, in the sector that are, are still being determined. Um, and so I, I think investors need to be aware of and comfortable with that dynamic. Got it. Zach George, CEO of Sundial, always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, and I will turn it back to Elliot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Jeremy, so Zach, thank you both for a wonderful discussion. Appreciate you guys being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, gents. See you again soon. All right, everybody. You heard from the man himself, CEO, Zach George of Sundial Growers. S-N-D-L, in case you didn't know. Uh, really appreciate you all joining us. Again, this is the Benzinga Cannabis Capital Conference. Uh, Zach George is awesome. Jeremy Burke, always a fantastic moderator. We do these interviews with executives weekly, every Thursday. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, in a quick little preview of what we do on a weekly basis. If you want to hear from cannabis executives and investment opportunities, this is it. Aaron, cue me up. Welcome to the Benzinga Cannabis Hour. There are more people who are in favor of legalization. I saw the benefits of it for myself. have to ask was there pot pasta in the cannabis cookbook oh it was gorgeous there was pot pasta they were we were talking about cannabis pasta that opened my eyes to the cannabis industry is this new industry where now billions of dollars are being made we're here to bring cannabis into culture All right, here we are with one of the OGs in the space. Definitely a company, I think, if you know cannabis, you know these guys, you know this guy, Nick Kovacevic. Welcome back, man. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Thrilled as always. As always, I'm going to get off the screen, let you take it away, tell us some updates. Obviously, you've had a few uh, since last time we chatted, so I'm going to let you take it away, my friend. All right. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to present to everybody the investor relations deck for Kushko Holdings, starting with, of course, our important legal disclaimer. Uh, so quickly review that and we will jump to a company overview. Who are we? We're one of the early pioneers in the industry. We have a 10 year track record of substantial growth. We provide ancillary products to the global cannabis industry. Uh, we've sold over a billion units and we've spent a lot of time developing deep relationships with the leading operators in the sector. Uh, this shows a little bit of our, our, our journey over the last 10 years, highlights a few acquisitions we've done, our uh, listing on the OTC exchange uh, back in 2016, we started trading and also calls out some of the capital raises we've done. And, and most importantly, uh, the last point in March of 2021 this year, we announced a definitive merger with Green Lane Holdings, listed on NASDAQ under the symbol GNLN, and we're excited to close that transaction. Uh, at some point, uh, we've got it to mid-year 2021, be able to list the Proforma company on the NASDAQ exchange. Our vision is to be the most trusted partner serving the legal cannabis ecosystem. What is that ecosystem? I'm sure many folks tuning in know the opportunity here in cannabis. It's growing. It's getting nothing but larger. More states are legalizing. We do expect something to happen potentially at the federal level. Why? Cannabis is gaining popularity amongst the voters. 91% of Americans are in favor of legalizing. We know it's creating jobs, creating tax revenue, and even creating safer communities. Uh, and we know that it's converting users from illicit channels 
into legal channels. And that's very important uh, to know because cannabis is currently being consumed in every single state in the country and in every single country around the world for the most part. It's just not being done legally. So this is a once in a generation lifetime where you have an industry that's moving from the illicit channels into the legal regulated channels over the next few decades. We don't have to guess if the market's gonna be there. We know the market's there, it's there today. We just need legislation to catch up with consumption behavior. Um, so let's look at our ecosystem at Kushko. These are the categories that we sell. Uh, we'll do a deeper dive here on the next slide. We sell uh, our core categories of packaging, paper supplies, vaporizer hardware, energy, natural products. We also offer some CBD services. And then uh, we acquired a stake in Excess Financial, uh, which does equipment financing for the cannabis industry. And we have a partnership to be able to offer that to our clientele as well. Um, so a deeper dive, like I mentioned, into our vaporizer hardware and technology category, which uh, is traditionally uh, derived uh, two thirds of our revenue. These are higher average price points than our other goods. Uh, which is why they're a larger revenue driver. Although from a volume basis, we've certainly sold, you know, like we said, over a billion units, a lot of that being packaging. Um, but uh, this is a very exciting category. It's something that is fast growing. It's in demand. Uh, there was the illicit market vape crisis of 2019, which did create some headwinds in the, in the category, but uh, the category is rebounded strong. It's continuing to boom. It is here to stay. Um, and we're partnered with the dominant vape technology device maker, C-Cell, whose parent company, S'more, is public in Hong Kong, valued at over $40 billion U.S. Uh, we're set up as one of their four distribution partners here stateside, and uh, we're leveraging uh, the C-Cell platform to be able to lock in business with leading multi-state operators and vape brand companies throughout North America. Um, packaging is our founding segment. We started as a packaging company under the name Kush Bottles. Um, this is not a commodity. The packaging business really took off once regulation hit in Colorado in 2014, because for the first time, companies were required to buy compliant child-resistant packaging. And think about it, the regulations and the nuances are different in every single state. So it's not that easy for traditional packaging companies to compete, um, which is why despite widespread euphoria over legalization of cannabis, multiple entrants from some of the largest packaging companies in the world, including Berlin Packaging and Berry Plastics, Kushko has still managed to create a market leading position selling packaging to cannabis operators. And we're fortifying, fortifying our moat around that business by locking these clients into contracts and by effectively cross-selling them through our platform, getting them into proprietary, unique packaging solutions um, that make it so that Kushko is guaranteed to be their key supplier of choice for years and hopefully decades to come. And lastly, our energy segment, what's very important to know here is we're selling high purity solvents. We're the only company on the market with stainless steel tanks that actually protect that purity. It's so popular that we've already signed 38 supply agreements to date. We just started that this fiscal year. Um, and we expect to sign at least 100 by the end of the fiscal year. Um, so very excited about the progress we're making with our energy category as well, even though it is overall a smaller percentage of our business. It is high margin, reoccurring revenue. And our customers are satisfied did a survey and here's what our top customers are saying. They believe that we have an understanding of their needs. Um, they prefer our focus on quality and manufacturing certifications, uh, even above price, although we compete very well on price. They like our robust product mix. We have tons of products to offer a variety and we can customize those. And of course, they love the in-person Kushko service that we provide. Um, so it feels good to be loved by our customers and we're continuing to focus our business on doing what's best for our clients in the market and supporting them as they move to the next stages of their growth, both domestically and abroad. So now I'll quickly go through the financial overview. These are some of the highlights from our 2020 fiscal Q2 2021 quarter. We uh, had net revenue of almost 33 million and got gross margins over 20% with cash SG&A coming in at 8.4, a little high as we were working on a merger that we announced, which after two straight quarters of positive adjusted EBITDA had us go slightly uh, back in the negative when it comes to adjusted EBITDA for this quarter, but 
Uh, longer term, we believe we're at that inflection point of getting to profitability. And of course, when you look at the merger, that changes dramatically, and I'll talk about that here in a second. This shows you kind of our revenue by customer group. We are pleased to drive 77% of our revenue from our top 25 customers. That shows that we're going deep and wide with some of the largest operators that can spend big, big volumes today. And these companies are only growing significantly as you look years out. We also break out every quarter revenue by state and location. Uh, we also break out by category. All of this is publicly available, as is our income statement here. And this is a nice chart showing how we've actually uh, restructured the business by focusing on these elite operators. It makes our business much more efficient. And we were able to actually, while uh, unfortunately reducing revenue um, and then ultimately growing it back with the right customer segment, we were able to dramatically reduce our adjusted EBITDA loss and get over that inflection point into profitable territory uh, for Q4 and Q1. And like I said, just retracing a little bit in our most recent Q2. Uh, a balance sheet overview. Uh, we uh, have a strong balance sheet, uh, as you can see here, 35 million of cash. Um, and we also announced uh, subsequent to that that we were able to pay off our long-term debt. So the company's in a debt-free position outside of our working capital uh, credit facility that we have with Monroe Capital. Our leadership team um, starts with me as one of the co-founders, an entrepreneurial spirit, complemented with Stephen Christopherson, our CFO, who also has an entrepreneurial background, um, but supplemented with seasoned executives like Rodrigo and Rihanna Barr, um, and our general counsel, Amir, who actually is one of the few cannabis industry attorneys that has had prior cannabis experience at a big law firm. Investment highlights, um, we have a history track record and brand. Uh, we've been around for a long time. We've leveraged that to build long-term relationships with industry leaders. Um, we're positioned in high growth categories, so we're seeing the benefits of that growth as cannabis continues to expand into new markets domestically and abroad. And we're transitioning to cash flow positive. We're right at that flexion point. We have a strong and versatile leadership team that has navigated through some significant headwinds that we faced in recent years, has really restructured the business, got us on right footing, and has laid the foundation to allow for scalable, profitable growth. And uh, last but not least, we want to touch on the merger with Greenlane. Uh, this is a, truly a transformative merger uh, that we announced on March 31st of, of this year. We believe that this is extremely complimentary, uh, adding a robust portfolio of brands, products, and services to strengthen our cross-selling opportunities. If you look at pro forma revenue, Last year, over 250 million between the two companies. This year, expected to be between 310, 330 million of sales between the two companies. And uh, we're positioned to serve the entire value chain now for MSOs, both selling upstream, like Kushko has traditionally done, to the cultivation and production areas of these operators, and now downstream to their retail channels through the Green Lane product portfolio, uh, which also includes a direct to consumer business. Um, this will also increase margins. Greenlane's been focused on building out their own ancillary brands, becoming a house of brands. And these brands come with much higher margin profiles. Um, so we're excited to be able to enhance the, the total company margin profile, to be able to have a more increased depth and innovation within our portfolio, to bring products that consumers and operators need and want. Uh, and we're also a well-capitalized uh, it, with the NASDAQ listing, we're in a position to be a growth company, both from an organic and inorganic standpoint. We have the opportunity to make acquisitions. Um, there's a pipeline of those that Greenlane has built. And combining industry leaders with 25 plus years of cannabis experience to create the leading ancillary cannabis company and house of brands in this industry. Here's a look at the transaction overview. It was a 50.1%. 49.9% merger, um, and so truly a merger of equals. Uh, I will be the CEO of the Proforma company. We've also announced uh, who the rest of the C-suite team will be, the folks that are gonna report to me. Um, and we look forward to continuing to update the public as we progress toward this merger. We also just recently announced the clearance of the HSR review. Um, so we've moved past that milestone as well. Um, continuing to push forward and excited to consummate this merger, which we expect to happen, like I said, mid-year 2021. And then lastly, if you look at valuations, we believe we're significantly undervalued. This represents a compelling opportunity, especially for an institutional investor 
that wants exposure to some of the best high growth multi-state operators here in the US, but can't buy their CSE listed stocks, well, you now have an opportunity to buy GreenLane on NASDAQ, which now will have meaningful exposure to the leading operators in, in the country through the Cushco customer relationships that we've built. If you look at a sales multiple, we're trading at 1.2 times when some of the peers, especially in the hydroponic space, are trading at six to 10 times sales. So again, we don't need to get six to 10 times sales, but if we get even half of the valuation increase um, that these companies are seeing on NASDAQ, it's gonna position significant upside for Kushko shareholders. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Here's Najim's contact. He's the Director of Investor Relations. Please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we want you guys to be following everything that we're putting out. We have an email list. We have an IR website. Please check us out. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, we want you to be in tune and you know, hopefully you, you find this merger is compelling as we do, and we're certainly excited about it. Uh, we know that there's going to be a shareholder vote, so we want to encourage everyone, again, to pay attention to, to the materials coming out and support us as we look to move into this next stage of our journey, combining companies with GreenLane to create an ancillary powerhouse and listing the combined company on the NASDAQ. Thank you. All right, Nick. Thanks so much for that, my friend. I got tons of questions for you, uh, but we might as well address uh, the exciting news first. A, congrats uh, on leading the exciting new company, uh, Mr. Thank Keo. I, if you're not already living there, I hope you get a nice house in Boca Raton. Uh, the new <laughs> Partners there. Uh, secondly, ma'am, if you wouldn't mind just kind of commenting on you being one of the original public companies in this industry, what was it that you were looking for that you eventually found in GreenLane? And, and that may be just broadly, it may be something you touched on, but I'd love to know exactly why you landed on it now. Yeah, you know, we, we have a long uh, history of knowing uh, each other. Uh, I've always respected Green Lane. Uh, they were the 800 pound gorilla in the ancillary sector, uh, even when Kush was emerging and first going public back in 2016. And so, um, you know, we've always followed them. We've had we've had a lot of mutual respect and admiration. We've actually had very different lanes. Kush goes focused more upstream, as I mentioned, with um, selling consumable products to operators, whereas Green Lane's focused more downstream, being a a third party distributor to retailers. And we've been truly impressed with their recent pivot to focus on more company owned brands, building out a house of ancillary brands that come with high consumer demand and high margin. We think that's gonna be the future of the pro forma business. Of course, we're gonna to continue to service our, our uh, operators with um, the quality of products that they've come to, to know and trust from Kushko, packaging, vape, energy. Um, but we see the future of the growth being in building out this portfolio of company owned house brands and being able to create innovative products that truly resonate with consumers, um, both uh, operators and also in consumers around the world. Uh, we're also positioned in Europe uh, via the GreenLane merger. So a lot of really exciting things to get this company um, a much higher margin profile, a NASDAQ listing, exposure to the global cannabis market more so than we have today. And of course, to join forces with the lead operators that we truly respect and have admired over the years. I love that. Thank you. Um, so you know, commenting on one of your last slides there, you compared yourself to other ancillary companies in the space, like an Akerna, like a hydro farm grow gen. Hey, you know, hey, we can touch on the trading variables there all day. But are any of them, or is there a lot of competition for what you turn into post merger in this industry right now? No, it's a great point, right? Those companies are very different. A few of them focus solely on hydroponics, right, which we don't do. Akerna being more of a technology company, which we're not. So we're we're very unique. Uh, we're certainly by far and away the largest in what we do, um, combined with Green Lane. Uh, you know, it's exponentially bigger. We've got the Nasdaq listing, so uh, we think this positions us to be the acquirer of choice to roll up a lot of these companies in the industry that are creating CPG products and brands, um, companies that uh, want to uh, plug into either uh, the upstream channel that Kushko is traditionally serviced or the downstream channel uh, that GreenLane is serviced. Um, so again, the best way to get your brand supercharged, so to speak, is to join the GreenLane family, um, plug your brand in either via partnership or acquisition, and we can take it to the next level. Um, so we think we're uniquely positioned to do that. and We should get a lot of inbound activity and solicitation. The biggest challenge we're going to have is trying to stay focused. 
because there's so much opportunity all over the place, but we know we need to deliver better financial results for our shareholders. So we're focused on getting this business profitable and then growing substantially, but doing it in a profitable fashion. Thank you for that. Uh, if you don't mind, I just one more question before I let you run here. So, you know, I saw your earnings earlier this year. I, I can't remember when exactly they were. I'm sorry. I just see earnings all the time. Uh, so you mentioned actually in your presentation as well that you brought in, you, you actually went more in depth and you, you increased your earnings, you increased your revenue by going more in depth with your top clients. So just out of curiosity, when these states open up and these markets become legal for these MSOs to enter uh, and acquire new territories, uh, does that directly affect you and your business? And, and I guess post-merger, um, you know, for companies that I guess would work with the, the post-merger company. Yeah, exactly. Uh, look, this is one of the, the, the reasons behind our, our strategic pivot to, to say, hey, before with Cushco, uh, what we wanted to do was set up shop in every new market, right? Put a warehouse there, put a team there, hit the streets, garner new business, right? As, as licenses are given out. And then we had an epiphany and we realized, number one, we don't have the financial capital to do that anymore, especially when the vape crisis hit and, and, and really uh, put pressure on our stock and on our access to capital. Um, and number two, uh, the landscape was shifting. We saw these multi-state operators really positioning themselves to be early entrants into every one of these new markets. And so we said to ourselves, look, we can spend all this time, energy and effort to canvas the ground to try to get the tail of the market. But you know what? I'd rather get the head. I'd rather get the leading players locked in and then follow them into these new markets. So Kushko is in a unique position where when we look at New Jersey, we're already working with several operators that are well positioned in New Jersey, right? When we look at Arizona coming online, we were already positioned with some of the MSOs that immediately made acquisitions to get into the Arizona market. So we can benefit when these markets come online, but not spending the resources in the, in the, in the fashion that we used to in terms of uh, trying to play the ground game, but being more strategic, aligning ourselves with the companies that are, have high expectations for, for growth and expansion, and then sort of riding that growth wave and supporting them as they need more uh, logistical support as they broaden out and expand their org. Um, so we've really focused the business um, less on how do we get after the, this broader customer base, but more so how do we become a better partner to the elite operators and then ride their wave as they expand to new markets and make acquisitions and tuck in a lot of the smaller operators underneath them. Man, 1.2 times uh, is, is looking real nice right now, Nick. <laughs> um, Thank you. As an investor, right? <laughs> All right, man. I, I got like five more questions, but I know I got to let you run. Uh, so it's been a pleasure. Let's please check in uh, and get an update, you know, midsummer. Once this kind of settles down, I think our audience would love to hear from you again, but we really appreciate you being here. I, I'd love to come back on. Thanks for having me. As always, you guys do a great job. And uh, we got a lot going on. So if you're if you're following Benzinga, you'll see some of it. Follow Kush, visit our website, ir.kushco.com. Get on our email list. We want to keep everyone updated. And uh, again, look forward to seeing you soon. Elliot, appreciate it. Thanks again, Nick. Be well, man. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Hello, I'm Tom Zuber. I'm the managing partner of Zuber Lawler. I'd like to thank our friends at Benzinga for the opportunity to speak today. Zuber Lawler is one of the most selective law firms in the United States. Our attorneys represent clients around the world, from offices in Austin, Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles, New York, Phoenix, and Silicon Valley. We focus on high stakes deals, intellectual property matters, FDA, import, export, and other regulatory work and litigation. We work in languages covering 90% of the world's population. Zuber Lawler is unique in the sense that the firm represents a long list of iconic fortune companies and global funds, and has also been representing leading cannabis companies for over 14 years. This provides our attorneys with an ideal perspective from which to manage high stakes complex matters in the cannabis space. Indeed, Zuber Lawler practices at the cutting edge of cannabis law. As examples, Zuber Lawler is a pioneer of the two-stage M&A deal, allowing continuity of cannabis operations in the context of US restrictions on the transfer of ownership of cannabis licenses. Zuber Lawler obtained the second ever issued US plant patent for a cannabis strain, as well as utility patents on cannabis processes, machines, and formulations. Zuber Lawler obtained federal trademark allowances for cannabis brands in relation to relevant products. One of our attorneys obtained the first ever issue generally recognized as safe designation from the FDA for hemp seeds and foods. And Zuber Lawler advises hemp companies on international import export issues relating to North America, South America, Europe, and the Middle East. Zuber Lawler is currently managing major patent, trademark, trade secret, and commercial litigation in the cannabis space. I'm excited to participate in Benzinga's conference. I hope to meet you virtually and in person sometime soon.
Thank you. All right, y'all. Thank you very much. That is Zuber Lawler. We love Tom. We love the team there. Uh, and they offer fantastic insights uh, on this industry consistently. So you've heard from a ton of amazing companies, Sundial, Merrimed, and Kushko all in a row. We're not even close to being done. We have one of the original license holders in the country of Canada. Uh, I'm very excited to bring on a good friend of Benzinga, John Arbuthnot, Delta 9 Cannabis, co-founder and president and chairman. How are you? Elliot, I'm very well. Thank you as always for having me. Yeah, of course. Of, of course, my friend. Uh, I'm going to let you get right to it. We can hop back on for Q&A here in a little bit, but uh, hit us with a little knowledge bomb, my friend. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Benzinga Cannabis Conference. Uh, my name is John Arbuthnot. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Delta 9 Cannabis. I'm uh, going to lead you through the company's history today, uh, chat a little bit about our positioning in the Canadian space. Uh, we don't necessarily use a slide deck, so we'll keep this a little bit less uh, formal, run through the company's history, our points of differentiation, why we feel now is an attractive time uh, to become a shareholder in Delta 9. Uh, before we begin, I do want to remind everyone that today's presentation will contain forward-looking statements that reflect the company's views toward future events. Uh, any such statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, which could cause those results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements. Uh, for more information on risks and forward-looking statements, please refer to our public filings on CDAR and our company's website. And with the legal out of the way, let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, as Elliot mentioned, Delta 9 is one of Canada's oldest cannabis companies with over seven years operating experience. Uh, founded back in 2012, uh, 2013, we became the fourth licensed commercial operator uh, in Canada under the Health Canada MMPR program. Uh, now, the early years of the company were quite modest as a small, privately held licensed producer, uh, producing medical cannabis products, distributing those to uh, patients with a medical authorization through the mail order program. Uh, 2017 became the real growth year for us. Uh, we raised about $10 million throughout the year, uh, listed our shares on the Toronto Venture Exchange in November 2017. Uh, since that time, we've raised about $85 million through a mix of debt and equity uh, to fund the expansion of our various businesses. Uh, we now are one of the few vertically integrated and diversified cannabis companies in the country. Uh, we're licensed by Health Canada for cultivation, uh, processing, extraction, and wholesale distribution across six Canadian provinces. Uh, we're a licensed retailer, currently operating 12 bricks and mortar cannabis retail stores, as well as direct to consumer online sales uh, through our online platform and continuing to expand that chain of stores across the prairie provinces here in Canada. Uh, and we operate a business to business segment where we sell our proprietary cultivation platform. Uh, we provide consulting and licensing services uh, to other uh, cannabis licensed and pre-licensed uh, businesses, and we sell cannabis genetics. Uh, the company's shares now trade on the main board Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol DN, uh, and we trade over the counter on the OTCQX Exchange under the symbol DLTNF. Now, on the cultivation side of the business, what really makes us unique is how we grow, as opposed to big open warehouse or greenhouse uh, or outdoor operations used by many of our competitors. Our proprietary cultivation methodology is built around a uh, modular, uh, scalable, stackable production unit that we call the grow pod. Uh, now, we feel this indoor, relatively small-scale cultivation methodology uh, carries a number of benefits versus uh, big open uh, grow spaces. Uh, it gives us a very high level of control over the growing environment, allowing us to dial in those factors that most directly contribute to product quality. Uh, so temperature, humidity, light intensity, uh, CO2 saturation, all of that dialed in very precisely uh, and leading us to higher quality output products. Uh, the grow pods are relatively inexpensive given we manufacture them ourselves. They provide a very attractive return on invested capital. Uh, we customize these growing environments for each genetic strain of cannabis that we grow, maximizing yield and potency. Uh, and the modular format, you have to remember, minimizes the risk of contamination, spread of contamination throughout these facilities. This is an agricultural crop. Uh, we really mitigate risk by putting it into these small, highly controlled uh, indoor growing environments. Uh, companies scaled our operations significantly over the last few years. Our licensed grow pods uh, here on our site, uh, 297 of those uh, currently licensed and in operation in our state-of-the-art uh, cultivation facilities. 
Now, beyond uh, the operational benefits, there's obviously an economic case for these pods. As I mentioned, uh, we are manufacturing them ourselves. There's a very attractive return on invested capital uh, for these grow pods. Uh, we're typically expanding our operations for under $100 per square foot. Uh, this compares with you know, conventional or purpose-built facilities, which can range upwards of $300 per square foot. So relatively inexpensive uh, from, a, uh, uh, from a CapEx perspective, again, leading to better return on invested capital. Uh, our operations have scaled, again, significantly over the last few years. We've invested heavily in automation of key processes. We also have relatively cheap input costs given our positioning here in Canada uh, for things like electricity uh, and labor inputs. Uh, we now have our per gram production costs down to only 60 cents per gram uh, as of Q1 this year. So putting us in the low cost category uh, in terms of manufacturing efficiency, but again, producing higher quality, higher potency output products. So positioned very competitively uh, in terms of how we manufacture, how we cultivate uh, our cannabis products. From a scale perspective, again, 297 grow pods under license as a part of our phase one and phase two facilities. This represents about 95,000 square feet of flowering canopy on multiple floors of production uh, in our 80,000 square foot facility. Our capacity right now is about 8,325 kilos per year or between 25 and $30 million in today's uh, cannabis wholesale market. Uh, our site here in Winnipeg, Manitoba is comprised of 47 acres of land, giving us uh, a huge area to continue to expand our operations as the global uh, cannabis industry continues to expand. We're now working on expansion of our Health Canada license perimeter from that 80,000 square foot current uh, floor plate under license to up to 135,000 square feet. Uh, new purpose built vault and distribution space uh, has already been built out and is pending licensing. Uh, and some efficiency gains that we are investing in in our existing facilities will bring our cultivation capacity up to approximately 12,000 kilos per year over the next few years. That would be up to uh, approximately $45 million uh, in today's cannabis wholesale market here in Canada. Over the long term, we of course will continue to bring on supply capacity uh, as the Canadian market, the global market continue to expand. Again, ample opportunity uh, for the company to expand uh, as the industry uh, dictates. Uh, now in terms of our product offering, Delta 9 currently offers about 30 different SKUs of dried flour making up the majority of our uh, portfolio. Uh, we also offer cannabis pre-rolls, ingestible oils, uh, cannabis vape products, and a limited line of cannabis concentrates, and several SKUs of 2.0 products currently in development. A lot of excitement in the Canadian cannabis space around the introduction of derivative and 2.0 cannabis products over the last 12 to 15 months, uh, but we have to remember that over 60% market share in the Canadian space is still uh, comprised of dried flour and pre-rolls. Uh, so a lot of our company's focus is making sure that our portfolio of cannabis products uh, is really uh, meeting the value proposition for consumers in the flower and pre-roll space. A lot of our production pivot over the last 12 months has been towards higher quality, higher potency products, which are in very high demand uh, from the end consumer. We have a genetic seed bank on site of over 75 unique cannabis genetics. This gives us a, a huge pipeline of products that we can continue to bring to market continue to remain interesting and relevant uh, for consumers that are seeking quality, quality and, uh, and potency. Uh, in 2020, we also developed, launched a number of uh, value SKUs in kind of the mid-range potency segment uh, to compete with value offerings from a number of our competitors and position from a pricing perspective to be competitive with black market. Uh, it's not uncommon now to see Delta 9 products available in retail uh, for between four and five dollars a gram Again, now positioning us to be not only competitive versus our, our legal market competitors, but also competitive with black market. Pre-rolls have become an increasingly important category uh, in the Canadian space. A lot of consumers liking the convenience uh, in small packaging sizes and also in a pre-rolled uh, cannabis setting. A uh, company currently has four different SKUs of cannabis pre-rolls. Uh, we have produced uh, in our history over one million uh, and uh, cannabis pre-rolls and brought those through to market. Uh, we are investing in automation of our pre-rolls line uh, now, uh, which will increase our supply capacity for pre-rolls across our respective provincial markets. Uh, again, on 2.0 cannabis products, the company currently selling uh, Delta 9 branded ingestible oils. We will be expanding that portfolio over this year uh, to include new product formulations. Uh, we will be relaunching 
the company's vape SKUs, three different SKUs and formulations of vaporizers uh, in 510 cartridges to be hitting the market this year. Uh, we currently offer cannabis Keef, and we'll be expanding that line uh, to increase our portfolio of cannabis concentrates uh, throughout this year. Uh, we obviously believe uh, that these 2.0 derivative products will become an increasingly important category into the future. Uh, we are obviously offering the full scope of these products uh, from Canada's leading manufacturers through our retail chain, which gives us live data feedback analytics on, on what's working, what's not working in these 2.0 products, allowing us to then better invest uh, in our wholesale and manufacturing segments to bring these products to market. From a distribution standpoint, the company's added distribution markets incrementally as we've expanded our overall capacity. Uh, we're now in six Canadian provinces, all of the Western provinces, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, as well as Ontario and Newfoundland uh, and Labrador. Uh, this gives us access to upwards of 25 million uh, potential Canadian consumers across these markets as we now span uh, coast to coast from a distribution standpoint. Uh, we very much like vertical integration, uh, very bullish on the retail segments here in Canada. Uh, we opened our first Delta 9 branded uh, uh, cannabis store on October 17th, 2018. That was legalization day uh, here in Canada to lineups around the block. Uh, we now operate 12 Delta 9 branded retail stores across Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta markets. Uh, we like vertical integration for a number of reasons. It gives us control over the sales force, the bud tenders who are driving a lot of the purchasing decisions for consumers. Uh, gives us control over distribution, uh, control over marketing and branding uh, and advertising initiatives. We are very limited on how we can market and advertise ourselves here in Canada. Uh, so giving us a method to advertise right to the end consumer obviously becomes quite important. Also gives us live feedback, data and analytics. Again, we're able to keep our finger on the pulse on consumer and product trends, pricing strategies from our competitors, make us a better uh, vertically integrated cannabis company from our manufacturing side by having access to retail. Our stores have produced significant economics. We often produce uh, revenue per square foot, revenue per store, well in excess uh, of our large retail uh, competitors. We continue to build out a chain of dozens uh, of Delta 9 branded retail stores across uh, those provinces that allow for vertical integration over the years, uh, years to come. In our business to business segment, uh, you'll see we drive a portion of our revenue from sales of our proprietary growing platform, sales of, of uh, cannabis equipment, uh, providing consulting and licensing services to other cannabis businesses. So we provide standard operating procedures, uh, sanitation programs. Really, we provide a turnkey platform uh, for cannabis industry entrepreneurs looking to get into the space uh, to get licensed to expand their own uh, platform within the industry. Uh, this gives us a, a number of benefits for the company, it gives us diversified revenue into the picks and shovels. Uh, side of the industry, uh, high margin business segment, again, to diversify our revenue and margin strategy, uh, third party validation of our cultivation platform uh, and valuable partnerships uh, with these other businesses uh, that are expanding across North America. Uh, I think it's very important to note that this B2B segment provides uh, investors with diversified exposure to the picks and shovel side of the industry. I think most notably, uh, this is a business segment that we can push into the United States. Uh, so we are prohibited as a TSX listed company to conduct plant touching activities in the U.S. But this ancillary products businesses, the infrastructure business, does allow us to participate in the near term upside in the U.S. market. Uh, we successfully built out facilities in Michigan and Maine last year. We've now hired a dedicated U.S. Uh, sales force that is specifically targeting U.S. states that are in, in expansion mode uh, and look to capitalize on the upside uh, prior to and in the wake of uh, what we hope is federal legalization uh, of cannabis south of the border in the United States. Turning to our financials, you'll see our most recent financials demonstrate the company, you know, has a laser focus on execution uh, and is, is contributing significant growth to top line. Uh, we have produced significant revenue growth in each year since listing our shares publicly. Uh, revenues have grown from less than 1 million in 2017 to 7.6 million the next year. Uh, over 32 million in 2019, over 52 million uh, last year in 2020. Uh, that's an increase of over 5,000% uh, from the time we listed our shares uh, through 2020, making us one of Canada's fastest growing companies. Uh, from a segmentation standpoint on our 52 million in revenue last year, we produced 32.2 million from retail. That was up 110% year over year. Our wholesale segment was 11.8 million up 24%. 
And our B2B revenues were 8.6 million, up 38% year over year. Uh, gross profit was up 105% to 17.8 million last year. And I think most notably company achieved 3.8 million in positive adjusted EBITDA, 1.5 million in operating cash flows last year. One of the few Canadian cannabis operators that has produced positive cash flows from operations uh, in its history. Uh, Q1 this year, we took a little step back versus the sequential quarter Q4 last year due to industry headwinds, uh, seasonal decline in retail, uh, and a miss in our B2B segment uh, with revenues coming in at 13.2 million. I do want to encourage investors to look forward to our Q2 guidance, which will come out in the next 30 to 45 days. I think there's a significant amount of growth to expect here uh, into Q2 and, and into the back part of, uh, uh, of 2021 as the overall Canadian market uh, and Delta 9 continue to expand uh, uh, on the revenue side. Uh, on the balance sheet, we've maintained a strong balance sheet, over $23 million, uh, in working capital at year end, uh, over $8 million in cash. Uh, cap table is very tight. Uh, so only about 100 million shares outstanding gives us a market capitalization right now of about 50 million. Companies currently trading about one times trailing 12 month revenue uh, versus our peer comps that traditionally trade uh, quite a bit higher than that. Uh, obviously significant opportunity here for, uh, for investors that are seeking value uh, in the cannabis space. I just wrap things up with, you know, why to invest in Delta 9? I mean, our, our businesses have been declared essential through COVID that kind of de-risks the investment strategy through some of the uncertainty in the global pandemic. We have a significant track record for success. Our execution, diversified growth strategy has spoken for itself. Uh, investment for management, we're highly invested. We own about 40% uh, of the company's equity. Uh, path to profitability. Investors are in increasingly seeking uh, profitability in the cannabis space. We showed 3.8 million uh, in adjusted EBITDA last year. Again, one of the few Canadian cannabis companies that can speak to that. Uh, as always, I would encourage investors to conduct their own due diligence. Uh, all of our Delta 9 investor materials, including most recent financials, uh, MD&A documents, investor presentations, etc., all available on our website at invest.delta9.ca. Uh, check out our main website at just delta9.ca, give you a look and feel of our retail business, the products and services that we offer. Uh, as always, please don't hesitate to reach out to our investor relations folks with any questions you might have. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we'll flip things back over to, uh, to Elliot for any questions we might have. John, thank you so much for being here, man. Uh, always love getting updates from you. You know, I, I didn't really have all those numbers in my head. Uh, you know, from the, the time of your listing to now. That's incredible. Uh, it truly is. Uh, yeah, looking through uh, the Canadian Globe and Mail, uh, uh, you know, list of fastest growing companies in Canada, you see kind of the top 10 companies reaching that 5,000% or so plus uh, in three-year uh, revenue growth. Uh, and Delta 9 now, you know, entering that territory, one of the fastest growing companies uh, in the country here in Canada. So, you know, I, I think that speaks to that track record for execution and, and something investors should look for is, is us continuing uh, to uh, to perform on that that expansion strategy. You know, it, I'll, I'll grab your advice while, while I have you here. Uh, yesterday, I got to moderate a fireside with a gentleman. We discussed vertical integration and the future of it in the U.S. And I'd love to kind of have you add on your insights as to the value of vertical integration in Canada, if you would. You know, it's it's interesting. You see a lot of CPG focus CEOs really take the opposite approach that, you know, they want to own brands, they want to own products, but they don't necessarily care about the cultivation or the distribution side of the industry. Uh, we've taken the, the very opposite approach that, you know, we want to control cultivation, processing, distribution, and retail. Uh, I think the cannabis industry is a different beast than what a lot of CPG focused uh, companies are, are, are used to. Uh, it's a new industry. Distribution is not as established. We do not have national chains of retail or, uh, or e-commerce giants often to be pushing distribution of our products. Uh, quality control is very important. So being able to actually manufacture these products, uh, be engaged in the product development components as well as the processing and distribution, I, I think is very important. And what I've seen the largest benefit is being tapped into the end consumer. At the end of the day, the consumers are going to decide who the winners are in the cannabis space. If we can operate a chain of stores across the country uh, where we're processing millions of transactions a year, that's millions of data points that we are getting from consumers telling us which products are they liking, 
How should we be pricing our products? What should we be manufacturing? How can we provide value to the end consumer? Ultimately, that's going to translate into a winning strategy and translate into returns for investors. I love it when you say data. Like not you, but like anybody who says data in this industry, I feel like that's the key word for investors to go, excuse me, <laughs> data. I love it. John, thank you so much for being here, my friend. Always great to get updates. Uh, we should see you live in October, I think, October 13th and 14th. We'll hopefully uh, be able to talk about some more milestones with you. Finally looking forward to an in-person, yes, as uh, it starts to wind down here, Elliot. But thank you as always for having me. Great conference. Uh, always Thanks, a pleasure. John. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. Awesome. So that was John Arbuthnot, the president, chairman, and co-founder of Delta 9 Cannabis, one of the oldest cannabis companies in Canada, or one of the original licenses, I should say, uh, to not change what he is telling me. Really quick, uh, I want to show the poll that we just most recently did. Most of you think cannabis will be federally legalized in the U.S. within the next five years. I think some of this conference would be thrilled. Some of this conference uh, hope you are vastly wrong. Some don't expect it. I have seen such a variety of answers on this. Uh, I'll leave this here. I'm going to lock the voting. We'll do the next poll after this panel. Uh, with that, I'm going to bring up Natan, uh, one of Benzinga's finest writers uh, and the head of our oh. psychedelics content. How are you, my friend? You're so nice, Elliot. Thank you. I'm doing great. Oh. How are you? I only speak the truth. I'm good, yeah. man. We're we're in the midst of probably one of the best agendas I've had the pleasure of working yeah. on here at Benzinga. Uh, and I'm so excited uh, about this panel you're about to lead. I'm going to take some notes and get my investor cap on. So I'm going to let you take it away and introduce the okay. panel. It's a wonderful panel. Um, so as everyone joins, um, yes, we have, this is the second panel of this day in the cannabis conference. Um, we have a wonderful panel. Well, we'll be discussing uh, two things, mostly. Um, those who are eager to hear psychedelic finance, you have to stick to the end of the panel because we are going to be discussing science and, and businesses and, and market outlooks first. And by the second half of the panel, we'll be um, going into, you know, financials and, and how the, the financial markets are are developing, have been developing, and maybe what the future looks for for finance. But first, um, let's do a little round of, of introductions. Um, just everyone, maybe speak to 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 the audience. Tell us who they who you are. Um, what are you doing in this industry, and what companies do you represent? So, Joseph, if you would like to start, and then we can just go around the, the circle. Sure. Uh, thanks, Natan. And thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's great, great to see everybody again. Uh, so uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Tucker. I'm the CEO of Magic Med Industries. Uh, at Magic Med, we're totally focused on creating new molecules, new variants of psychedelics, employing uh, synthetic biology and chemistry to create new molecules for this sector. Wonderful. Um, Hugh, how about you? Hi there, I'm the CEO and Director of Ex Fido Therapeutics Corp. We're an investment accelerator and incubator with a number of uh, programs in psychedelic medicine, including API production, drug formulation, and some uh, molecule molecular engineering. Oh, Sylvia? Hi, I'm Sylvia. I work at Defines ETFs. I'm the CIO there. So we provide investors with basically exposure to dynamic subsectors. We like to think of ourselves as the next generation of investing. And one of the ETFs we've recently built is around psychedelics. So it's the uh, defiance, we call it the altered, exper altered uh, experienced ETF, but it's essentially psychedelics and cannabis in an ETF wrapper. I, I was writing about your ETF just <laughs> this morning. Mm. Yeah, uh, nice. <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> so James. Well, thanks, Natan. So my name is James Lantier. I'm the CEO of uh, Mindset Pharma. We're a public company traded on the CSE. Um, we're a biotechnology company, and, and our focus is on uh, discovering and developing um, next-generation psychedelic drugs, so, so next-generation molecules that have really been, uh, been optimized for, uh, for use as, as you know, pharmaceutical drugs for the widest possible uh, population groups. Wonderful. 
Cool. Um, so to begin, our idea here was to discuss and share some ideas around two possible paradigms of application of psychedelics in general, um, which are sort of presenting themselves today. Um, one that is gaining ground and is probably going to dominate the industry in the next three to five years as psychedelics come into legality. And then another paradigm which might be the future of psychedelics and is going to, to start um, being involved in the industry as well. Um, the first one is basically what we refer to as psychedelics assisted psychotherapy, um, which is treatment in clinics using psychedelics to assist talk therapy and to, to do mental health progress with the company of a professional, a trained therapist, and always in a clinic. And with the development that is going on um, and that, that many companies are doing today, with second generation psychedelics, uh, we see the possibility of bringing this type of substances for people to use at their homes without professional supervision by altering some of the traits of psychedelics for, for reduced risk and, and other benefits that could allow eventually for people to be taking these psychedelics at home. Um, so, would anyone like to begin introducing what psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is and how the market is evolving to accommodate for this type of, of therapies and clinics? If anyone feels comfortable with this, just raise your hand and, and we can begin the conversation there. Or I can, I can, I can assign you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you wanna go Sylvia, cool. Sure, I can try. Um, so I, yeah. I think, you know, first it's good to kind of, you know, define it a little bit. So psychedelics are thought to be um, medicines that basically target a subset of the brain and um, serotonin receptors. So, you know, in, in layman's terms, I was told by a, 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 a professor that it just allows the brain to communicate in different ways than other medicines do or, you know, people who have um, or suffer from severe mental illness are able to communicate within their own brain. So the most popular types of psychedelics that are being sort of studied now and researched now are LSD, uh, MDMA, and psilocybin, magic mushrooms, basically. Um, and some, you know, some of these drugs are, are drugs similar to the form of what these, these are looking like now have been used in 1600 BC back in Greece for you know, both mystical ceremonies and alternative medicine. So they've been around for a long time. Um, so it's really interesting about this and like, you know, how we get here is that, you know, for the last, if we look at like the last few decades, there has been, you know, almost no growth and innovation within pharmaceuticals when it comes to mental illness, you know, whereas you've seen major advancements in other fields of medicine, like cardiology, for example, immunology, you know, think about how fast, how fast the, uh, the COVID vaccine came out, but mental illness medications aren't really experiencing that same growth, but we just see this spike in mental illness, particularly depression worldwide. So in the world, there are apparently officially diagnosed 700 million people with some sort of mental illness and the cost to treat them is 2.5 trillion, but 30% of them are never treated. So that 30% is sort of where all of this comes in. Um, there are being a lot of, you know, there are a lot of trials that are being done where these medicines, these psychedelics are being administered to patients along with psychotherapy. So that means that, you know, a professional healthcare worker, psychotherapist, psychologist, someone sort of familiar with this is sitting in a room with a patient who, who is experiencing this sort of trip by taking this medicine. So it's, you know, it's been really interesting because Cornell has had some studies come out where, you know, LSD has allowed these patients with severe mental illness, particularly PTSD and veterans to, to kind of come out the other side. Um, a group called MAPS is in phase three trials on um, the use of MDMA, for example. So they've had loads of people essentially with a targeted psychotherapist taking the medicine and then sort of like talking through what's going on, helping their brain communicate in a different way. And after a year of the psychotherapy coupled with the medicine, you know, two thirds of them are deemed cured and no longer suffering from PTSD or whatever that illness is. So some of these initial results are 
are leading us to believe that, you know, two thirds is a big number, right? They say it's more like 75% actually, but this leads us to believe that with, you know, targeted psychotherapy and the use of this alternative medicine where classic antidepressants have failed, you know, there's sort of hope for the most severe mental illness patients. And, you know, a lot of these clinics, I think, um, you know, the um, Rick Doblin who runs the MAP study, you know, he, he recently said that by the end of 2021, he expects to have, you know, sort of approval based on the phase three results um, with the FDA. And, and, you know, from that, we'll see psychedelic clinics open up all over the US. So, you know, this is very much sort of happening and growing and becoming, it, it feels like it's becoming decriminalized anyway. Um, it's happening in Oregon and Colorado already, but, um, you know, psychedelics coupled with psychotherapy seems to be a new mental illness option and perhaps an innovation after decades of, you know, stale results. Well, that was a wonderful intro to what psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is, the research and, and the possible market outlook. And so Sylvia, what, while we're here, um, since you launched the psychedelic CTF quite recently, I imagine that you did like you, you zoomed over the entire space to look at all of the companies that you want to include in your ETF. Um, how much of your uh, coverage would you say includes companies that are applying uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in clinics right now and how much are you looking into the future for companies that are developing um, you know future treatments if you can put it in in I don't know percentages or or how, how yeah, much they so, weigh. Yeah. so it's a tricky thing right because when you when you launch an ETF in the US anyway you you, you have a 1940 um, requirement and, and companies have to be of a certain size, they have to have a certain amount of liquidity right. and market cap and things like that. So for us, you know, they're, they're, we have every pure uh, company that does psychedelics research in our ETF that has that 70 million market cap and that 500 um, average ADV number that's sort of like required for us. And then, you know, there's a mix of cannabis companies in there. So it's about 50, 50, but what we try to do is, is get every company that is investing in researching psychedelics. And then, you know, sort of that, when you fall into like what the rules allow, that comes out to like six or seven companies. So then the next level was companies that drive 50% of their revenues from psychedelics or cannabis. And then, you know, sort of it ends with cannabis. But um, as the companies continue to grow, um, you know, I've had a bunch of CEOs reach out to us, like, can you put our, our company in your ETF for pure psychedelics and whatnot? But um, you know, as soon as those companies sort of get further investments and grow to a point that they're big enough to comply with the rules, we're definitely going to include them. You know, our goal is to have the pure psychedelic CTF out there. That's wonderful. Okay. But psychedelics don't, the potential psychedelics doesn't end there. And um, these compounds give us a lot of other wonderful opportunities for treating mental health. So James, maybe would you like to introduce us to to what your company is doing and and everyone else feel free to also chime in if you, if you feel like you have something interesting to share. Um, but tell us what, what you're doing in, in taking these sort of first generation molecules that are going to be applied soon in clinics and how that can uh, be translated into something even sure. for patients. Sure, so, so... Um, and that, that Sylvia, that was an excellent introduction. I think, um, you know, what I'd, what I'd add to that and as it relates to mindset, you know, as to pick up on one of the themes that Sylvia mentioned, we're, we're very much, uh, you know, psychedelics are not a, not a new, new thing at all. They've been around for thousands of years. Um, the, the, the current molecules that a lot of the groups are working with today, um, are, are also not particularly new and the, and the use of those drugs um, as therapeutic uh, agents it isn't new either. So, so you know, psilocybin was, was marketed and, and sold uh, as indocybin in the 1960s and for, for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, you know, LSD was used to treat alcoholism. Like it's, it's not a new, it's not a new use of, um, of the drugs and really you know, we're here today on this panel um, and the industry is where it is thanks to the work of these different um, 
you know, not-for-profit groups um, like MAPS, USONA, so on, that, that, uh, that had a lot of conviction and were able to um, advance uh, research and clinical trials to show that the drugs were you know, mainly, uh, mainly safe, not addictive, and had this you know, therapeutic benefit. Um, to, to, to us at, at Mindset, you know, the, the gap or the op really the opportunity was um, all that work had gone into proving that, the, that these, you know, first generation drugs um, were, you know, were potentially useful and, and helping kind of really change the minds of regulators around the drugs. Um, but, but to us, it was kind of the natural next step to, um, to apply, you know, the scientific method and, and pharmaceutical, you know, discovery models to try to um, extend the drugs and, and really to try to create, um, you know, drugs that, that, uh, that did an even better job, that were less toxic and that, you know, potentially were more, more predictable and potentially had a more, you know, convenient uh, duration. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to do. And, and, uh, you know, in our, in our view as well, the big commercial opportunity would be in second and third generation drugs, because the, uh, the, the well-known drugs, you know, MDMA, psilocybin, um, LSD, you know, pretty much you name it, they're all in the, they're all in the public domain. Um, and so for, for, to, for, to, for the real investment to be made in the space to make it possible for for uh, for the space to grow and flourish, it would really require drugs that enjoyed uh, you know full patent protection, and those would be second and third generation drugs. As far as as far as the question of you know whether it's it's the the macrodosing paradigm, uh, the in clinic assisted psychotherapy. Um, or or, or, uh, or more of a microdosing paradigm that you know wins the day. I think there's there's definitely room for both. We're only psychedelics are maybe have, may have been around for quite a long time, but we're really only in uh, in the early innings of the next generation drug development. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, Joe, it, it, are you going to add to that? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I agree with uh, everything that James just said. Uh, he and I have a very uh, similar perspective on the sector and and the industry, and I I do think that you know the it, one of the things that makes this industry so exciting to be a part of right now is the science is not settled. You know, maybe it's as James says, maybe it's macrodosing, maybe it's microdosing, maybe there's a continuum. Uh, it, you know, it's it's quite interesting to see as all this work is being done, and certainly at Magic Man, and I believe. I believe uh, over at uh, James's shop, we, we take the same sort of agnostic perspective. Let's make new molecules that, you know, first off, of course, are patentable, but second, have the potential to, as James says, reduce a lot of side effects, you know, have, have a variety of different activities so that whatever it ends up being, we will have, you know, great molecules that can go forward and get to a much wider patient population then, you know, what I honestly think, it's probably a lot more narrow to go through the psychotherapy, you know, the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is probably a narrower patient population at the end of the day. Hmm. So, Hugh, I wanted to ask you, since you're, you and your company come from, from cannabis and from cannabinoids, how can cannabinoids assist um, this whole drug development side of psychedelics? And, and how do you see your company fitting into all this scheme? Yeah, that's interesting. So our approach, well, I'll start with the cannabis space. You know, we're focused on drug formulation. So we acquired a German-based thin film uh, drug development company. And we have a number of programs in the generic and hybrid generic space. Some of those overlap into cannabinoids. I think the relationship between cannabinoids and psychedelics is going to get very complicated. And I think at least initially, um, our approach is to, is to keep those separate. Um, we are participating in the psychedelic industry as well um, when it comes to standardization of API production and then using our drug delivery expertise on the um, sublingual and buccal dissolvable forms in particular to develop precision dosing. So I think as we move away from, say, let's say a peyote or a, a cultivated psilocybin model into something that's uh, standardized, um, with more predictable dosing and bioavailability, 
I think, and then transition into the sort of second and third generation drugs. Um, I think, I guess the, sh the short answer would be there probably is some, um, there, there's some potential there, but I think our approach is to keep them separate at, at mm -hmm. this point in time. I'm not sure how um, Joseph and James feel about that, but I think it could get very complicated from a regulatory perspective to start mixing those two verticals. Yeah, I, I jump in on that, Hugh. I, I totally agree. You know, I've been developing drugs for a long time, and I'll tell you, you bring mixtures of molecules into the regulators uh, you're in for a world of hurt. So you definitely want to certainly kind of learn things that you can, what's happened as entities have tried to take, say, you know, plant derived, but natural molecules through, what have they learned? But you, you really don't want to try to mix those things unless it's the only way that it actually will work. Definitely want to try to do monotherapies. Mm. And, and I would I'd just add to that, you know, for, for, for for if you're in the the business of of developing you know next generation psychedelics like like dr tucker and i are it, it, you know there's the approach is really de-risked right because at this at this point we're we're building off of um a really solid base of evidence that um that these drugs you know work and have a have a benefit for for people so it's it's a bit of a different uh, ball game than developing drugs in a in another you know biotech area. What we're I think what we're probably both looking to do is really to try to you know improve on on them, um, you know through through making really small chemical modifications. So so it it makes it a, a bit of a different uh, undertaking. Yeah, I I gotta agree with you, James. Uh, this is one of those unique spaces where you take a look and it's it's pretty obvious that these molecules have a profound impact there's no real question right so now it's can we can we dial this in to get the best impact the least side effects and ultimately get these to patients right but there's you're right so many pharmaceuticals you're moving into it having no clue do they really have much in the way of an impact and you know human society has been using these for thousands of years um, to, to great effects. I think it's pretty obvious that they're gonna work. Now it's just, let's make them safe. Let's get to the most patients possible. Hmm. So what do you think should happen to these molecules or what, what are you doing to these molecules uh, for them to be able to be taken at home without professional supervision? How can these molecules be, be changed and affected? Um, for people to, you know, to, to open this sort of other uh, huge market, which is, uh, you know, the at-home market. So there's the billion dollar question right there, right? Um, mm. How do you change them to make them effective uh, while, while being able to get to all these patients, which, you know, on the face of the first thing you think of is, well, if we can dial down the hallucination and still get the benefit, that would help a lot question is science doesn't know if that's going to work or not. So I, I think that we're, we're all coming at this from kind of the same approach, which is, so first off, as Sylvia said earlier, this is the serotonin, uh, you know, homeostasis, this is the serotonin uh, metabolism we're talking about. There are a lot of different serotonin receptors. Modulating serotonin, that's what things like SSRIs do right now. So we know we're in the right ball field, you know, in the right ballpark here messing with this. And I think what we're all doing is making modifications to the molecules so that they will have different binding or, or you know, agonism, antagonism with the different serotonin receptors, different dopamine receptors, even the different NMDA receptors. I just realized I went super sciencey on everybody. Sorry about that. Um, we're modifying the molecules kind of at black box. We're gonna see what happens there. That's the <laughs> person's view. Yeah, I think I think you you know we really have to let the the data in our in our programs you know guide where we take them right. So so there's so one thing is for sure there's a lot of groups now working on the downstream you know clinical indications testing out different um, you know first generation drugs to to determine how well they work for different indications. 
you know, we, we think that there probably will be, for sure, there'll be some indications um, a little bit outside of what people are targeting with psychedelics today. So things like you know, juvenile ADHD or uh, potentially, you know, Alzheimer's where a, where a sub-hallucinogenic drug will, could work really well for them because they're just population groups that you don't want to have undergo a full psychedelic experience. But as far as, as like, does, is a non-hallucinogenic drug going to work for, you know, major depressive disorder or, you know, post-traumatic stress or one of these really big indications? We don't know. You know, all, all the evidence right now is in the data is on the side of, uh, of, of, of the psychedelic experience being, you know, really critical to, to shutting down that, that, you know, you know, overly busy ruminative part of a depressed person's brain that keeps them stuck in these negative thought patterns. Maybe you can get to it by, by dialing back the psychedelic experience, but you know, that's not what the data shows right now. Mm. Or yet. Yeah. I think this is a pretty interesting industry in the, in the sense that it's quite unique because there are these drugs that are being developed, but there's also this whole infrastructure that needs to be developed for the application of these drugs. Um, so in that sense, psychedelics companies are pretty, pretty unique. Uh, but when you are moving into sub hallucinogenic drugs, that's basically what every pharmaceutical company is doing. They're developing sub hallucinogenic drugs that are not hallucinogenic. Um, so what would you say? And uh, Maybe Hugh, if you want to chime in on this, um, what's the sort of first mover advantage of psychedelics companies when moving into non-hallucinogenic drugs? Uh, what, 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 yeah, what can they offer that other pharmaceutical companies can't? Well, I, I find it in the psychedelic industry, I think the most exciting thing for me is is the potential for neuroplasticity. So you have this potential opportunity for long-term, potentially permanent changes in neurochemistry um and hopefully from smaller doses i mean i think that's borne out you know as joseph and james have, have noted in in larger dose therapies can we do it in, in smaller doses and micro doses can we replace ssris and more conventional pharmaceuticals i i think the jury's still out on that but it you know it is very exciting and i, I see this potential for let's say long-term change um as the most exciting part of the industry Mm. The, the, yeah go ahead oh, i was just gonna say i th i think um i think uh you know larger pharma companies have have for years been trying to get away from any uh you know there's a well-known serotonin receptor that that is you know activity there is highly correlated with the psychedelic experience and so yeah, you know, pharmaceutical companies have really been trying to develop drugs that didn't go anywhere near that receptor. I think that um, probably the the psychedelic companies have a bit of an advantage because um, we're. I don't think any. You know, we're we're, in, we're well at mindset. We're interested in drugs that that potentially still you know activate that receptor, um, so they're not selective away from it. Um, but they're just, they're just activating it a little less or substantially mm -hmm. less than, uh, than, um, you know, the well-known psychedelics. Well, well, that was an interesting way to put it. Okay. Um, so without further ado, for those in the audience who are only waiting to hear about the financial part of the psychedelics industry, uh, our moment has come. Sylvia, I imagine that you've been tracking this industry for a while. Um, can you give us a little overview of what's been happening? I mean, I, I believe I read recently that there was something like in, tw tw in 2017, there were like a million dollars invested in the entire industry and now it's like in the hundreds of millions. Um, so how do you see the development of the industry from, you know, three years ago, maybe five years ago to today? And yeah, we can start there. Yeah, sure. So, so I think you, you know, you sort of laid it out pretty well a few, a few years ago when, you know, there was no sort of thought that this would go anywhere or perhaps I shouldn't even say a few years ago, because it's really a few decades ago. Um, you know, when again, there was like this, this view that that these drugs should be criminalized and, and, you know, absolutely cut off and whatnot. But now that the phase one, two, three trials are coming out from Johns Hopkins and Cornell and MAPS, um, 
now you kind of see, uh, to your point, this, this, you know, 3000% fold type of investment going into these sectors, you know, Peter Thiel is apparently going to invest, um, you know, like upwards into the hundreds of millions into one company, but the estimates out there are that billions of dollars are going to go into this space. And if you just think about, you know, again, the worldwide cost of treating mental illness is 2.5 trillion. Um, if if you even make, you know, consider that cannabis and psychedelics are a small part of what what could be, I, I think it's in the multi multi billions. Um, so, you know, and, and if you look at some of these companies, like MindMed is one of the companies that we invest in um, or that we have in our, our ETF anyway. And if you look at like from the beginning of 2020 until now, you know, they're up like 700%. I mean, they're, they're still sub $5 stocks in a lot of cases, but I think investors are really starting to pay attention to these types of products. You see their market cap slowly growing. You see, you know, investors coming in, private equity coming into the space. So it's really hard to predict what it'll be, but you know, the numbers that people are putting out there are in the hundreds of billions of dollars between now and 2025. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Joe, you had some interesting um, comments on this that you shared the other day. So, so yeah. Sure. Yeah. Can, no, my, yeah. So my, my personal experience, both being in it and also watching the sector mature over the last few years has been, a, I think, an interesting shift maybe in the perspective of the investors coming in and also really the identity of the investors. You know, the first wave, in my opinion, was mostly driven by a retail Canadian investor. Uh, love the retail Canadian investors. I'm one myself. Um, but it's, you know, they get, get excited about ideas and tend to pile in, which is great. But then you get to a point, and I think we've seen that in the psychedelics now, that as you know, folks like the, the other members of this panel will tell you all day long because they're living it, is this is really about drug development. It's really about making true pharmaceuticals. It's not a cannabis CPG play. And so this investor base, I think right now we're going through a transition. We're moving into sophisticated life science investors based mainly in the United States, a lot of them in California, some out on the East Coast. And those investors are looking for different things. They're looking for a different story, different intellectual property, a different what's this company doing? Uh, so I think that's a transition that we're going through right now. That's why you're seeing so much excitement over entities that are trying to get, say, listed on the NASDAQ as opposed to stay on the CSE, right? Everybody would like to make that transition because we want to get in front of those sophisticated life science investors. To Sylvia's point, we're going to need billions and billions of dollars to get these drugs all the way through clinical trials. It's totally worth it but you need that sophisticated patient life science investor. And luckily I think that's where the, that's the transition that's taking place right now in the sector. And we're seeing it in the markets. Mm. And what do you think, and anyone that feels like they have an answer because this is a hard question. Uh, what do you think is the kind of company profile that is going to be driving interest for investors in the maybe next year if, if you feel like you have an answer and if you can't predict the future, just we can move on to a different question. Well, it's a, it's a new, it's a, the psychedelics really are a new biotech class, aren't they? And so I think that you, what, what, in, what it's, it's attracting, like Dr. Tucker said, it's starting to attract, you know, serious biotech um, investors and, and they're looking for the same things out of psychedelic companies that they'd look for, you know, in, in any other space, which is, you know, you know, diff differentiated, patent protected drugs that are you know on a on a on a pathway into a clinical stage and, and ultimately uh, you know through through regulatory acceptance. Those those are the things that they're going to be looking for. Definitely early 2020. You know, you, you like you know, to echo the previous comment. You know, you had a you, there, there was a real kind of lack of clarity, I think, around what would be important in a psychedelic in the psychedelic market. But I think, yeah, that that that's definitely shifted now, and and uh, so I think it'll be what's what's important in any biotech company. Yeah, and I would just add to what James just said one thing, which is, uh, you know, because what he, what he was just describing really, was really that competitive advantage. And I think there's also a small subset of companies 
that have a competitive advantage that doesn't really come from intellectual property. And it's those first few, you know, the companies like Compass that are out in front of everybody else, they don't really have solid IP. I'm sorry to break it to you. It's not that solid what they have, but they are way out in front of everybody else. And so they're going to have a first mover advantage into those markets. So I think there's a, there's a few like that. The ones, honestly, that like, like a tie and mind the ones that have made it to the big leagues, if you will, early on, they have that advantage. But for everybody else, they're going to really need to differentiate themselves exactly like James just said. Hmm. And as another class of biotech companies, Maybe Sylvia or Hugh, you, you, you would like to comment on what kind of M&A action do you see in the sector from, from biotech and from cannabis, which are, I think, two, two big industries that could start blending in with psychedelics companies? Yeah, I, I think like if you look at, you can just sort of see the future um, I think it was a good way to describe this as this is the next biotech play, right? So, so we actually dabbled in creating a a micro, you know, junior biotech product too. And we thought that the reason for that um, to be interesting is because a lot of the large biotech companies that spend all of their money on marketing, you know, like the Pfizer's and the J and J's and stuff, they spend all their money on marketing and and that kind of thing. And I think that you know, sometimes to get research and new products out the door, they just have to buy someone. So I wouldn't be surprised if the same thing happens here. You know, you have Johnson and Johnson, for example, um, starting up psychedelic, I think they do a little bit, but I think they're going to invest more heavily in psychedelic studies. Like you have to wonder at some point, like, do they just try to target and buy a company that's a little bit further along, especially if it's true that, you know, what MAPS is saying that by, by the end of 2021, you get FDA approval to start administering this in clinical settings, you know, there's going to be a race. And I think the companies that are sort of in the forefront or have, you know, the good results will, will benefit from that. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see m and in the space. Yeah, I think that's mm. true. And I would add, I think you mentioned cannabis versus pharmaceuticals. I think there's a big difference between a GW Pharma and a Canopy, for example. So I think, you know, to echo the statements, you know, this is a pharmaceutical drug development business. So I think, you know, I think we will see M&A. Mm, and what, what other what other sort of uh, benefits or perks could a, a cannabis company have into coming to psychedelics? I imagine that a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles are already passed and you already have like a compliance team and another. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're already seeing, I've seen in actually a number of companies in Canada, for example, branded and let's say preparing for some sort of a recreational psychedelic industry. That's a pretty big bet. I'm not sure that's going to happen. And it started in this sort of um, functional mushroom space and they've got heavily brand branded products and they've basically taken the cannabis model and applied it to psychedelics. Um, I, that's not a bet we're taking. Um, we're purely science based, you know, first generation that's API production and drug formulation, second generation uh, chemical engineering uh, and clinical validation. I think that's the way to participate in this market. Yeah. Yes, there are definitely companies that are moving into the into the recreational space. Um, what kind of market do do the others, their panelists, see there? Do you, do you see possible revenues coming from there, or is it just too difficult uh, to have something moving there? I'm staying away from that space. <laughs> I think that's a I think that's a tough tough road to hoe. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a long ways away. You know, even if it happens, like you have to think that this has to go through the phase three trial and then it has to get approved for medical setting. And then you're going to have specific patients that are qualified and permitted to use it. And then maybe you have the centers opening up and then maybe, maybe insurance companies start to think about covering it. And then it becomes something that you take home. And I just think it's, I think that's decades away. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the, the sort of illegal use of it that continues, but um, in terms of actual, you know, sort of like retail sales to the general community, I, I feel like that's a ways away. Yeah, I think it, I think it's important for people to keep in mind. You know, de decriminalization is is not the same mm -hmm. thing as as legalization. I'd say like some of the decriminalization is happening faster than you know I would have thought it, it was going to a year ago, and it. I think it's it's exciting in some ways. It's not a part of our business at all, 
Um, and, uh, you know, and, and even if it were be, even if, were to, if it were to be decriminalized, you know, across all of the USA, it still doesn't mean you can run a business, uh, you know, selling drugs into it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. There are some jurisdictions that are opening up. Um, so some companies definitely are seeing opportunity there. Uh, maybe Red Light Holland is one of them. Uh, they are trying to move maybe into the Oregon market, but it's definitely a very different business model to what uh, the companies presenting here are, are aiming at. Yeah. Agreed. And here's Elliot to, to tell us that we don't have... We, I know, I'm the evil yeah. overlord. Uh, I have actually <laughs> been called that before at these events. Um, but y'all, wonderful panel, wonderful discussion around psychedelics. My screen is freezing, so I have zero idea if you can see me or not. But regardless, <laughs> it has been a pleasure to listen in on this. And the future of psychedelics, I think, is very, very optimistic. So I appreciate you all having this discussion. We'll talk it to is. you all very soon. Yeah. Thanks hey, for you're powerful, but you're you. very kind, Billy. So thank you, thank you for, for the time and yeah. Of course. See you guys soon. All right. My computer's freezing. So oh, optimal time. All right, Aaron, if you can hear me, let's go ahead and bring Ian and Gideon up uh, from Bright Minds Biosciences. Um, this yeah, there we go. I'm gonna get off the screen because I don't know what the heck's happened with my computer. Uh, I'm going to let you gentlemen take it away. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. It was very interesting listening to that last panel on the future of psychedelics, and that couldn't have been a better segue into what we're doing. I'm Ian McDonald. I'm CEO and co-founder of Bright Minds. Um, so my background really quickly was in investment banking uh, and venture capital. So start off my career forming companies, helping them grow, um, and making sure they had the capital and team uh, in place to take them to the next level and uh, and help them grow and blossom into what they could be. From that, from there on, I went into again uh, uh, what the uh, last uh, panel was discussing, which was um, uh, mergers and acquisitions and investment banking. Uh, so that is something that I bring to the table uh, around call it 2014, 2015. I started getting interested in the serotonergic field. Um, and really, uh, really taking a holistic view of the space and and um, taking a look at the mental health care drugs that have been in place, uh, the, the true lack of innovation. If you look at um, the standard of care today, that would be SSRIs. Those SSRIs, like Prozac, for example, are 30-year-old drugs. Um, they work for some of the people, some of the time, to a degree. Uh, they work generally quite well uh, for people with, um, I would say, less severe cases of depression. But uh, there's been a real lack of innovation in, uh, in neuropsychiatry in the at least last 30 years. So uh, why has that been? I, I think the main issue is there's been a lack of uh, new ideas. There's been um, nothing groundbreaking. And what this uh, with this uh, serotonergic field and psychedelics more specifically do um, is, is truly revolutionary. The efficacy is certainly there. Uh, I don't think anyone can doubt that if you're taking a look at the recent MAPS data or, or uh, many of the other studies that have come out. Um, one thing is undeniable that these drugs do work. The issue is with these first generation psychedelics, and when I say first generation psychedelics, I'm talking about compounds like uh, psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, while, they, while they're effective, they lack a lot of the um, drug-like characteristics necessary for them to be truly embraced, not only by, um, uh, by doctors and physicians, but also by Big Pharma and the traditional healthcare establishment. And what Bright Minds really set out to do um, was instead of working with those older compounds, um, we are developing the next generation. So we're tuning out those rough edges. We are making those um, uh, first generation molecules something into uh, something into a, a more final form or a, uh, a form that can be used uh, by a wide array of patients for a number of different neuropsychiatric and neurology indications. 
Um, I will turn it over to, uh, I, I think, one of the smartest guys in drug development um, in, uh, in psychedelics and serotonergic drugs, uh, certainly that I've, I've come across, and that's my co-founder, Gideon Shapiro. Um, and he can go into a bit of his background and uh, uh, run through some of the science and uh, what we're up to at Bright Minds. Thanks, Ian. So I'm Gideon Shapiro, like Ian said, um, VP of Drug Discovery, Bright Minds, and I basically started my career at Sandoz Pharmaceuticals in Switzerland, where Albert Hoffman, I had the pleasure of seeing him speak at the company and, and discovered LSD uh, at the, and moved my career essentially initially uh, at Sandoz in, in Switzerland, Basel. Uh, so uh, essentially been leading drug discovery efforts, uh, starting my career there, but have since transitioned for the last 10 years, most relevantly into uh, Rugen and uh, a fidelity company that was involved in, in neuroscience and neuropsychiatry, as Ian said, trying to address this, this really need for new mechanism, new breakthrough and a new fresh look at neuropsychiatry um, beyond dopamine, which has been the last 50 years. And, and in there, we really have gained the insights uh, in working on next generation stiketamine, which is essentially uh, the first and only at this point approved, if you will, psychedelic drug. So this, this drug has created a paradigm shift that really is the perfect launching point for what we're doing at Bright Minds uh, in uh, in serotonin. So with, with, N with ketamine, that's an NMDA mechanism psychedelic versus the new generation, which really has even more promise. Uh, and we're trying to use those insights now from the past 10 years and, and the research with ketamine is very analogous uh, to the breakthroughs that have to be made in 5-HG psychedelics. And those are the following. Uh, so if you get to the, to, to the next slides, to slide four, um, what you will, you can see that the first generation, as Ian said, it's super exciting. They are effective. That's no issue. Uh, the problem is always with first generation drugs, there are some significant limitations um, in terms of efficacy. They are efficacious, but to reach broad patient populations, there are safety concerns. So the first generation psilocybin, all of them, LSD, they have significant cardiovascular toxicity, um, number one. And so what that means is uh, you can take currently two doses, but for long-term treatment to reach large uh, pop patient populations, you're going to need a safer generation of drugs. This involves basically the drug design engineering experience uh, that we have at Bright Minds and have done before for numerous other projects uh, for other targets. That's number one uh, and probably the biggest thing. The next is that for patient compliance, the trip time or the duration of this delic effect, you're going to want to get to be more uh, patient friendly and also for treatment center friendly. So the uh, LSD is, is almost very difficult. That would be a 12 hour duration and psilocybin itself has on the order of six hours. So uh, the other key goal for patients is to get the trip time down uh, to a sure manageable experience where then they can go in and be released uh, by the therapist in a reasonable short time, potentially two hours, for example, would be an optimal target. And third of all, really to reach large patient populations for this to become mainstream is what we all want. We want psychedelics uh, to move to essentially mainstream regulatory uh, and broad patient access on top of that. And to do that, you also need uh, intellectual property defense uh, that will enable big pharma to have the profit incentive to invest behind these drugs, the billions of dollars that are needed uh, to really deploy them widely. Uh, in, uh, for example, in the major depression market, we're talking about you know, millions and millions of patients um, and so that, that, that potential will have to be realized by expensive trials as well. So that's what we bring uh, to the table. We've assembled a team of, of experts to do that. Uh, we have intellectual property in, in the company already. So we're very well positioned to actually uh, have the alignment of these factors. So it's really a great situation where both the patient, the patients and the economics are aligned uh, and, and the profitability aspect of this. So, those are really key to really make medicine broadly accessible. Uh, and that's what we have at, at Bright Minds. So that involves uh, essentially making and drug engineering to do that. How do we do that? 
We have to take the currently existing molecules or lead compounds uh, and engineer them. Uh, that's basically a molecular process now. Now we know how to do that. We understand which, which the targets are, the quote, quote molecular targets of psychedelics. Uh, quite simply, there are essentially three flavors of receptors uh, that the psychedelics act at. They're called 5-HT2 receptors, and there is a 2A, 2B, and 2C. Uh, and the, essentially what we have to do is tune out the cardiotoxicity, which is mediated by a 5-HT2B receptor, and maintain this 5-HT2A receptor. So that's what we do as drug designers. We engineer, tweak the molecules, uh, we create compositions of matter that are then better second generation drugs. So yeah. in addition to that, there's a way to basically tweak the duration of action. You need the kinds of scientists and team who can do that, who are pharmacokineticists who do that. Uh, and then you need to create the IP. So uh, we've ticked all the boxes uh, here uh, in this program. Uh, and uh, on the, the next slide, basically, you see sort of a schematic uh, of, of how these things are targeted. So essentially, what you have are these, these three buckets, uh, the psychedelics you want to hit and, and really engineer and target towards the brain with this 5-HT2A. The molecules have to be tuned out uh, to eliminate this effect on the cardio, cardio heart valves for that toxicity. Uh, and then there's another receptor. Uh, that's also sort of an offshoot of psychedelics called the 5-HT2C uh, that's well established for other neuropsychiatry uh, indications of impulsivity. So what we at Bright Minds have is a pipeline uh, then of compounds uh, that uh, basically <clears throat> attack the 5-HT2A receptor for psychedelics and the 5-HT2C gives us another pipeline. So in addition to being, you know, a, a next generation of drugs, we actually are able to have a pipeline uh, to address different conditions and target them. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry, could we go back to slide five, I believe? It should be a... Probably slide three. The, yeah. Oh, slide three, slide three, yeah. Um, so, a lot has changed between the 1960s and now in terms of technology. In the 1960s, very, very little was known about the brain relative to today. Um, there are 14 different serotonin, 14 different uh, serotonin receptors in the brain. That was only elucidated in the 1990s. We've had a number of other technological breakthroughs, um, including X-ray crystallography, so you're actually able to see what the structure looks like, uh, what that receptor structure looks like, and then be able to design around it. Molecular modeling, which is a fancy way for saying um, having a computer uh, uh, mimic that, uh, mi mimic that uh, compound fitting in the receptor site and fine tuning that. And then finally, fMRI, which is just brain imaging. Um, now, why has no one done this yet? The answer is because it's very, very difficult. Um, the 5-HT2A, the 5-HT2B, and the 5-HT2C are almost identical. And, and to, to design a drug that hits one and not the other is, uh, is many people in this field thought it was impossible for a long period of time. Um, we looked at that as a challenge starting, uh, starting uh, years and years ago, probably around 2010, uh, our third co-founder, Alan Kozakowski, um, spent millions of dollars and uh, years of research working with uh, another very famous uh, uh, neuropsychopharmacologist named Brian Roth at University of North Carolina to do just this. Uh, Alan isn't here today, but he's uh, he's certainly much smarter than I am. He has uh, 500 publications over his belt, studied under a Nobel Prize winner at uh, at, at Harvard. He's uh, he's uh, uh, a wealth of experience. He's he's been uh, involved in uh, designing brain drugs for the past. 40 years, um, and uh, he's really foundational to what we've done at Bright Minds. Uh, he's certainly not the only the only one, but he's a he's a very uh, large piece of it. Gideon, could you um, walk through the rest of our team and why they're important to this? Sure. To this goal? Sure. So our, our chief medical officer, Vati Srinivas, is has deep experience in developing. That's really key to how you design your clinical trials. Uh, so that piece is really essential. 
um, uh, at the, at the, as we move through the pipeline. Uh, fundamental aspect of the drug discovery, in addition to you know the drug design, the chemistry part, which you know we have a very strong team uh, there. Obviously, we just talked about really what the is also beyond the design that then confirm works and to have the molecular pharmacology. So we're really blessed to have John McCorvey really is in the pedigree of psychedelic uh, pharmacology coming from uh, Nick Nichols's lab and, and also uh, Brian Roth at UNC. So these are recognized leaders. And you have to be able, as, as Ian said, to tease out the selectivity for the different molecular sub. And that's what John is, the leader in the field. So when we design and make these compounds, we need to be able to determine that selectivity uh, and that it's perfectly targeted given uh, receptor subtype. Uh, so that's, that's really just a fantastic team. Beyond that, we have in vivo, the leading in, in, vivo, in vivo pharmacologists in, in the world, I would say, for psychedelic activity to show these things work in animals and then to transition to humans. So we're really well positioned that the drugs we do find and design do what they need to do. Uh, so that we go into the clinic uh, that we're actually pretty, pretty confident of success. Uh, so you really need a team of, of vendors and experts in this field that's very specialized and we've assembled, I think, uh, one of the best teams out. Can we go to slide six, please? And uh, just to walk you through our pipeline here, I'll, I'll, I'll let Gideon do it, um, but so uh, to start, uh, we're blessed with intellectual property from the get-go. We have patent protection. Uh, previous work that was in license, Alan had done at, at U University of Chicago, and that's this 5-HT2C subtype, which is now uh, undergoing a real uh, revolution to treat infant epilepsy disorders. That's now recognized with the approval of, of fenfluramine in this area, which also needs improvement. Uh, so we're going to Dreves. That's scheduled to enter the, the clinic uh, early next year in the Q1, Q2 of 2022. Uh, and then for the right behind that, we have our psychedelic lead program, essentially for major depression is the, the key, really, crown jewel market uh, of psychedelic development is well recognized as depression. So uh, those those clinical paradigms are established with, with psilocybin. So we're really in a great position, essentially, on the heels of psilocybin uh, to come up with the next generation drug um, that will be efficacious and have advantages in terms of safety. Uh, uh, can we, we, we that's uh, basically our position to uh, enter our pipeline into development. We're very excited. Yeah, and those, those, uh, those two drugs will be in clinical trials early next year and mid next year, we're gonna be doing a phase one uh, start off with a phase one study, and then we will be doing a uh, small proof of concept phase two study immediately after that. So look forward to us having um, uh, phase one and, and some phase two clinical trials um, next year. Uh, moving to slide seven, I'm going to blaze through the rest of this since we're running out of time. Uh, these markets are very large. If you look at uh, major oppressive disorder, we believe that with non-patent drug, you're looking at roughly a $600 billion market. All of the markets we're going after are billion dollar markets. Next slide, please. Um, a, major, uh, a major point here that I wanna emphasize is in order to really make money in, in pharmaceuticals, you need to have an on-patent drug. An on-patent drug, the, the price for an on-patent drug um, in an indication like depression is anywhere from call it 15,000 on the low end to 35,000 on the high end. For a generic drug, that's about $400 per patient per year. So call it a, uh, call it a 40X, 40X for on patent versus generic. I mean, <laughs> if you're Compass or MindMed, you're selling your drug for uh, a dollar after your uh, exclusivity period is expired. Whereas us with an on patent drug, you're looking at uh, $40 for uh, for that same for 40 X, uh, 40 X for that same indication for that same medication. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think what really separates us from our competitors, uh, apart from our science is, uh, the, the, uh, the value in our, in our, in our, uh, in our stock at the moment. Um, we are under the radar. We don't spend a lot of time going out waving our arms. We're, 
really focused on science uh, and have a team to uh, a team to certainly back that up uh, and compounds to certainly back that up. So um, I would look at that valuation gap closing materially quite quickly. Um, not only have uh, have myself and the other members of management invested significantly in this company, uh, so have the top some of the top investors in the um, biotech arena. Um, I think we'll go to questions. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely we definitely have time for one here. Uh, what do you think will end up happening long term in the space regarding big pharma? We got about a minute left. Gideon. I, I should yeah. I should just say Gideon Gideon speaks from a place of authority. He spent his last seven years creating the science uh, for a company, developing a second generation version of ketamine. Who did two big pharma deals? Sorry, go ahead, Gideon. Yeah, I I, I think what we're seeing uh, we're quite surprised. But big pharma is very interested early. I think you've seen that in some of the earlier presentations. Uh, there's a lot of excitement even for preclinical stage. Uh, and clearly, big pharma is now wrecked the, the space. So we see partnering heating up. And again, the companies that have IP are, are the ones that big pharma is searching for. So uh, among the companies, I think we're we're at the top tier of companies that have IP that's issued already. I think we're the only one actually that has an issued patent that's already enforceable uh, in the space. So uh, we're, we're sort of at the top from the end uh, for sure. We're in the clinic. We'll, we'll be in the clinic, and then we have IP behind it. So really, the key is intellectual property. That sets us apart, and that's what big pharma is looking at, looking for, and and we're we've, we're seeing a lot of interest. Fantastic, yes. Ian Gideon. We are at time, but super interesting presentation. You guys are obviously on the precipice of something special here, at Bright Minds. Uh, so, is there a website we can reach you at? Yes, brightmindsbio.com. And I just want to correct one thing: we're not traded in France. I'm looking at the ticker here. Our we're traded in this in the states under BMBIF, and in Canada under the ticker Drug D R U G. Fantastic. Apologies about that. Um, I will say the OTC ticker should be correct. Correct, right, Ian? Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So the OTT tick, the OTC ticker is is right there. Gideon, Ian. Again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, awesome presentation. I look forward to touching base with you all down the road and seeing what milestones we've hit. But we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, y'all. Very interesting segment there, uh, about an hour on psychedelics. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of psychedelics content today uh, in this track specifically. So uh, I hope you've learned a lot and enjoyed it and, uh, you know, got some investment ideas out of it because I've seen a lot of cool stories happen. We are taking a shift back to cannabis uh, through, I think, one of the more interesting pathways uh, uh, of, of companies here. So I'm going to bring on an industry pro over here, Mark. Lockmacher, how are you, sir? I'm good, Elliot. How are you, man? I'm fantastic. There's like a giant bug flying around me somehow. Anyway, I'm going to hop off the stream. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to add John Paul, and I will talk to you all soon. Awesome. Thank you very much, Elliot. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'll be firing up my presentation in a minute. Uh, so my name is Mark Lockmacher. I'm dealing with investor relations and some other things over at Australis. With me is John Paul, our CFO. Uh, industry stalwart with a very impressive track record in driving hyper growth for a lot of companies in a variety of sectors, including the cannabis industry. But I'll be introducing the team in more depth in a little bit. Um, John will be joining us again for the Q&A. And right now I'll start sharing my screen and we'll get going because we don't have a huge amount of time. And there's lots to say. So let me get this going. Excellent. So, um, start with the title, and it says the new Australis Capital. Uh, just a little bit on our history. Australis originally was a spin-off out of uh, Aurora Cannabis in 2018. Uh, one of the reasons behind it was kind of a toehold into the U.S. market, but also uh, in relation to financing that was going on, ESX listing, uh, uh nyse listing at the time that we we're working on not allowed to have any u.s assets and australia uh, or had a few minor u.s assets that were spun off into australis or also as we call it now um over the last few years the company made a number of investments and kind of drifted away a little bit from the cannabis space made some uh 
investments in, well, one of them was in Body and Mind, obviously uh, a well-known high quality cannabis company, uh, but also in a number of fintech companies. And that culminated in the company looking to move away entirely from the cannabis industry. Shareholders did not agree with that. We had a well-documented proxy battle at the end of last year. And that's really where the term the new Australis comes in. Um, an entire new board and management were put into place in November, late November. Uh, and since we've been executing at a very high pace. Um, so what is the new Australis? Uh, we're just beginning. Uh, we had a new organization late 2020, really started uh, gathering steam in January of this year, so not very long ago. Um, and although we're kind of a new company, we're not new people. We've got a, a team of very experienced cannabis industry operator, very successful entrepreneurs. And, and looking at the cannabis industry, we felt that we had to be different. And not being different to be contrarian, uh, we felt that there were a lot of very similar strategies um, where the sort of successful strategies were just too easy to copy. And we saw the same in Canada. And uh, there's a, a, a large number of companies coming into, into the space. And, and, and really people were looking at what works in terms of execution, but also very much what works on the capital markets. So what we saw was you know, what I would call a, a unity sausage. Uh, that became very difficult to differentiate one company from the next. Um, we looked long and hard at the industry and not so much with an earmark or just being different for different sake, uh, because that brings with it high risk. Uh, it's, it's good to be contrarian sometimes, but the risk rewards and uh, the rewards can be high, but the risks are high as well. And what I will argue is that with Australis, we've got something that's very different, very different shaded company with a strategy that is very difficult to emulate. Um, but at the same time, a strategy that is very de-risked. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so who are we? Uh, we're an MSO, uh, an early stage MSO. We're active in Nevada. We're operationalizing assets in Missouri and Oklahoma. Uh, we're looking to enter into uh, a large number of other states uh, on the West Coast. Obviously, we're very interested in California. Uh, on the East Coast, we're looking at a number of states to move into. And the way we're looking to do this is not by investing in or investing heavily in vertically integrated infrastructure. And that's really where the difference come in, comes in. Um, what we're doing is through our ownership of Alps, and I'll go into that a little bit more deeply in a little bit. Uh, and, and that's really where the differentiation comes in. Alps is a design consultancy, construction management, uh, operational uh, cultivation export company. And through them, we're going to be able to get our hands on low-cost biomass. Um, at the same time, you know, obviously, you know, low-cost, high-quality biomass, great. What are you going to do with it? Well, it's going to fuel the expansion of our brands across the nation. And that's where our ownership of Green Therapeutics, or GT, comes in. Uh, GT, very highly regarded company with a number of very successful brands in Nevada. We're in 52% of dispensaries. Um, all the products that we produce is sold out. Uh, we've got high-end designer brand like Tsunami. We also got a, a high quality, but more mass market uh, value proposition through provisions and we'll be launching other, other brands as well. We also own the iconic West Coast Mr. Natural brand, uh, which is a sort of a brand that finds its origins in the medical space. The guy who founded that, Bob Mr. Natural Luciano, is uh, an ordained Rastafarian priest, a Vietnam vet, uh, one of, I believe, only six people in the world who uh, is, is supplied with cannabis through the, the US federal government. Um, that's a very interesting brand. We own that. We have uh, our mothers on tissue culture, and we're looking forward to rolling out that brand. Um, Game-changing partnerships. Huh? I mentioned the ownership of Alps. Uh, Alps uh, got Apis. I'll explain that later. 
We've got a partnership with a very exciting tissue culture company, one of very few companies that can actually do tissue culture and cannabis at scale. And on top of that, we've got a very strong focus on science, uh, but also, you know, culturally, we're a different kind of company. Yeah? We're, I think, the first one to officially launch a, a, an advisory board headed by Melissa Ralston, focused on social equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, anyway, that's sort of the, the company in general. I'll go now into a little bit more detail. I talked about differentiation and obviously what investors look at, you know, what does your team look like? Who are the people who are actually driving this company? Um, I believe we've got an exceptional management team and it starts with Terry Booth, our chief executive officer who became chief executive officer on March 9th. Um, Terry, probably well known to a lot of you as the founder of Aurora Cannabis, a company that he built up with his own money and uh, a few partners at first as a late to the game upstart that still passed any other cannabis company in the space to become at its height an $18 billion company. Um, Terry built that up, he had great vision. Uh, Aurora really at that time owned the conversation in the industry. But as I mentioned earlier, yeah, Aurora owned, or we owned the conversation, but people started copying that conversation. And that's something that's not gonna happen now, I think. And we've got Jason Dyke, uh, he's a chief science officer. He's also a director of the company. He's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at University of Alberta. And some of you may have seen that he actually co-led and co-authored uh, an article recently uh, showing a very positive correlation between uh, people switching to cannabis and opioid sparing. In particular, people who were, you know, dependent on a high dosage uh, opioid for their pain management regime. Uh, they've shown based on actual data on, on many, many thousands of, of actual patients between 2013 and 2018, um, that cannabis is effective in reducing opioid dependency. Very important research. Anyway, Jason is an integral part of our company. Uh, he's helping out on a number of fronts, including product development, but you, you know, a lot of our science driven initiatives. Then we've got Dr. Uh, Duke Fu, who is the CEO of Green Therapeutics. He's the CEO of Australis, uh, former president of Madman back in 2014, 2015. Uh, very science driven approach, but you know what Duke's also done, he's listened very carefully to the market. So he and his team, you know, very science-driven approach. They have developed, yeah, the Tsunami and the Provisions and the GT Flowers brands. Uh, but those brands are very accurately targeted at their consumer demographics. And what we see is products that sell at a premium um, and products that sell out completely, you know, within a very short time after, uh, after hitting the shelves. Um, then we've got John Paul, who I just introduced, our CFO, uh, very strong CFO, uh, big background in driving hyper-growth companies in a variety of sectors. Uh, prior to joining us, he was the CFO of Plus Products, a uh, company where he made a big change and really turned that around into a very interesting uh, uh, producer of edibles in the cannabis space in the U.S., and then uh, lastly, Leah Bailey, who joined us on May 17 as our Chief Business Development Officer. Uh, she was previously the CEO of Flourish, uh, again, a company where she, you know, led the company to growth, one of the leading companies in the Illinois market, uh, EBITDA positive, you know, substantial revenues. Again, you know, this team, what I want to say about this team more than anything else, it puts us in a really good position. All these people understand the industry really well. They understand what we're trying to do. They have got a very clear focus on where we want to be and where we need to be. Um, but also they got standing within the industry. So even though we're a fairly young company, uh, we are sitting around the table with very, very interesting connections. and. Although it's a bit of an intangible, I think it's very important. Uh, this management team gives us access to interesting deals that otherwise would not be available to companies of our skill. 
and I'm saying our skill at this point, but you know, we believe we've got a lot of uh, accelerated growth ahead of us. Um, so what's our vision? Our vision is to become a global player in the cannabis space. Uh, for now, uh, we're, we're very strongly focused on the US, uh, but we'll also be looking at Europe, which has been developing probably more slowly than people had anticipated a few years ago. Um, but we believe that Europe is, is about to reach an inflection point with more countries uh, legalizing cannabis. Uh, I think Luxembourg is now the first country that's going to be legalizing recreational cannabis. The Netherlands has got a uh, pilot project going on whereby the coffee shops in, in, in 10 cities will be supplied with legally grown cannabis, which previously wasn't possible. Uh, so we're going to see an inflection there. Uh, we anticipate very rapid growth. Uh, the US is 300 and you know, 30, probably maybe up to 350 million people. Europe, you know, depends on how you count, between five and 700 million people, very massive markets. Um, as a company, we're going through transition from being a an investment company, which we, we what we were previously to an actual operator and MSO, I talked about that. Uh, we're optimizing our competitive competitiveness, uh, positioning ourselves for when cannabis becomes legal in the US at a federal le uh, level, uh, when we'll be able to start shipping uh, cannabis across state borders. Um, and we're really focused on having competitive advantages that are sustainable. Uh, and again, I'll keep coming back to this. Difficult to emulate, difficult to copy, but sustainable competitive advantages in an industry that is and will become, you know, increasingly more competitive. And how do you ensure you're competitive? Obviously, you need to have your distribution sorted, you need to have your market access, but at the bottom of it, you need to be a low cost producer of high quality goods. And that's where our unique strategy comes in. As I said, you know, led by pioneer Terry Booth with a very accomplished management team with the right connections. Um, our strategy is focused on securing that access to low cost, high quality biomass. And I'll explain a bit more. And like I said, we own Alps. Uh, we're a majority owner now with an option to acquire the remaining 49%. Um, Alps is like the big brand in facility design and construction and management. Um, in exchange for helping companies with their either existing facilities that may need to be upgraded or building new facilities, uh, we'll be giving them our IP. Obviously, we're being paid a fee for this. Uh, but at the same time, we offer them the opportunity to enter into a partnership with us. And under that partnership, we would grow or we, they would dedicate a certain percentage of the canopy space to growing our cultivars. And we've got some very interesting cultivars. Uh, Duke and his team uh, recently announced they've got a few cultivars that, that score in the 30 to 35% uh, THC with very high terpene concentration, very, very beautiful products. Um, but anyway, so these people will be growing our biomass and then selling it back to us at cost plus. And here's where we really differentiate from other companies. Because if you're looking at cost plus A, we do not have to sink heavy capex into building cultivation infrastructure. So we don't carry the cost of equity there. And secondly, under a cost plus regime, we know that our price is stable, but also cost plus is gonna be much cheaper for us than buying product wholesale. Because we're not the only ones with a model where a company is buying biomass in the market and using that to produce their own goods. But what we're seeing in the market that, especially when you're looking at higher quality products, that it's difficult to get that biomass and that the price fluctuations are enormous. So where one month we get just about to be profitable, the next month if prices go through the roof because for some reason there is not enough high quality biomass in the system, uh, your profitability goes out the window. And that's what I meant by the de-risking that I said earlier. We're going to have secure access to stably priced low cost biomass. Now, because this biomass will be grown in facilities that Alps has got a hand in, and Alps is really, you know, the benchmark in 
facility design and operation, it means that we know that the cannabis is going to be very, very good. So that's at the core. That sort of sets the, the, the access to biomass. It enables us to move into new states. It enables us to have a, a large footprint uh, at a very low capital outlay and uh, at a very, you know, sustainable cost advantage over other companies in the space. Now, that product needs to go somewhere that goes into brands. And like I said, uh, through GT and Mr. Natural, we've got a number of brands that resonate really well with the target groups. And we'll be looking to introduce those brands, uh, you know, at a larger scale in the states that we already operate in and looking to move into a number of other states. Hey, Mark, I apologize for interrupting, but we've got about one minute left here. Uh, if there's anything you would like to say to wrap up. Yeah, I'm going to go through very quickly. So um, I just want to say a couple more things about Alps. Uh, over 100 million square feet in projects, talking all over the world, both in cannabis and non-cannabis. The non-cannabis side will be uh, feeding us with cash flow to support uh, the expansion of our cannabis operations. Uh, these are the people this presentation will be downloadable um alps currently working on projects with total capex this is money spent by our clients of about a billion four billion in pipeline of potential new products uh, projects so you know quite substantial growth ahead green therapeutics um just a nice thing about our uh about gt is that we already put our model in motion at the smaller scale. GT is taken over operation of a partner's cultivation facility. Um, we operate that for them. It doesn't cost us anything. We sell the products under the GT brand and we get a, uh, we get a royalty in return. We're also building on distribution channels. We just announced a partnership with Thrive. Others are under discussion. Other operational uh, agreements are underway with GT as well. I mentioned our brands. We're moving into Oklahoma and Missouri. Uh, we're very focused on the Eastern US uh, markets. We're looking at them through an ROI lens. Hey, you know, where do we get the highest return on investment uh, depending on the cost of entering markets, uh, competitive dynamics. We're putting together a market entry team, uh, well connected people that get us into places. Uh, California, other markets. What you can expect from us, rapid growth, uh, much more rapid revenue growth, uh, you know, short path to profitability, very interesting deals, lots of innovation. And like I said, a unique model that positions us really well in a de-risk manner to grow very rapidly, to grow large, to become a meaningful, we believe, tier one MSO uh, with a global footprint. With incredible uh, leadership, I'll add. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, I, if I could just add like a closing comment, what you're getting with Astralis is an outstanding management team, particularly with uh, Terry Booth. And what we bring is, you know, one of the connections uh, and then access to top people around the country, give us access to a deal, but then also, you know, the ability to raise capital to structure deals and also operate the deals afterwards. See, a lot of people have gotten licenses, but, you know, they're just not able to take advantage of them. And we think we can partner with people like that and really fully capitalize on the value of the licenses that have been untapped in other parts of the country. I love that. John, that's fantastic. And Mark, appreciate the deep dive, man. That was very insightful. You're very welcome. Uh, and mm -hmm. it is a unique model, everybody. You know, he's not lying when he says it's a unique model. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious to kind of catch up with you all in maybe a couple months and continue to, to mark these milestones with you. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. My brother says hi, Mark, by the way. Patrick, yeah, Patrick wanted to say hey. And I'll be speaking to him shortly. Um, just maybe last note to the audience. Uh, you know, this was a very short snapshot of the company. Uh, there's many other things that I would love to talk about, but time just wasn't there. Uh, we'll be at MJ BizCon. We'll probably be at the next Benzinga in person, which I believe is early October, around October 13th. Mm -hmm. Yep. In exactly. New York, a week later, we be in Vegas with a booth. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, our contact details are on the presentation. They're on our website. Please connect with us. We've got a beautiful story to tell. Um, that I said, it's unique. It's focused on highly profitable, rapid growth in a de-risk manner. 
uh, fueled by cash flows coming from Alps and our uh, our cannabis operations. We've got a lot of interesting things in the cooker, uh, and we look forward to continue the discussion with capital markets. Thanks for my job. Yeah, Good. thanks, Mark. Thank you, Paul, or John Paul. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so really, uh, Australis is a really wonderful company, really cool story. Please check them out, ausa-corp.com. I'm going to real quick bring Spencer up. Uh, we're just a few minutes behind. Spence? Or, up, Elliot? I don't think What's I've up, earned the right to call you Spence yet. You can call uh, me whatever you want, man. Uh, call me you. whatever you want, whatever uh, makes you happy. My heart. You just made me happy, Spencer. But I'm going to turn it to you, let you introduce Scott. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how he's going to follow that up, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm heading off. Good to, uh, good to see you as well, Elliot. All right. Uh, Scott Berman joining me now is the president and co-founder of the Panther Group. Uh, Scott, there you are. Uh, thanks for joining us today at the Cannabis Capital Conference. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Let's just start uh, high level, and then I'll get to the, the real questions. But uh, tell us about the Panther Group. Tell us what you guys do, and, sure. and we'll go from there. Sure. So we're a venture capital consulting group. Uh, we've been in around the cannabis space since 2014. Collectively, we've invested in 35 companies across 22 different sectors. Uh, we've looked at about 600 different deals. So we, we take a strategic role, and we do a lot of homework on the space. Um, we serve on the board of a lot of these companies and really try and help them grow to the next level. So we work with very early stage companies and as they get to the next level, we help them with additional funding. We help them with consulting and advising and then advertising solutions. All right. So you, you do a lot of homework on the space. Let's talk about the space if we can for a second here. Um, what are the biggest drivers economically of cannabis uh, right now, I'm thinking maybe one year, two years, three years down the line. Yeah, so with me, it's always gonna start with politics. And that's how I originally got into this space. And I think that the, the facts on the ground really will dictate the economic landscape in many places. So first you have the statewide rules. And you know, take an example of New Jersey and New York where they've recently passed the, the adult use bills. Now we have about two to three years of regulations that will be coming down, and that will greatly affect the economic landscape of those markets. Then you also have markets like Oklahoma and Michigan and Illinois, which are growing very rapidly because of the regulatory framework. So I think it starts with politics, and that's going to be the story for many years to come. And you mostly, you know, you're on the venture side, uh, and and I, I myself am just much more knowledgeable on the on the public company side. So I'm just curious for on the venture side of the market, what are the companies that are out there? Is it is it the same as the companies that are that are public that are on it uh, that trade on exchanges in the U.S. and Canada, or are there different kinds of companies out there on the venture side that that I'm not aware of? Yeah, I think there's different kinds of companies, and I think mostly because they're earlier stage okay. and they're trying to gain market share and build revenues so that they can go public. And so there's a lot of uh, people trying to get into each vertical. So there's point of sale companies and there's lab testing companies and there's vertically integrated organizations in every state. And right now there's a big push for market share. So a lot of these companies are not yet at the point where they can generate the revenues that they need to go public. And so they're in major growth and expansion mode. But like in terms of, um, like you mentioned the, the different verticals, like what, what verticals do you mean? Well, I would, so they're all over the place. So there's certainly a lot of ancillary businesses. There's software, data, advertising, lab testing, uh, construction, um, and then there's the plant touching side where you have cultivation facilities, brands, processors, dispensaries, um, and people that are actually producing goods. So you have a lot of different factors in. You also have law firms and accountants and you know business consultants and recruiters that are coming in as well. And so there's businesses that are cropping up for cannabis along all those sectors as well. I, I'm just curious of all those different verticals. Um, are, are are there some that are I don't I don't want to say more mature because obviously this whole thing, space is not very mature. But are there some that are more developed than others? Because I would imagine, you know, a legal cannabis you know agency, for example, is 
relatively more, I, I guess, has more of infrastructure than like a, you know, I, I, I don't know, than, than some greenhouse or whatever. But like, I, I, are some verticals more developed than others? I would imagine they are. Definitely. Yeah. I think cultivation has actually developed quite a bit in okay. the last few years. And there's a lot of science and there's a lot of experience. I mean, a lot of folks have been growing for many years. And so there's more and better equipment. So there's more funding. So these facilities are, are more efficient and, and they're producing better cannabis at a better price. And so I think there's been a lot of evolution in, in actually making product. There's also a lot in the terms of the form factors. So the processes that are distilling into oils and topicals and edibles and things like that. So I think the product mix has really um, accelerated a lot over the last few years. I would say that there's certain sectors that are definitely behind. One is advertising. You know, I, I don't think the advertising solutions are, there's a lot more than there used to be, but there's not a lot of companies spending real money on ad advertising yet. And we think that's going to change. We also think lab testing is underserved in many states. So frequently a state opens up and it gets really, really busy and the labs get overwhelmed. And so there needs to be more lab capacity. So that's one of the areas we think has uh, more growth ahead of it. Interesting. I would, I would imagine the, the advertising is more of a function of the um, uh, regulatory landscape. Would you agree with that or, la or lack of clarity on that front? I would say that's a big part of it. You know, yeah. most small businesses use Google and Facebook for 70% for of their advertising yeah. and they're not able to. So I think it's part of it, but it's also just, you know, the immaturity, if I, you know, if I may, of, of the, the, these sure. businesses. And they also are, the, you know, the funding around marketing. You usually it's something that that's not heavily invested in in the first few years of a startup. Um, and so we try and push companies to really step up their marketing and get ahead of their competition early. So let's talk about the, the Panther Group and, and who you guys in, invest in. What, what do you look for in a company? What, what, what characteristics does a company have to have to, to pique your interest? In, and what is your philosophy when it comes to just how you deploy capital? So I, I want to start with the team. Um, we really like to look at the management, who are the founders and who are their people that work with them every day. Uh, what have they done in their past success and what is their general like view of the future of the cannabis space? So there's a lot of really smart people. It's very exciting actually to work with these folks every day because they're super smart and been successful in other verticals. And so the, the, what we look for is can this person and this team succeed in the cannabis world um, where they've succeeded before? So that's a big part of it. The second part is really a well thought out plan and a pitch deck that makes sense <laughs> and is optimistic, but realistic. So, you know, everyone wants to make a, you know, $10 million in year two, but it's not feasible many times. So we like to look for sensible projections. We definitely dig through the numbers very carefully. And we like to see a plan of, for market share, basically. So, you know, my big question when I look at a lot of these companies is how many customers, you know, you want to reach a certain level for sales and revenue at the end of the year, how many customers do you need? How many, how are you going about getting new customers and gaining market share on competitors? So that's a big factor. Everyone thinks that they have this really awesome idea and a lot of them are, but there's a lot of other people that have that idea too. So what's going to set you apart and differentiate your plan from someone else? I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, pitch decks because when I first started uh, looking at those year, a few years ago, I thought, wow, these are really good. They're really convincing. So, like, what are some like red flags? Obviously, they weren't all good. Well, uh, what are some red flags in a pitch deck? Maybe aside from what you would call outrageous projections. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think that some of the red flags are um, too many slides that talk about the cannabis space in general, okay. and not enough that talk about your specific plant. So I think at this point, uh, most of us, us that invest in cannabis know that it's big. <laughs> we don't need convincing. So if you show me charts and graphs on, on the size of the market, um, I already know most of that. What I really want to see is how you are going to be a major player and either win your category or be in the top five in the players in that particular vertical. So it, um, I like to see um, a red flag is not looking at the competition. So I always like to see a comp slide. Who are other businesses in your vertical and what are they valued at? 
Um, and back to your earlier question, what we look for is a valuation that makes sense based on the projections and also on the market forces and the, com- and the comparisons. Yeah. So let's, let's pivot to talking about the other side of your business for a second here. You mentioned uh, in, in addition to being a, a venture capital firm, you also are a digital advertising firm. Um, you know, Facebook and Google accounting for the majority of d- digital ads and the fact that they're not in this market is, is, is probably open to an opportunity for a firm like yours. Um, why, why are you also in this business? And uh, tell us a little bit about like the, the layout of the digital advertising, the landscape yeah. and can in cannabis and if it's how it's different than like the regular digital advertising landscape. Yeah. So first of all, you know, part of it is because of my background, I've been in digital for about 15 years. And when I first got into the cannabis world, I really wanted to bring digital advertising to the space, but it was a little bit early, which was about 2014 and 15. But nowadays it's a lot more relevant and there's a lot more competition. So part of it is, you know, there's about 3,300 brands in California alone, and they're now slotting fees for retailers. And there's a lot of, you know, there's dozens of vape companies and edibles, et cetera. So in order to really gain customers and drive online sales, you need to get more sophisticated with digital marketing. And so our approach is based on data, always data driven approach and really understanding the customers that are currently shopping for your products, whether you're a dispensary or a brand, but also where, you know, are they buying online? Are they coming in store? And what type of cannabis are they purchasing? So really honing in, one of the big changes that we've had in the last few years is the amount of data, customer data, that's available for programmatic advertising. And this is completely outside of Google. And just for the for the yeah. uninitiated, just explain what programmatic is for people that so, don't know. Sure. Programmatic advertising is basically using data driven techniques, using audiences, cookies, device IDs, cable boxes to drive very specific ads to a specific audience. And it could be zip code targeted and audience targeted. And so what we're doing is we're bringing in third party data of people that consume vape or edibles or flour, and they live in these following zip codes that are surrounding a certain amount of dispensaries. And so we then target device IDs and websites that are in that area so that we can drive relevant traffic and save cost. So with digital, it's all about analytics and really driving down the acquisition costs. And that's what programmatic can do very effectively. But I'm wondering, because cannabis at the the end of the day, um, most cannabis products are consumer packaged goods and people need to feel them and taste them and see them. Um, I'm just wondering how that translates to digital advertising in, in an industry that most people, I think it's a fair assumption to say most people don't, aren't infor- super informed, right? right? Most consumers. It's, it's a great point, Spencer, because first of all, we definitely need more education and people. And part of the, the idea of audience targeting is serving a specific ad based on what we think that audience would like. So right. personalizing the advertising for you know the right individual. So I think that's really important that we focus on. Um, but in general, you know, it's you know, it's really a good idea, though, to broadcast and, and build brand awareness through digital, too. So getting your name out there in the market and really covering a lot of eyeballs you know we're all about audiences and they're in different places so and to your point about touching and feeling um the the stuff you know i think that things have changed you know the pandemic forced many retailers and brands to step up their game with digital and a lot more cannabis is now purchased online and picked up in store or curbside we do see it shifting back a little bit more to brick and mortar but you know, the general trend is ordering online is here to stay. And I think what, you know, what we also see is once you're a regular customer, uh, it's pretty easy to order online. You know, you, you need to go and, and in new markets, you're going to have a, a, a ramp up period. But, you know, once you get regular purchase behavior, it kind of gets easier with digital. You mentioned how the market is so segmented. What's going to happen when those lines start to blur when when we get federal legalization and and all of a sudden you know 
what the brands that are big in California maybe can also be big in on the East Coast as well. I mean, every state is sort of its own world right now, and that. Yeah. But that's probably going to change at some point, right? And then what's going to happen to the digital advertising market when that when that happens? Because it's going to be weird. It's going to be weird <laughs> and cool, man. It's going to be great. <laughs> It's going to be great because now you have brands. I mean, right now you're seeing a lot of brands trying to move to another state with a partnership. Yeah, I've seen uh, Cookies has done an excellent job of this, yeah. right? I, I see um, bill. I see billboards about my house. Yeah, so yeah. they're they're doing a great job, and you are going to see. Then obviously, all the brands are going to want to sell in the Northeast, you know, in New right. York especially, and you're also going to see a, a huge ramp up in advertising around that. So if you're a West Coast brand that's done really well in L.A. and you want to sell in New York, I mean, what would you do if you were a liquor brand? You would buy a banner ad or, or a billboard in Times Square. Right. And so I believe we're going to start to see the brand expansion across the country. It's definitely, you know, federal legalization will take more time. But I think many of the brands are going to plan ahead of that and try and grow into new markets. Uh, and we've got a couple minutes left before we wrap. I just want to ask you more if we can, we can go back to the venture side for a second here. Um, how, you know, how do you source deals? How, how do you find the right investors or how do you find the right companies? I, I should say, I mean, how, how do you make that connection? Because everyone, I think a lot of people want to be venture investors and maybe to yeah. don't, have the, don't have the access. I think it's a combination of art and science. Um, first of all, you got to do your homework and look at these deals up and down and look at them, you know, around the sector and what they mean in the broad scheme of things. Um, but I think, you know, the second part is finding the right fit of, of the right strategic investor or the right group of investors for a particular deal. So one thing at Panther Group, we really like to put SPVs together and build like, you know, four or five different folks that come onto the cap table that are really not just bringing funding in, but can strategically help that company get to that next level and an eventual exit. So really understanding, you know, the, the people involved and getting the right investors in. And also just want to add like the right type of investment. So this is something, you know, really important is what type of money are you taking in? Is it debt? Is it equity? What are the rates and the terms? Are there warrants and things like that? Right. So I think like the particulars of the deal and then how this will position the company for growth going forward is really important in the early going. And then before we go, I want to get your thoughts from your point of view, um, deal flow activity. We've seen a couple of major big deals on the public yeah. side in the past couple of months, Tilray, GW Pharma. Um, has that picked up? And from yeah. your point of view, how, what does that look like right now? Definitely picked up. It's exciting. The M&A opportunities. There's a lot of a lot of new money coming into the space, which will fund these mergers. Um, you know, we're working on a large deal with acquisition financing involved, where they're raising money to buy up other properties. And so we do see that happening. We also see, though, strategically, companies trying to move into new markets. And so doing an M&A transaction is a great way to get a footprint into a new territory. And we've seen this with the MSOs, too, that have gobbled up vertically integrated operations uh, the last couple of months. And so uh, with the new capital coming in, I also think ahead of the back to politics again, ahead of the political change that we're all hoping for, meaning 280E and the banking bill and the MORE Act, like those things will, will drastically alter the landscape for the cannabis businesses. So getting ahead of that and merging and creating these bigger entities, I believe that's part of their strategy some of these bigger deals is to get ahead of the regulations that are coming. Do you, do you sense like a collective sigh of relief? Like, okay, like deal flow is back on the upswing again. Cause there was a minute there where it was a serious contraction. I do. I, I feel a, a sigh of relief for many reasons. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're all coming out of this pandemic and we're sure. the, the cannabis business is strong and thriving. And, and uh, we're fortunate that many of our companies are still going strong and, and so we do see that that a lot of things are changing. There's a lot of tailwinds, and okay. it's really going to be an exciting uh, year. I see Elliot, which means I think we're at time. Is that what that means, Elliot? That is what that means. Mm. Right. Great, great <laughs> interview, though, Scott. Really insightful. Thanks, Spencer, thank you for leading it, man. Thanks a yeah, lot. Thanks I, a lot, Scott. I appreciate you guys at Benzinga, by the way. Yeah. You do a great job, and I enjoy uh, all these events. So thanks for having me. Of course. We'll see you in person October 13th. Yes. Can't wait, man. Yeah, so wait. We'll make Spencer come, mm -hmm. too. All right. Oh, yes. 
All right, y'all. See you later. Thanks again to right. both of you. See you guys. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Uh, fantastic interview. Really, Spencer does a wonderful job, and Scott has a ton of knowledge. So uh, I've been excited for that one all day. Uh, if you are just tuning in now, Benzinga Cannabis Capital Conference. Uh, next up, we have Marcel Gamma. Uh, the president and CEO of CBDD. Before that, I do want to announce the first winner uh, of our options newsletter lifetime subscription is Edward Deese, D-E-E-S-E. -E. Edward Deese, if that is you, please email events at Benzinga.com to claim your free lifetime subscription of the options newsletter. And all you have to do is participate in the polls. We'll do our next one right after Marcel's presentation. Uh, which, which brings me to Marcel. How are you, sir? Hey, fine. Thanks. Pleasure Good. to be here with you. Yeah, pleasure to have you. Really excited to have you with us. I know the chat is clamoring to hear from you, so I'm going to pop off the screen and let you get to it. First of all, I would like to thank you, Elliot and team, for putting this event together. And uh, once again, very much appreciate uh, for your invitation. Thank you also to the audience of investors and maybe potential future shareholders of our uh, for your time today. My name is Marcel Gamma. I'm president and CEO of CBD Denver. Uh, we are a publicly traded company trading on OTC markets under the ticket of CBDD. Next slide, please. My presentation will contain forward-looking statements. Please refer to this page on the PowerPoint. I am proud to share with you today our vision, our goals, and to speak about the strengths of our team. Next slide, please. Uh, I am also very excited to report that we have recently announced over $26 million in revenue for the trailing 12 months ended by May 2021. Uh, 21. And please keep in mind, we launched this as some kind of startup just two years ago. In addition, I would like to specifically mention much of this was achieved by our team in a very difficult time. As you all know, much of our growth occurred under COVID lockdowns and massive restrictions for the business. Next slide, please. Let me say a few words about our achievements. We feel we did this in two ways. We consider ourselves an essential business and in difficult times, we outworked our competitors. Additionally, we have been executing on an accretive acquisition strategy geared to drive CBD of Denver to become the world's largest and most profitable global CBD and cannabis company. We have been able to execute on our strategy because our approach is different than some of the big names you know out there like Canopy Grows. The talents of our acquisition team are highlighted. Our ability to differentiate between making an acquisition for the sake of growth to large revenues versus acquiring a company that increases our global footprint, has cost savings and synergies, and last but not least, seeks to bring growth to our bottom and top lines. We have to say any acquisition done by CBD of Denver will highly be wetted by our team and be designed to add our company's already strong portfolio of products and services and continuously help CBD of Denver to refine and execute on our cash flow positive centric business model. At CBD of Denver, we don't grow for sake of growth we grow for the benefit of our shareholders, which is the most important topic for us. Next slide, please. CBD of Denver's culture aims to always be an under promise and over deliver organization. And we are proud to report almost $3 million in revenue for May 2021. This is prepared to the previous months a growth for more than 20%. This puts us well ahead over our 2021 revenue guidance of $22 million. 
And I'm very proud of our sales and acquisition team for making this happen, large in part during the COVID lockdown, as already mentioned before. I would like to spend now a few more minutes with you to share our PowerPoint presentation and then open the floor for some questions from the audience. Talking a little bit about our growth strategy. We intend to continue execute our strategy of finding additional accretive, accretive acquisitions, investing in our strong sales force, and we are currently focused on high growth market in Europe. We are a Swiss-based company. We grow and produce highest quality products according to the well-known Swiss standards. And we are very proud of Switzerland's long heritage of using CBD to help people. Next slide, please. Recent deregulation in Europe and reclassification of cannabis as a non-narcotic by the UN have opened the door to high growth potential and put us ahead as an adventurous early mover in the legal CBD and cannabis markets in Europe. Next slide, please. Why invest in us? We are trading at historically low price to sales metrics under two times our trailing 12 months revenue under a $100 million valuation. Next slide, please. I know we are not canopy growth yet, but we don't have hundreds of millions in sales yet. So canopy growth trades at 20 times of the revenues. We also don't lose hundreds of millions of dollars and if we, CBD of Denver management, have our way, we always will have to strive to be a high growth, profitable company with full transparency. And we are working very hard to transition to a more senior, uh, senior US trading exchange. We also, offer, we also offer a high degree of liquidity and our shares trade in OTC markets, many millions of shares each market day sometimes north to 100 million. Next slide, please. So we hope you invest in us today and join us in our long-term vision to be part of something special. Our stated goal is to be one of the leading CBD and cannabis companies in Europe, and we strive to be a potential leader of the CBD and cannabis public companies globally one day. Next slide, please. I would like now to open the floor to the audience and I'm happy to answer some of your questions. All right, Marcel, nice and uh, nice and efficient. I appreciate that. Um, fantastic. So are you calling in from Switzerland right now? No, I'm uh, abroad. I'm uh, in Hungary for business. <laughs> Hungary. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're still ahead of us. So I appreciate you hopping on the call so late. Um, so. You know, for me, I'm curious, you know, looking at the competition level in Switzerland specifically, are you the market leader there right now? Let's say we are one of the leading companies here, uh, top three, so, so, somewhere in the top three. It's a little bit, uh, it's not so easy to compare all the figures because not all of the uh, companies here are publicly traded, let's say a public company like we. And uh, so we have not uh, the full transparency as we have to provide to our uh, shareholders and, and clients and investors. Fair enough, fair enough. So we have three questions along the same line here, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really about uh, a potential uplisting. Are you able to give any insights into that? Let's say we are, US audit? Yeah, we are currently working hard on the US audit. We know initially it was planned to have it uh, done by end of May. Uh, we are still well on the way, but uh, it took a little bit longer than uh, initially planned, not because we have some issues, but uh, it's just, let's say, uh, we, we moved so fast with business. Uh, we had so much, uh, let's say, improvements and, and, uh, and, and, and moving forward stuff. So it took us a little bit longer to, to, to bring all the data up to the auditor. But uh, we are well on the way and we are quite confident that we will really have it finished in the next uh, probably one to two weeks, hopefully. 
Fantastic. Uh, here is one as well. Oh, oh, not that one. Sorry. We got a new comment as that. Uh, on the pilot program, switch was on the pilot program. I'm personally not sure what this is referring to. Yeah, there are some pilot programs in Switzerland uh, for uh, uh, to to uh, give legal that uh, to legalize THC, and uh, this is is going on is is on the way. We are in process to get also a, one of these licenses to legally provide THC uh, to uh, dispensaries and, and pharmacies and, and uh, let's say patients here in Switzerland, and this is uh, let's say um, on it's on on, on progress. Fantastic. So, you know, M and A seems to be a pretty large part of your growth right now. Uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, um, are you able to to comment on the strategy of who you're acquiring first? Uh, you know, the next, I'll say, three companies that you're in negotiations with. I know there's some, probably some compliance you can't speak to there um, until things are, are signed on the dotted line. But I'm curious if you can talk about. Um, the strategy you're taking with this M and A, what you're looking for in these companies? Yeah, for, for let's say we have three. As, as already mentioned, we are always uh, looking on a, a creative uh, growth strategy, which means we are looking for uh, companies which are completing uh, our footprints, uh, our setup, and uh, let's say are uh, adding, making uh, some some additional benefits to to our company and to our shareholders. This could be, for example. Uh, going into some some kind of specific markets uh, geographically or also let's say business specific, uh, like we are currently uh, under negotiation with uh, three three companies. Let's say uh, with one we already have a, let's say started due diligence uh, process about uh, two weeks ago. We are quite well on the way on that, and we are let's say confident that we can make some kind of official statement on this. Uh, in, in the coming one to two weeks. Fantastic. My last question has to do with uh, the impetus behind the CBD social network. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how you see this uh, growing with you alongside your business. Does it help? Uh, does it help you? Do you grow parallel uh, to each other? I'm very curious as to uh, your expectations uh, with that part of your business. No, this is let's say the um, CBD social network is mainly really a, a, a platform to exchange be between people interested in these topics and, and and share information and share let's say news about this. Uh, it's in some cases it also helps to find new markets, maybe new new interesting contacts, but uh, it's really mainly a, an information platform, very open not uh, uh, primarily business driven, it's more really exchange and uh, yeah, let's uh, bring together people interested in these topics and share information there. Educational, if you will. Educational, more educational related, yes. I love that. That's such an interesting way to attack multiple markets that you have the chance to enter as a company. Uh, that's really cool. Marcel, um, uh, one last question from the chat here. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the new location fully up and running? No, it's not fully up and running yet. So uh, we have some some final, let's say, renovation uh, work to be done. The warehouse and production is uh, up and running. Office area mostly working very properly. Uh, we are now preparing some some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, we are building up a new call center to uh, further force uh, the, the, the European markets uh, all, uh, overall. And we are also building some kind of... Uh, customer area where we have some some kind of product showroom and uh, also some kind of reception where we can do some some kind of small client events fantastic awesome marcel would you like to leave our investors with any last thoughts any uh last maybe why they should invest or be be interested in cbdd uh, as an investment opportunity so I think when we, yeah, when we look back, what we have uh, been able to achieve uh, over the past 24 months. So uh, I would like uh, to say, uh, and I'm very, very proud of of, uh, of our team, which make this uh, made this make this possible. Uh, we are really moved forward. Even we had a very, very uh, heavy time, COVID, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, most of the countries uh, have been in a lockdown, in a in a heavy lockdown. Uh, we are almost not able to do business abroad, 
but uh, we found some so solutions. We find some ways to, let's say, continuously increase our revenue. Let's say uh, almost uh, achieving three millions in in the past months, uh, trailing uh, more than twenty six million over the past twelve months. So I think, uh, yeah, we are we have been shown that we even in 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 strong, uh, let's say in in uh, in a strong situation, we are able to achieve our goals or even or overachieve our goals. And uh, yeah, we are very, very confident that we will continue this way. And we have a very, very motivated team, a management team, and also a, a staff a team, which is, uh, let's say, driving together this this uh, this project or this this uh, let's say, yeah, baby forward. And uh, I, I love, <laughs> love to work with this with with these guys. I really I have here to really say a big big thank you to our. Uh, um, members of the management team and also to our staff which uh, at the end of the day made this possible and for Fantastic. sure also our clients which which trust to us and uh, last but not least uh, shareholders which is always important otherwise uh, we would not be able to to do this let's Absolutely. say at the end of the day it's all about money <laughs> it is it is about a profitable business and that is why we are Absolutely. here and that's where, where we are lucky that we are that let's say we don't uh, made any any let's say yeah we made made any any loss so far we are profitable fantastic month month. that that is awesome uh, especially in this industry so marcel congrats to you and your team on the success thus far uh you're trailing third you're trailing 30 day you're trailing 12 month revenue numbers are very impressive uh and it looks like they are just going to continuously grow so uh looking forward to to following your success and hopefully we'll have you join us uh in the coming months to give us some more updates uh, but thanks again Wouldn't for being here. You. Thanks again, Elio, to being with you. Always a pleasure. And uh, I like to to join you and, uh, let's say, sharing information with you and uh, the audience. Always Thank a great you pleasure. again. Thank you I appreciate that, Marcel. Uh, we'll see you again soon then, sir. Be well. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good time. Thank you. You too. All right, y'all. That was CBDD, their CEO and President Marcel Gamma. Uh, I want to say Gamma, but I feel like that's just not right. So, uh, Marcel... Uh, you heard it from the man himself. We are so far from being done, everybody. Uh, we are moving right along from CBD of Denver to MMJ Group Holdings. But before that, I want to do one question for you. Uh, the Safe Banking Act claims to what? Uh, so we have not done a question in like two hours. So we have to do this. We already announced our first newsletter giveaway. Uh, they won the options newsletter. There's still a whole newsletter subscription and you can win a lifetime access uh, subscription to Benzinga Pro, the best retail investor data platform on the planet. So what does the Safe Banking Act claim to do or aim to do? Just take uh, your cell phone out, scan the QR code, uh, and you can participate at slido.com. And that is how you win free things from Benzinga today. Great. Uh, we have two people who are interested in winning free things. So I'm going to leave that up for 10 more seconds uh, as we get our friend Michael Curtis up. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm fantastic, I'm fantastic. So uh, what do you think the Safe Banking Act does, Michael? Does it do all, all of the above? I'm an all the above guy. Do I still get the newsletter? <laughs> you know what, we'll get you signed up for that newsletter, Michael. You're awesome. Uh, you're here sharing information with our investor community. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get you signed up. Um, Perfect. So we have three people. Most people think it's all of the above. Uh, I'm gonna keep the voting open for maybe a minute longer, but Marcel, or I'm sorry, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir, uh, and let you go ahead and get started on your presentation. Perfect. Thank you. So um, I'll just do a brief introduction. MMJ is a, is a listed investment vehicle uh, listed on the ASX and the CNSX in Canada. We invest, or our history was that we invested in primarily federally legal cannabis uh, companies. My background is uh, I was originally a clinician, uh, moved into healthcare investment banking around the world from uh, a bunch of uh, top five bulge bracket firms, and then began as a, as a founder of a company called Dosecan that was bought by which is now Uxley, um, and got associated with the MMJ Group, who was the, uh, the lead investor to that. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Parallax Ventures, uh, who's the sub advisor to MMJ Group's portfolio. Today, I'd like to just talk about a couple things, uh, primarily focus on just what's happening in the industry and what we see. 
we tend to look across the global sphere. So Canada, the United States, Europe, the rest of the world. What we've really seen in Canada over the past 12 months is a real, really an industry that was built almost backwards. So because it started with the medicinal industry, which is really the highest cost portion of, uh, of the cannabis development, it really, as the regulations became less strict, we moved into farther and farther down the road in, in less costly ways to eventually being a, to growing cannabis outdoors as we're doing now. What that resulted in was a lot of the companies had cost structures that just didn't work. So a lot of those companies have worked through that over the past 12 months. They've gotten costs down. Um, they're now relatively heading towards profitability for some of them, but they remain federally legal. So good investments for us if we pick the right spots. Um, the United States has been a, a bit of an area that we've been following for a while, but uh, we had assumed that there was going to be like probably many other people, uh, the realization to accelerate. We're starting to feel now like it's not going to happen uh, probably for a little bit uh, over the next two or three years. So we're tending to trade away or not look at the MSOs just as we can't really invest in those specifically. We think they're great businesses, but it just doesn't fit our mandate. And then as you look at Europe and the rest of the world, they really seem to be following uh, the, the United States and the FDA and what the opinions and laws are eventually going to be. So we've really kind of focused on what would be considered the medicinal opportunities in those areas, whether it's Australia, um, Germany, etc. And those have been doing exceptionally well for us. Um, our mandate originally was to focus on only cannabis companies, but we've opened that up a little bit over the last six months as the mandate has broadened. So, so we do have some um, options to go outside of, uh, of the cannabis. What we are really doing is we're focusing on areas that we understand and believe that both from a mandate and, and uh, where we see the industry going, we can deal with. So. What that really has meant for the portfolio is we've really focused on established brands. So from our perspective, that's tended to be brands that are either within Canada or brands that have a strong presence and they can provide a framework as legalization takes place. And I'll talk about a couple of examples in the portfolio. We've also really focused on bottlenecks. Uh, early in the cycle, we were large investors in the extraction space around the globe. Um, we we're first investors in Dosecan, first investors in, uh, in Metafarm, because we really understood that a lot of uh, the 2.0 and 3.0 products need to go through that extraction process to come out the other end. So we'll continue to focus on their, those areas in the United States where we see them, as well as in the rest of the world. And, and it really does follow a pretty uh, consistent pattern as legalization takes place. And so we do know the spots where we want to put uh, put money to work. And then, as I said, we're, we're focused on a couple other high growth areas. So one of those being protein enhanced food. So the world is clearly changing. Diets are changing. So we're focused on finding companies that are, again, either established brands or they really focus on a bottleneck or some sort of uh, interesting IP. Healthcare, uh, my background is 25 plus years, I hate to say it, in healthcare. So we're really focusing on now the post-COVID world and the changes that are happening in the healthcare system. So focusing more on telemedicine and other areas as opposed to fo focusing on specific therapeutics. And then lastly, the green initiatives. So there's a lot of money around the world being pushed into that. I think if we can find the right areas to invest in, uh, all the way from commodities to finished products, then that will do well for our investors. Just talking a bit about some of the interesting portfolio companies, um, as myself and my partner took over the portfolio about uh, 13, 14 months ago, the largest position was a company called Harvest One. Um, it was not a great thing to take over at that time. The company had gotten themselves into a bit of a situation. They had 19 million of accounts payable. They had a large burn at 3 million a month and they really didn't have a lot of cash. They took a 12 month process in terms of a strategic review and really just focused on divesting all of those non-core assets and really aligning as a, as a focused CPG company. 
I'm happy to report now that most of those payables have been worked through. The company completed a financing about a month and a half ago, so it's well financed. But more importantly now, it has a platform with two key products, one being Dreamwater um, and one being Live Relief, that both can be used as the expansion into the US, which, which I talked about before, but they really created a network of 50,000 plus storefronts, whether it's Kroger's or Rexels or shoppers in, in the United States and Canada. And we think this is gonna be either a, a really high growth avenue for investors as this company takes off through this year, or potentially a, a pretty interesting takeover target. And, and we've seen some precedents with Afria taking over Sweetwater, for example, not so much for their cannabis distribution, but for the just massive distribution in general. Weed Me is a uh, is well post the the Redican uh, transaction. I believe is now the largest private uh, LP in Canada. Again, a, a very interesting situation that we took over, where the founders worked through some uh, some issues, uh, both in burn and uh, and ramping up sales, and they've done exceptionally well, moving into their capacity, and uh, and I think they're doing well above one to one and a half million dollars a month. So. We're again expecting that one of the, the larger LPs, whether it's in Canada or some of the Europeans, will take a look at this as both either a, a great bolt on with really established brands and ramping sales or just an entrance point into the Canadian market. Embark Health is, a, uh, is an extraction company focused on brands again. So it has some excellent products based out of uh, um, British Columbia. These products are really focused on 2.0 products as an extraction company. So it's now uh, selling in all five provinces. The sales are rapidly ramping up and we believe this is going to be just a, a great winner, whether it's taken out or it just continues to ramp sales through the year. Embark's unique in the sense that the management team has worked hard to, to take advantage of, uh, of the opportunities they have and they've given investors a, a couple interesting things. The first one is a company called J Supply Co, which is an Ontario retailer. It's now ramped up to doing almost a million a, a million a month in terms of sales and expanding rapidly. This franchise is going to have, uh, I believe, over 23 stores in Ontario by the end of the year. So investors are kind of getting that for free as they're getting Protein Quest, which is a protein enhanced company focusing on the extraction capabilities of Embark, but in hemp seed. And so generally what you see with uh, with hemp foods in general is uh, the difficulty to pull out the chlorophyll of the hemp really provides you with a green like protein and a green uh, oil that's really only good for putting on to salads and other things. These folks have managed to figure out a way to create both a golden oil, which is good for cooking, as well as a white protein isolate. This company is just getting taken off right now and working with uh, strategics in terms of their next step forward. And lastly, I'll talk a little bit about Bespoke, Bespoke Capital. Bespoke is one of our first investments outside of the cannabis space. Uh, we were early, early investors in the, uh, in the seed round of this company with a, a large stock position as well as a, a relatively large warrant position. I believe their last vote for the SPAC is today, uh, June 4th, and it will start trading next week. This is a group um, focused on vintage wine. Uh, probably all of the people here uh, on the call have at some point in time actually partaked in their products. For us, it was really a, a decision based on the management team, which was led by a gentleman named Paul Walsh. He took Diablo from a $7 billion company to a $70 billion company. This company is based on how the SPAC unrolls. It's going to have about $330 million. And it also just completed a private placement with uh, Wasatch for an extra $100 million. So we believe that this is going to just be a huge component going forward. And, and we think that the, the management team has a ton of acquisitions that are going to be very creative as we go forward. So that's about uh, a general overview about uh, about the portfolio and I'm happy, Elliot, if you'd like to, to take some questions and we can walk through specific items. Absolutely, man. Uh, super interesting. Your first uh, your first investment outside of the cannabis space 
is the beverage space, which of course has been a massive topic within the cannabis space. So I'm not going to lie. It makes me wonder if you're planning something. Well, you know, listen, th this is a very accretive management team here that's building out a, a massive operation. It's cash flow positive and EBITDA positive. It's just a great business that they've managed to put together. And for us, it was really, you could just see taking a great business that already had a great management team and overlaying all the experience that Paul and his group brought together. We feel like they're going to have access to capital, which is obviously going to be super interesting for them. And they've already proved it. They haven't even closed the SPAC transaction and they brought in another $100 million. And at the same time, we think that they've probably lined up a variety of accretive transactions, which is exactly what Paul did as he grew Diablo from a $7 billion company to 70. So for us, a small uh, number. Well, listen, we're happy for him only to take it to $7 billion. That would be just fine with us. <laughs> and, and for us, because we're ARK investors, so essentially the risk capital that, that dealt with the, the early part of the SPAC, we have uh, an oversized position in warrants. So as this thing moves higher, uh, our position almost goes uh, exponential just as it continues to move up. So we're, we're really you. confident about that. You have investments in both private and public companies. So I'm curious, you know, how do you assist companies uh, in, that would like to enter the public markets? Is that something you deal with? Is that something you help with um, or yes. what do you even advise? So, so I was a former banker, um, as was my partner, uh, who's now on, spent a number of years now on the fund management side. So I tend to work pretty aggressively with the companies you know, whether it's a Harvest One situation that requires a complete sort of restructuring and recapitalization, or whether it's a, it's a company like Embark, which is heading out into the public sphere and just needs some, some assistance outside of banks. We really tend to, to shepherd these companies and try and uh, avoid or avoid the bad seeds and introduce them to, to relatively good participants in the market. I love that. I mean... You are an active investor, which I always, you know, respect and admire. Um, so I guess as we are looking at your portfolio and the growth of your portfolio, um, are all these companies focused or it listed in Canada or focused in Canada? I don't think Harvest One is, but uh, I would well, love so, your insight so on that. So we really take a global look at the world and because Canada was first in terms of the legalization process, it all kind of works the same, whether you're Australia, whether you're Germany, whether you're United States, it's just the, the, the speed at which it happens. So our investments, I would consider are in uh, Canada's Western worlds really. So that's really for us, uh, Canada, the United States, Western Europe and Australia. And in, in Europe, it's really medicinally focused, as is Australia, whereas in, in Canada, North America, it's really been extraction focused, which, we, which has been a big bottleneck. And now we're focused really on those brands where, you know, if you look at a good example, and frankly, it's become clear to us that uh, really a lot of our companies are big enough to be really good uh, key add-ons for some of these larger companies so if you look at a harvest one it has i can't remember the the exact number but it's over fifty thousand storefronts um and that includes where it sells dream water which is it's you know lead product and live relief so if you're a if you're a company that's either in europe australia or um, in canada looking to create that network as we head into the u.s federalization and legalization then it's a great takeout candidate because you could immediately start to fire through CBD products and other things. And then when legalization happens, snap, you're there to go. Because I think a lot of people, um, and this is probably not a popular opinion, as the MSOs continue to build here, that they're only state legal. So eventually as the federal legalization comes together, there's going to have to be some sort of unwind or some sort of something is our expectation about those processes. And we saw it in Canada because, I mean, essentially a lot of the, the legacy products had to transition into another area. So so we're a little curious how the whole MSO process is going to happen, um, how FDA is going to get involved in the whole federalization. So 
we're trying to stay away from that area right now, just as there's not a ton of clarity. And don't get me wrong, th those businesses certainly are blowing off money right now, but that's really because there's not a lot of participants outside that really specific group. Fair so enough. for the for us, those those companies are just not takeover candidates by anyone large for a while. Um, you know, if we were to invest in something that size, we would pick a canopy, which is not necessarily a better business, but it's federally legal and it has more options and better pass forward for investors like us, right? Fair enough, Michael, that's really good insight into your investment strategy, what you're looking for, where you're looking for it. Uh, and for anybody looking for, uh, I think an interesting portfolio, look no further than MMJ. I gotta say, man, the vintage wines, I'm waiting for that cannabis wine. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> I said it before. I know. I know you didn't hint towards anything. It's just Elliot hinting toward it. But well, you know. when you look at a company that's in our portfolio, like Embark, that's focused on nanotechnology, and it already has drop-ins for uh, a variety of other products, the the formulation work and other things for this, it's not that complicated. So, so whether it's for them or for someone else, these products are coming, and they're coming really <laughs> fast. And and the quality of the products in this next generation is just going to be shockingly better than what you saw the first iteration. All right. Well, I claim the IP and the, and the, the idea. <laughs> <I'm totally laughs> you kidding. can have a, you can be the tester. <laughs> yes. Michael, I'll take it. I'll take it. Anyhow, done. This is a really <laughs> strong one, Elliot. We, we brought it just to you. <laughs> yes, I love it. Awesome. Michael, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. MMJGH.com.au, uh, bringing the Western cannabis scene to Australia in good fashion. Much appreciate you being here. Cheers, Elliot. Have a great right. day. You too. You too. All right, y'all. Uh, that takes us to, uh, we'll say, the pillar of any Benzinga event. The one, the only Tim Seymour is going to be coming on, dropping knowledge bombs about his ETF. He's going to be interviewing two powerhouses. Uh, oh, he joins me. I, I feel like I, I need to uh, bless the virtual stage. Oh, stop here. it, dude. Come on. This is getting <laughs> ridiculous. Please. <laughs> Come on. He's like, shut up, Elliot. Uh, no, Tim, it's always good to have you, man. It's good to it's, see you. It's great to be here. You guys have gathered the galaxy of cannabis stars for sure. So uh, congrats to, to Benzinga once again. Thank you. It has been a long two days, but honestly, I'm not tired. It's just listening to one presentation and, and fireside and panel after the other. So what I'm going to do is get out of your way and, and tune into you. Okay, Elliot, thanks. Um, and hey, good afternoon, everybody. I know it's been a, a full couple of days and I think there's probably a, an hour and a half left here on a, on a Friday afternoon. So we'll try to keep this brief. And in fact, um, my segment is, I think, yeah, it's, it's around education. So um, you've been listening to fantastic investors all day, including uh, the last panel. Um, I, I'm going to try to give you some thoughts on <clears throat> how I approach the sector, how I think about investing in cannabis in the public markets in an ETF format. Um, you know, real quick, you know, my background is uh, in emerging markets. And on some level, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I think about these uh, markets very much in the same context. But um, quickly, uh, I am Tim Seymour. I run CNBS, the Amplify Seymour Cannabis ETF. Um, I'm also a member of the investment team at JW Asset Management, and we're excited to talk to Jason Wilde and Chris Weber uh, in about 15 minutes or less, uh, and really hear about an exciting project, the Weber Wild Fund. But um, my orientation on cannabis is uh, as someone that's been investing in the public markets, the private markets, uh, really, you know, from early days. And I also sit in an advisory capacity to a number of companies. So um, from that perspective, I want to give you uh, just, yeah, my thoughts on, on how I think about investing in cannabis. Um, CNBS is an actively managed ETF. Real quickly, um, we are $150 million under management. Uh, we're up about 51% year to date. Uh, the approach is absolutely dedicated cannabis, which means that 80% of the portfolio must have more than 50% of their revenues coming from cannabis. So that means uh, not tobacco companies that might be here someday or pharma companies that might be here someday or companies that you know, do a little bit in cannabis. It's really, it's to be invested on, on uh, companies that are really big players in the sector. We can touch the plant and, and, and I'll say as a, an evolving dynamic for uh, the industry. We probably heard all about the federal 
uh, restrictions on the industry in the United States. That has applied to the investment world, uh, but we're happy to say that we can now invest uh, via swap in really anything we want uh, in the public markets, and that's really exciting. Um, we're investing in ancillary, we're investing in technology, we're investing in picks and shovels, but we're investing in hopefully uh, the most profitable companies in the space and the ones with the most upside. Um, I think the, 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 the idea behind an ETF for investors, whether you're investing in uh, e-commerce or blockchain or uh, emerging markets, uh, you know, an ETF that is sector-based should be thematic. And, and in my view, thematic in the cannabis sector means uh, a very fit, very quick evolution of, of the themes that we've been investing around in cannabis already uh, in, in the first couple of years. But uh, active is, is very important because um, not only are we seeing the sector continue to have dynamics around M&A and, and look, new listings. Uh, I've been able to invest in, in three different IPOs. Uh, in the last you know, year or so in the fund on day one as part of that. So um, the M&A, the IPO calendar, uh, corporate governance is absolutely a major dynamic to investing in any new industry, in any emerging market. And I think that's a big part of, of how we evaluate the sector. Look, uh, momentum, technicals, liquidity dynamics are, are, are constantly changing in this industry. At times we've seen uh, massive liquidity surges, and we've seen liquidity dry up. The last the last six weeks have, have been, you know, relatively light in terms of liquidity. Certainly, relative to what we saw in the first six weeks of the year through mid February, when the sector was was on fire. Um, I think of cannabis as an emerging market. I said, and and so I, I ran a long short EM hedge fund for. 13, 14 years. And, and to the extent that um, I think of the cannabis trade, and I express this in the portfolio as, as a top-down trade, uh, a bottom-up trade, uh, a trade that's, that's ultimately focused on, on corporate governance, uh, some part momentum, some part liquidity factors, and some part structural. So if you think about it, in, in, in emerging markets back in the late 90s, you were, you were often investing just based upon who, who was going to get the next tranche of IMF money. Um, or you know what country was going to improve their 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 macro balance sheet for any number of reasons, and that was enough to pretty much buy the whole the whole sector. Cannabis has seen that too. Um, cannabis has seen that as it relates to to absolutely the federal dynamics, and and certainly we know that that started north of the border and and you know, Canada's momentum, uh, some momentum around the world, and then obviously the momentum around the political change in in Washington into 2020 and what that meant for the prospects of federal legalization here. Investing in, in cannabis macro is, is, is very important. Getting your macro right is very important. Um, but kind of like emerging markets, it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily why you're investing here and now. You're investing for this macro growth trend, this, this uh, uh, turbo charged addressable market dynamic. Um, and, and actually, unlike in the emerging market space where you might want to invest in in a Brazil or but you might not want to invest in a Turkey. Uh, in other words, not investing in a bad neighborhood. I, I think in the cannabis space, um, the neighborhoods are the subsectors. And, and so the subsectors are, are clearly whether it is uh, technology or, or retail or e-commerce or uh, to the extent that we're obviously then very focused on on retail as it relates to uh, multi-state operators or the LPs that have that, that retail footprint. Um, you're, you're thinking about cannabis in the context of, of macro, but then the bottom up is very important. And, and what we're starting to see now uh, and the way I, I believe I, I express this in the portfolio is is that we're starting to see companies separate from the pack in terms of, look, we talk about the MSOs. Um, we can see the companies that have uh, dramatically improved gross margins, profitability are, you know, three, four, five quarters into uh, a free cash flow generation. Uh, that's very impressive. Uh, and we're now looking at we get into the second half of 21 and into 22. Uh, those operators that are really seeing this hockey stick. Remember those hockey sticks that we were talking about in 2018 that were going to be 2019 that never really happened. But. But the cultivation that's coming online that's really going to define the differences, I think, for a lot of these companies uh, in 2H21 and, and in 22. Um, I think the, the, 
the most important thing for especially retail investors in investing in cannabis, I think, is trying to balance um, the fundamentals and the macro, whether it's what's happening on the federal side, what's happening state by state, which frankly in the U.S. continues to be where the, the, you know, the momentum every single day, there's a new headline about a new state coming online. That's you know, for, for investors that spend time combing over the macro. In a couple of years, we're going to look back over you know, the fact that you know, we're seeing this thaw in the Texas legislative you know, track or what we see, especially in some of the really conservative southern states as being, you know, I can't believe we spent so much time on it. But, but I do think that the macro is really important. I, I would tend to say, though, investing in cannabis is really pragmatic investing. And so in a world where the, the, the hockey analogy, right, that's way overused which is you know, skating to where the puck is going. Um, for me, it's, it's really about investing where I think the capital is going. So at a time when I can invest in, in US companies, I can invest in Canadian companies, I can invest in companies in Europe, uh, on some level, part of my job as a portfolio manager is to you know, try to uh, evaluate where I actually think capital is going. We all know where institutional capital has had issues investing in the sector where we've had big U.S. mutual funds that were invested in MSOs that had reverse field uh, because someone got a tap on the shoulder or some custodian said you can no longer custodize it here. Uh, there are obviously many dynamics on investing in U.S. LPs versus U.S. MSOs that at times uh, are very emotional topics. They're, they're topics that I think uh, the, the fundamentals in, in north of the border and, and in the United States are very different. But for me as a portfolio manager, I'm investing in companies that I think can go higher. And, and, and that's based upon fundamentals. It's based upon technology. It's based upon more many times liquidity and momentum factors. Yesterday, I was tweeting out um, something on, on, on Tilray. And in the middle of what's been another crazy week around Reddit investing, um, you know, my tweet was Tilray, Reddit, or real. And, and Clearly, Tilray, especially in February, was a 22, 25% short interest stock that was really caught up in some of the uh, the bulletin board activity. And and maybe this week it was it was as well. There's fundamentals around why Tilray would be a fundamental choice in a world where uh, they are not only one of the better operators in Canada, but are positioning themselves for for U.S. Uh, access. And maybe, though, if you have a view on the federal dynamic, uh, many investors think investing in some of the Canadian LPs is the way you get that exposure. I'm not going to tell you whether I think that's the right thing or the wrong thing. I have a view, but I, I'm more pointing out the the pragmatic part of, of what I think I'm supposed to do as a fund manager and is to not get overly righteous uh, necessarily about fundamentals if, if I think that there's capital flowing into a particular name. Yesterday, I was actually fading a little bit of that strength in Tilray, um, which is a big position in my portfolio and one that I've been adding to in the previous few weeks, um, because I think that's what I'm supposed to do on a day like this. Um, I'm happy to say that as a guy that ran long, short EM money, uh, you know, many times in emerging markets when you're dealing with currencies and, and macro and, and uh, the fundamentals around the stock and the exogenous factors, sometimes we were over trading. And sometimes running long, short anything means you're over trading. I think in an active ETF, I think you're in a position to, to really uh, hopefully balance the combination of I can I can fade strong moves. I can buy extreme weakness. Um, I can buy fundamental changes that I see happening. But the key really is is that I'm, I'm able to uh, be reactive or proactive, but not over trade, which uh, I think at times when your mandate is a low vol, absolute return, long short equity strategy, it's it's what you do. Um, in terms of, you know, things that I, I think investors should also be thinking about with regards to uh, the next wave of investing in in cannabis, it's very clear. You know, we're going to continue to see uh, more subsectors develop. I, I think the 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 REIT sector has now been a relatively uh, broad place, on a, again, on a relative basis to invest in cannabis. Um, the retail space as it relates to the hydroponics retailers and the, the picks and shovels. I think we're going to start to see a lot more as it relates to, to technology, but as it relates to where there is software and where there are ERP and logistics and, and some of those sectors that I think 
Uh, it was exciting to think about them early on, but really there was almost nothing to do. Um, I think, you know, the important thing for investors to remember is also where I say this all the time, but where global markets and, and are still going to push this sector around. So if you get a case where, uh, yes, we're near all time highs yet again on the S&P and, and yes, the VIX is you know, around 17. But uh, the minute some of those factors change, I think you have to think about your cannabis investments in terms of the volatility profile. And it may have nothing to do with the fundamentals there. So um, I think with that, what I, I actually want to keep moving and, and, and bring in uh, uh, Chris Weber and Jason Wild, because we've been talking for about 15 minutes here. And I know we've got a pretty uh, tight schedule to run. So um, I, I, I want to talk about a, a fund that is something that I, I think is incredibly exciting, not only because it's, um, it's focused on impacting uh, minority entrepreneurs in a cannabis sector that we all know social equity is a complex uh, and important ingredient in the future of this industry. But... Investing in, in uh, some of these businesses is, is not simple. Um, and with that, you know, I, I think uh, I want to bring in Jason Wild, uh, chairman of TerraSend, uh, the CIO and founder of JW Asset, and Chris Weber, and be a great Hall of Famer uh, and cannabis entrepreneur and major advocate for minority businesses. Guys, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Chris, I, I want to start with you because, um, you know, a lot of folks that are in the cannabis space have followed some of Jason's work. Uh, I think a lot of the folks that are tuned in today have followed some of your work, too. Uh, but you've been investing in cannabis for, for early, early days, and you've been committed to minority businesses and social equity in those businesses for a long time. Give us first just some some context for your background in the sector. Help us understand how, how you've been approaching it. And then I want to kind of dive into the fund itself. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. And I think that uh, with myself, how I approached it, um, it started from just having a management company. And from that management company, it was PR and uh, managing myself and other athletes. Uh, at that time, I got into the cannabis space, kind of doing that with brands and then investing in myself, uh, whether it was with other athletes that uh, happened to have some uh, really large companies or whether it was just myself being excited about this industry, uh, because I know we talk about uh, recreational, and I'm excited about that, but for myself as well, being an athlete, uh, it was about the medicinal pro properties of the cannabis plant, from sleep management to uh, pain management and other things. And so I've just been a, an advocate of the whole time as I've used it uh, in my career. And being able to partner uh, with someone uh, proven, uh, a great uh, proven, a, a great proven, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, I have to. That's all right. We're, we're all navigating proven, the world of technology today. Yeah, sorry about that. That's you got I'm it. trying to call investor. Um, you know, it was just awesome. I was really calling to uh, understand more, get more knowledge, uh, just trying to learn as much as possible. And, uh, we uh, had great conversations and found out that um, we're aligned in a lot of ways of thinking and uh, was born after that, the Weber Wild Fund, that I'm so excited to uh, be a part of. Yeah, and 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 Jason, come on in here because uh, again, your commitment to the industry has been very clear, but but your commitment to you know a an impact fund focused on minorities and and your uh, coming together with Chris is something that that has been uh, you know, I know very exciting and personally for you an important part of of your next call it chapter. So so talk about again the genesis of this partnership, how you guys came together. And then let's let's get into the mission statement of, of what we're doing. Sure, sure, absolutely. And uh, and uh, yeah, Tim, thanks for uh, thanks for having us here. Um, so so Chris, uh, as Chris mentioned, we we got to know each other a little bit first, just talking about the cannabis industry, and then uh, got to know each other as uh, as people uh, a little bit more, uh, and uh, talk, you know talked about what I had learned uh, just you know as recently as the last uh, two or three years about how how uh, how many more um, uh, people of color are uh, incarcerated right now and are being and, and are being arrested every single day uh, versus uh, you know purport, proportionally versus uh, versus uh, white people I mean it's pretty uh, pretty staggering something yep. that I that I didn't know was going on and didn't know sort of the the history of it 
Uh, and Chris and I both uh, sort of uh, were very, very interested, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the in this whole issue and uh, brainstormed on a on a way to uh, to to make a difference and and setting up this impact fund. Uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, investing in uh, in businesses that are uh, that are run by uh, by people of color. Uh, but we what we think is that uh, these are not only going to be th th this. This is a way that we can uh, do well by doing good. We think sure. that uh, this is in. We don't look at this as a charity in, in any way. We think uh, we've got some leads on some excellent, excellent businesses that uh, that uh, we would uh, want to invest in, uh, whether right. they were by people of color or whether they whether they weren't. Uh, and uh, we can also bring the benefit of the fact that I've been in this industry for, uh, you know, uh, seven or eight years at this point and have made a lot of mistakes, a lot of costly mistakes. And I could I could or we could help these companies uh, at least avoid making those mistakes. I'm sure I'm sure we'll all make uh, new mistakes together. So we look at the impact fund as a way to sort of uh, help uh, even the playing field. Uh, only I believe only about three percent of uh, licenses, cannabis licenses uh, nationwide are uh, are run or owned by people of color. So we feel like, uh, you know, for an industry or a, a, a medicine or a product that has disproportionately hurt the black community, that uh, mm -hmm. we really want to uh, give the black community uh, even more of an opportunity to uh, be part of this uh, this, uh, you know, uh, burgeoning uh, uh, legal market. So, so, and, and talking about, you know, a fund as a venture to make money and to be a place where investors will see great returns. And again, as you said, doing well by doing good. Um, I think it's important. And I want to talk about the difference there and even, you know, the, the dynamic of, of even a, a foundation that, that sits right next side and, and Chris, yeah. you know, opening up cookies, uh, you know, the cookies you, uh, dynamic and, and, and that initiative that you announced a couple weeks back, how exciting that is. So let's talk about that in a second. But before we do, Chris, I'm just curious, as someone that's been investing in minority businesses and someone that's been uh, focused on this sector, as someone that also uh, grew up as an athlete where cannabis has been you know, medicinal, has been uh, you know, social lubrication, has been something that's uh, I think approached very differently uh, and very much as part of um, for those consumers that, that uh, um, have made it a part of, of their lifestyle and, and without a lot of thought to it. Um, and, and to the extent what you see right now, both acceptance within the NBA and, and, and you know, how cannabis within especially you know, the circles of, of the athletic community where, um, look, a disproportionate amount of, of folks playing in the NBA are, are minorities. Um, and, and, you know, what it really means to them to see the movement going on and share that perspective. And then I want to get into what you think a lot of these minority businesses really, really need uh, in terms of resources. Yeah, well, I, I, I happen to uh, invest in a wide range of partnerships and businesses of my own and those that happen to be uh, with minority um, ownership are just as profitable as other businesses. Sure. Um, this is just access. We're using the same analytics as we would uh, with with anything. And I think this is a sad part that we even have to create an impact fund because, as Jason said, in no way is this a handout or a giveaway. And whether it's my friends in hockey, football, baseball, we, are, we athletes have a few things in common. Uh, we have terrible schedules. You'll end up uh, finishing the game at 11, getting on the plane at 12, getting to a new city at four in a different time zone, have to get up from <clears> four hours to six hours. You have to eat and work out and maintain a different schedule. Well, how do you maintain uh, sleep consistency? How do you maintain mood consistency? How do you maintain pain management? Is it through a drug that's addictive that causes other problems such as stomach issues or, right. or headaches or other things? And so. We as athletes, no matter what color, no matter what background, uh, we share the fact that we take our bodies very seriously. And the reason why these laws or these bylaws and these uh, agreements are changing is because the athlete has power and control over his or her body. And they've decided that instead of letting pharmaceutical companies uh, take uh, uh, tell us what to do with our bodies with three or four options of the same uh, addictive drug for pain medication, why can't we use this natural plant? So I think uh, uh, there's a lot more education and a lot uh, of players are taking advantage of that 
uh, education and taking a stand for it. And so I'm um, very excited to be part of that liberating aspect of that in sports. And uh, as far as uh, kind of the businesses and, and what we've been working with, um, I'm just excited to bring access. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the times, uh, you know, these companies uh, have uh, great partnerships, have, uh, have uh, great perspectives and, and, and everything going, excuse me, um, but they don't have access. And so I just think it's awesome that someone like Jason Wild would not only uh, offer, of course, uh, acquisitions, money, and all that good stuff, but, but really that access to his uh, history, his knowledge, uh, the fact that he wants you to succeed. And, and again, this has to be profitable for our investors. This is not by any way a charity, a giveaway, or anything except, you know, if, if Jason is as wise as we've seen him be, uh, managing a portfolio starting at 80000 getting it to $2 billion <laughs> plus, uh, then I think he knows his secret or two. And so I think that he can spot talent. That's all it's about is putting talent in front of him with the same analytics and giving people access that may not have had that. And that's life change. And that's why I have a pretty cool partner. What, what, and, and before, before, before we let Jason's, uh, Jason's Thank head's you, kind of swelling out of the, out of the picture here. No, I'm uh, blushing. I'm, I'm, I'm blushing. Got, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. And I think people <laughs> that know you know you're a humble, a humble guy. But, but what, what do you think is missing, Chris? Um, and I want to then hear, you know, Jason's view on some of these subsectors. But, but uh, to the extent that, that uh, in terms of a skill set, in terms of resources that you guys are going to bring, is there anything in particular you, you characterize as, as one of the missing ingredients here that you think is a big part of kind of working side by side with these entrepreneurs? I think it's two things that, that we've brought. It's uh, one is um, a place of trust. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean in the fact that I work with these communities often. I've brought programs to these communities and, and my communities in different ways. And that, you know, I do not have an ego and I look to work with the best people and that Jason in itself brings that validity, uh, uh, number one, uh, where you have to earn it. Uh, I, I think that's one. And then secondly, yep. I think it's, I think it's our overall approach, and that is just creativity. So no matter what Jason has done, no matter what we've done together with the company, the door is open that it's not just cold. So it's not cold lending. It's not uh, a cold partnership. The door is open. And I, I don't know from many businesses that I've worked with uh, if that relationship has been there or not. And so as an entrepreneur, uh, what better partner to have than Jason? He really becomes your partner. Uh, because he wants to instill trust in his investors. He wants it to be successful. And we believe that if this is profitable, uh, that hopefully it will transfer uh, to other um, you know, business opportunities uh, that some of our uh, partners are, are working in. So we really want this to be profitable. And I think the fact that uh, we're willing to, to go the extra yard with you um, is a big part of our philosophy. Yeah. So, so Jason, let's let's talk a little bit about you know if I if I read the the headline for uh, the mission statement for the fund, investments in companies led by entrepreneurs of color pursuing careers in the cannabis sector. So, so first of all, structure of the fund, um, pretty plain vanilla private equity structure. Um, talk about where in the life cycle of the companies uh, you expect to be focused, and and talk a little bit about um, to the extent that there's. Look, there's an approach that, that JW Asset has had, a very successful one, uh, towards investing in the sector. And, and uh, uh, how might that be different here? Um, or is it you know, ultimately leveraging an investment process that's you know, worked for 20 plus years? I, yeah, I think it's going to be a combination of, uh, of a bunch of those different things. I mean, there's, there are going to be uh, uh, some extra opportunities or there should be a, a lot of extra opportunities uh, for companies that are run by people of color. So those might be opportunities that uh, in, the, in the past uh, that I, you know, uh, my firm uh, didn't, didn't have access to. So that's a positive. That should help. Uh, you know, that, that's the reason we don't think there's going to be any uh, diminution in, in returns versus our, our, historic, uh, our historic numbers. Uh, the, and then when, when you take a look at it in terms of the, the businesses that we've been looking at uh, in the space, we're really uh, relatively agnostic. Uh, I love companies that have, uh, you know, that that are big and, uh, you know, are, are stores that are doing amazing, doing over twenty million dollars a year in sales. Uh, but I also, you know, since I'm, uh, uh, you know, really an entrepreneur, I also love looking at startups or somebody that's taking their business from 
you know, wants to take it from doing a million dollars in sales to, you know, 15 million uh, if they if they have the, the capital behind them to uh, to be able to uh, expand on that. So so we're really uh, we've been using uh, both uh, uh, Chris's network and my network to really uh, find some really good, uh, we have some really good prospects. And I would say it's, uh, you know, it's very similar, though, to the way that we look at uh, the way we look at, uh, you know, uh, any and any business in the cannabis space. Uh, we prefer limited license states <clears throat> to non-limited license states just because there's so much less uh, so much less competition. Uh, we prefer uh, you know full vertical integration uh, or as much as possible uh, things like that. So we're gonna we're gonna follow along the same path that we've done uh, on the fun side. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know we've made a lot of mistakes since 2014. So uh, a lot of very costly ones that we just you know wish we could have had back. But uh, here, uh, I feel like at least that those uh, those uh, losses can uh, can turn into uh, you know less mistakes for uh, for uh, these businesses that we plan on uh, we plan on funding here. And it's just the thing that we really have going for us is that the cannabis industry is one of the only industries I know of that already had a social equity component to it yeah. before the last year year or so. But what we would love to do here is you know, make this work in a cannabis impact fund and then go out and try to do it in other industries to try to help uh, uh, different uh, businesses run by people of uh, color. It doesn't just it doesn't just need to be uh, cannabis, but this is going to be our uh, certainly our proven ground uh, uh, to start off. And we're both, uh, you know, we both uh, Chris and I both really love the space. So, yeah, uh, we're I mean, yeah, yeah, the, the, the yeah. An investment management team doesn't kind of change their spots overnight. In fact, it, you know the same approach that's that's worked uh, will will continue to work. And and Chris, I, you know, I'm I'm curious as as you know we've kind of defined the difference between yeah, look, there's charities out there doing great things and foundations that are created, um, yeah. and then there's an impact fund. Um, to 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 what extent do you do you think there is a role? And I know you've spent some time and and have interest. Uh, and this is part of a, a kind of a parallel, uh, you know flag you're planting in the ground in terms of, you know, putting together a foundation um, that ultimately can be part of training and part of, you know, skills enhancement uh, and part of that, that you know, intelligence factor uh, of, of bringing in, uh, you know, folks that can, you know, provide the education and the training to help some of the, 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 the minority entrepreneurs, or, or really, again, maybe it's, maybe it's resources. Maybe it's, it's a, an entity that's providing proper legal, proper accounting, proper engineering, um, and things that a, a lot of folks in some of these communities don't have access to. So give your thoughts on that and how that can support uh, a fund like this. You're exactly right, Tim. It's, it's about access to you, Tim. It's about access to Jason, meaning that, you know, we trust your background. We, we, we trust your business acumen to say, hey, listen, take a look at this. I, I mean, I, I promise you it's really that simple, but it has to be a dedicated effort, unfortunately, just because of how things have been. And so one, that is the, the business. So again, to all of the investors in JW and others, it, it is, you know, I, I'm an investor. I, I want uh, the same litmus test. I want the same yeah. expectation yeah. Uh, because we want that profit. And then, so once that is settled, uh, what we did first, if, so that is what happened and it allows us to be so free flowing and to be aggressive in a business way. And for me to follow my partner is one of the best in this industry to keep learning and, and to really go aggressively. But what we did first was we created, uh, along with putting our money where our mouth is, our other partners, uh, Cookies You. And what that does is we're making sure, as uh, Jason alluded to, we love vertical operations on the business side, but we know that um, the entrepreneur is one, and then there is another side of someone that just really wants to be in the business. And we've allowed with Cookies You to either learn how to have a vertical operation, how to go through, how to understand business accounting and other things, or how to be a wonderful bud tender, how to be a wonderful employee, and to make sure that you're part of the family. And so we really love that we have job training and job placement because these communities that have been ravaged by these laws that now we can take advantage of uh, as business entrepreneurs, as, as a country, at least it had, allows them to have a say. At least it allows them to still be part of this thriving new business that's entering their communities. And so in one hand, we've done it to make sure that we're with the best entrepreneurs, the best companies, those that, you know, again, that, that JW would invest in regardless, and then to make sure we plant seeds. And that is through 
working with our foundation and working uh, with wonderful companies like Cookies U to make sure we educate, get access to education, uh, access to job placement, access to a path of, uh, you know, making money in the cannabis industry. So, so, so with that, Jason, look, you're, you're walking the walk, you're putting your own capital in, um, into, into this fund and, and committing to, to helping uh, build some of these minority businesses. Um, the last two days, Benzinga is at a forum where a lot of people have been discussing uh, the, the legislative policy track and where we are with, with in D.C., with, with uh, complex legislation that in many cases social equity and criminal justice reform um, are, are, we all know you can't, you can't overstate it enough. Uh, you can't overstate it, uh, I should say. It, it, so, so with that and, you know, someone that's leading by example and walking the walk, not just talking the talk, um, what do you think, I think people would find it interesting to get your view on what's most important for the minority community right now out of D.C.? Um, and is it about putting some victories on the board in terms of, first of all, giving the industry easier access to capital and things that aren't necessarily attaching um, a, a, you know, social equity components to it right now, but maybe is, is strengthening the industry. So guys like you and Chris can then um, have an easier time also supporting uh, those minority communities. Um, or do you think legislation should include uh social equity components, um, independent of what the states are doing. And we know every state is doing it differently. Um, your thoughts, because while that conversation has been had over the last couple of days, it's probably particularly interesting as you think about this fund, people want to know your view on that. Yeah, sure. So I think that um, we uh, the uh, people have started to realize over the last several months that we, you know, uh, in beginning of January, where, uh, where the, the Dems picked up a couple of seats Everybody got very excited. They thought, you know, le legalization or uh, you know, U.S. uplisting and and all that all that good stuff that that uh, that everybody wants. They thought it was going to happen right away, and then they realized uh, that it's not. Now, you know, now people realize that it, that it isn't. Uh, and I think a, a part of it is because uh, it, it seemed like the Democrats were going to go for something bigger. Uh, and and I'm all for that because I like you know. The, the true uh, injustice that continues to go on every day is that people are getting arrested every day. So that's, that's really, uh, that, that's very, very important. But um, in terms of the aspect of how this different, these different uh, you know, laws could affect uh, these businesses, I think the most important thing for all you know, businesses in the cannabis space is uh, if we can get rid of uh, 280E, yep. which was really, you know, some people were thinking that could, that could be part of the, the SAFE Act. 280E affects, uh, you know, pretty much uh, everybody in retail. It's a, you know, it's just a huge burden on the industry and an, and an industry that, as I mentioned, is uh, is very difficult. So, so that's going that that's uh, that affects everybody, not just the uh, the MSOs, uh, you know, all all independent uh, operators. I think also if we can make some progress within the Safe Act, even if we don't get that, if we can make some progress in terms of. Uh, being able to uh, bank, uh, you know, not have to jump through uh, so many hoops for banking or credit, being able to accept uh, credit cards or being able to uh, uh, be insured for, you know, the, you know different uh, liability insurance and, and things like that. Those are all steps forward. Uh, as you, you know, uh, as both you and Chris uh, know, I, I always uh, like to annoyingly say that, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if, you know, pay me now or, or pay me uh, not to sound too mercenary. Uh, but or pay, pay me more later. Pay us a lot more <laughs> later, meaning if it takes longer to make uh, progress, and, and uh, all of the uh, you know U.S. listed companies are essentially locked out of uh, the cannabis industry in the U.S. for another five years, then that's just going to give the current operators, and I'm sure many new entrepreneurs, hopefully some that we're funding, uh, that's going to give them a, a, a larger uh, uh, you know period of time that they can go build great businesses, and they're going to be. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, a lot of these MSOs will be five or 10 times the size that they are now in five years. And if that's when uh, when all of the, uh, you know, big U.S. Uh, conglomerates come in, whether it's, you know, Pfizer or Constellation or whoever it is, you know, it, it's uh, that's better, in my view, for all of the current operators. Uh, so I know that's a little bit different. Uh, you know, most uh, people who follow the space just want uh, want, you know, U.S. uplisting as soon as possible. Uh, I actually, to me, that's sort of like a, uh, I look at that as a, like a little bit of a sugar high. 
Yep. You know, because uh, uh, over the long term, it's going to be you know uh, the the longer we can the, the longer that the really big uh, competition that has billions and billions of dollars to throw around, the longer they're kept on the outside. The the you know uh, in, in my view, the the current uh, operators will uh, will excel in that uh, in that situation. So that's what I think is probably going to happen. We're not going to make a whole lot of progress. Maybe 280E. Uh, maybe some other incremental stuff about banking, but we just got to, you know, we just got to keep putting one foot, uh, you know, in front of the other and, uh, you know, keep making, uh, you know, progress as, uh, as sort of uh, slow as it's uh, as slow as it seemed. Put one foot in front of the other. Was that Santa Claus is coming to town? Was that Heat Miser? Which one? What was that song? Um, All of the above. I don't know. I don't know. I got to uh, uh, right. think. Chris, I don't know. Chris, do you remember that one? It was one of those those Santa Claus ones. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I don't yeah. Know. Robert Street uh, Plant. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Chris, I, maybe I'll ask you the same question, though. Um, you know, to to the extent that that uh, no one can be close to satisfied with with where uh, criminal justice reform, where there is truly not only uh, reversing uh, prohibition and criminal justice style uh, you know, legacy policy uh, in its tracks, but 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 obviously restitution. Um, what what would you like to see? Um, what what do you think is and and maybe then just attach it to, uh, you know, Jason just talked about 280E, which ultimately the the profitability from a tax perspective is is impossible. Um, what you're running into with some of your early investments in the space with minority uh, minority business owners who who are failing because the system's failing them. Um, so again, a snapshot of kind of where you you know how how do you feel? About the current legislative path, and and then what you know what what's the the biggest cry from within the 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 folks that you're investing with, and that are your partners and other businesses? I think it's two things. I think think is first access uh, to capital, and yep. so there's types of access to capital, and uh, I think uh, once we uh, address again federally, and, and hoping uh, that banking and, and other things are just made much more simpler for the average. Um, Entrepreneur is number one, not to have to jump through hoops. Uh, and most, you know, don't even have the hoops to jump through. Yep. And so when they try to put everything together, you know, where can you where can you go to be, to be safe? I think secondly, it is uh, the fact uh, uh, expungement of records of, of those yep. that have been um, families have been destroyed. Family has been just family structure has been deteriorated because of a lot of these laws. And when you look at not only sentencing for black and brown people for the same sentence being up to four times as more, um, it really just shows. It really just shows. Chris, you're um, a popular guy, by the way. You got to tell no, people no, to stop. No, no, sorry, my, my car. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking. Um, but I think uh, expungement of records, because we're talking about a lot of people that are from these communities where they're supporting these companies, these dispensaries, where they're going out and voting to have these laws changed so that the recreation cannabis can be in, in these places and, and these companies profit from. But just, you know, for expungement of records, because it doesn't just you know, cause not to work in the industry. But if you get out and you can't have fair housing, if you get out and you can't have lending uh, because you were found with, uh, you know, four joints in your pocket, you know, it's, it's just really messed up how I've seen not only the family structure, um, but communities damaged by these laws. And so for me personally, it's the expungement of a lot of records for uh, for the same um, plant yeah. that a lot of us are profiting off of right now. Powerful stuff, Chris. Um, and I believe in structure. Uh, you know, so as Benzig has got to run a tight ship today, much in the same way we're we're talking about a fund structure that is look again. It's about it's about making money for investors in a traditional private equity structure where you know doing well by doing good is really the name of the game and the mission statement. But look, uh, Chris Weber, Jason Wild, the Weber Wild Fund. Uh, congrats on on the launch and and the the, the momentum you have behind this. Uh, the support you have from the industry, the support you have from investors. Uh, it's an exciting time, and I'm sure it's going to be a really profitable time as well. Thanks. Fantastic Thank conversation, gentlemen. I do want to say our managing editor, Jason Shubnell, commented, it's great to have two Detroit guys, Chris and Calvin, referring to Calvin Johnson, getting in on the business and trying to change its reputation. Uh, so maybe next time we can get Calvin Johnson involved in this conversation at our live event and have you guys join that one. I I'd love to hear that. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, thanks again for being here. Chris, Jason, 
Tim, as always, wonderful, wonderful leading the conversation. Uh, Thanks, awesome. Everybody. It was Santa Claus coming to town. Thank you. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> say, no, come on, come on. I froze. I froze. Damn it. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Awesome, gents. Be well. Thanks, all right, y'all. Um, so that was Tim Seymour. I mean, he needs no outro. Uh, Chris Weber and Jason Wilde, they need no outros either. Wonderful, wonderful panel, fireside discussion. Uh, I, I look forward to hopefully reconvening that at our next event in person. Um, we have two more amazing pieces of content. You think we would end the day uh, with like maybe cupcake pieces? It's just not how we do it here at Benzinga. Uh, to end a solid agenda, we have one of the absolute OGs of this industry uh, in a conversation with, of course, Yeji Lee uh, from Insider. Uh, I, I won't take her thunder and introduce you, Andrew, but it's good to see you, man. Glad to have you back. Good to see you, Elliot. Thanks for having me. Thanks, uh -huh. Elliot. Thanks. Elliot, I don't know how you've done this all day. What have you been doing this for six, seven hours now? So good on you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this fireside chat. I'm Yaji Jesse from Insider, formerly known as Business Insider, and I cover the cannabis and psychedelics industries here. Um, I'd like to introduce everyone to Andrew Thutt, Chief Investment Officer at Forefront Ventures. Andrew was an early investor in the company before joining Forefront full-time in 2014. Before entering the cannabis space, he served as Managing Director of the BlackRock Small Capital Growth Fund and held positions at MFS Investment Management and VT Alex Brown. Forefront is listed on the CSE under the ticker FFNT and on the OTC as FFNTF. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Pleasure now, to be here. Yeah, now to get us started, why don't you give us a short one minute overview of Forefront, how it came to be the company it is today, and what makes it different? from the other MSOs in this space. Yeah, so Forefront you know, started back in 2011 as a consultant to the industry. So we were helping clients um, win licenses and then our operations team would help them get up and running, um, those consulting clients. And there was, and in 2014, 15, um, basically Forefront started to leverage our expertise in application writing and on the regulatory front to go in and win licenses in competitive states and, and we also put together a portfolio where we acquired in some states. And so currently we have operations in Washington, uh, Massachusetts, Illinois, Michigan, and we are entering uh, the California market imminently. And I think if you boiled down Forefront's investment thesis to uh, a couple sound bites, we have our facilities in Washington have dominant market position uh, in, in, that, in that state. So we have, we're the number two flower producer, the number one edibles producer. And what we figured out working in such a competitive state is how to, how to produce, you know, not only the flower cannabis, but all the derived products at a really low price. And if you can offer customers a really good product at a great price, you take outsized market share. And that's exactly what our, our, our products have done in Washington. And so the thesis for Forefront is really replicating those 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 uh, cultivation techniques and those manufacturing techniques that have been so successful in Washington into the rest of our portfolio. We have proof of concept of that in Massachusetts and Illinois, and we are currently you know opening 170,000 square foot processing center in California. Uh, it will be opening imminently. We're basically taking that low cost production from Washington and putting it on steroids to address that market. So we think that people are going to talk about low cost production a lot more in the years to come as, as, as uh, cannabis continues to commoditize. And we think it's going to be absolutely crucial uh, that uh, businesses figure out low cost production to be competitive. Now, let's dig into this a little bit. Forefront's big strategy, as you said, it's low cost production. Can you give us a little bit of color on exactly you know, how that works and what you guys do differently that makes you distinguished from your competitors? You look at a lot of the other MSOs um, and, and some of the some of the bigger ones that have been super successful. Um, GTI, True Leaf, uh, Jason Y was just on TerraSend. They're all they all operate in limited license states. And we love limited license states. You know, Massachusetts and Illinois are certainly, you know, fit that bill. But because they operate in inter, in, in limited license states, they've never had to deal with 
um, a hyper competitive market. And what we've done in Washington, you know, out of our facilities in Washington, there were there were unlimited licenses when that state opened for recreational. And I think something on the order of 1600 cultivate cultivators got licenses in that state. And so there was this huge supply glut and that pushed prices down. And so what we had to figure out in our facilities is how do you compete in this market um, where prices are, are continuing? Prices went from about 2,500 bucks a pound all the way down close to $600 a pound. And how do you, how do you survive in that market? Not only be competitive with your product, but figure out how to make some money too. And so having operated in that in Washington for six years, you know, there are a lot of skin knees, as we like to say internally, and it's never, and we figured out how to automate where we could. We figured out, um, we figured out how to, you know, adjust the HVAC, adjust the strains. We've been, it's not uh, how we do uh, uh, purchasing of all our supplies. So there's not one sort of magic bullet that makes us a low cost production or producer. It's an amalgamation of things that we've learned how to do over six years of operations in a really, really competitive state. Now, you guys are big in Washington, but you've expanded into now five states. How difficult is it to sort of replicate that low cost production in every state that you go to, especially since, you know, you have to build everything from the ground up all over again? Um, it is, uh, it's difficult. I mean, <laughs> cannabis, is a, cannabis is a hard business. Um, you know, everyone sort of thinks, you know, you know, you flip on the lights and the plants grow and you sell it and everyone makes millions. It's a really complicated business in terms of, you know, you have crop failures and, uh, you know, you have local supply chains. It's 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 and, and highly regulated. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of that we've accomplished in the last 15 months here at Forefront was, OK, it's all well and good to have this thesis that you're going to replicate uh, what you've done in Wash, what your facilities have done in Washington and other states. And then there's a whole nother thing to say, OK, we'll prove that this travels, prove that you can do this. And so over the last over the last 15 months in Massachusetts, we've um, you know introduced uh, you know all of our tried and true strains, all of our growing techniques, all of our um, we have 25 brands, over a thousand SKUs of products uh, that we've introduced into the Massachusetts and now Illinois markets, and the reception to those products has been phenomenal. Um, people love the quality. Uh, people love the availability in our stores and people love the price. And that is, you know, started us on our way to get, you know, market outsized market share in the states we're in. But it's it's complicated. Um, and what we're doing in California right now is, you know, we have we are just finishing what we think is the largest cannabis processing facility in the world, where we have the capacity to to do about half a billion dollars in revenue out of that facility. And so these are tough. We applied all the lessons from Washington to build this. Uh, basically, we took our Washington our Washington uh, automation and, and policies and procedures and put them on steroids for the California market. And, you know, we're going to see the rubber hit the road here this summer. But it's difficult and you got to know what you're doing. It's, it's hard business. Give us, give us a taste, Andrew. What are some rookie mistakes you guys met, made in the beginning? Uh, I, I don't want to say rookie mistakes, but you know, mistakes that you wouldn't have known to to address when you first went in that you feel like would be good advice to give others now. Um, I think that you know, a couple of the rookie mistakes we made is we, um, you know, we got a little bit ahead of ourselves on you know our expansion. Um, and so money was, money was really hard to come by in this industry and liquidity, um, and, and access to capital has improved greatly, but, you know, people sort of said, wow, this is great. And what a, what an opportunity, um, to, you know, cannabis is legalizing, let's get a license in every single state we possibly can. And the problem with that is you have to build facilities in every single state that you get into, which costs a lot of money that you have to pull together. And then you have to have the operating talent to go and pull it off. And so 
I think there were, you know, a lot of us in the industry um, that, you know, got got a little ahead of ourselves in terms of wanting to be everywhere, um, where I think that what's probably most important is that you 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 go deep and you and you you get great market share in the states that you're in. So a little bit more focus. Um, it was uh, or lack of focus, I think, was a was a big mistake that a lot of operators um, made early on. Um, I also think that, you know, no one knew how to grow cannabis indoors in Massachusetts or in Illinois. You know, there, there, there really wasn't a whole lot of talent pool to draw from. So you had a lot of California and, and Colorado growers coming out east and totally underestimating, you know, how much humidity there is in the east coast and how that would affect the grows. There was a lot of underinvestment in HVAC systems and that led to crop failures and all sorts of heartache. Um, so here we are, uh, you know, I, I, being called an OG was kind of scary, but <laughs> my seventh year in the industry and, you know, the lessons learned are a mile wide, but I think that those two things sort of going deep and not wide um, or going deeper and not overly wide um, and making sure that, you know, you aren't growing so fast that you can't support it from a capital or and a, and a human capital standpoint. Exactly. You know, I feel like that's a good lesson to have learned early on. And I feel like a lot of people learned that lesson early on. Um, in terms of your strategy for choosing which market, which state to enter next, what do you guys look at, whether it's, you know, regulations, population, um, culture? Uh, so, you know, early on in the cannabis industry, you, you know, the most the most attractive states to be in were what we call limited license states. So um, in Massachusetts, for instance, you know, started with a handful of license, people were licensed and it was really hard to open stores because the towns had restrictions. And so what you were looking at is a market that's, you know, six million people in Massachusetts and there were a pretty limited number of suppliers and there remains so. And what makes that attractive is obviously you have less competition, but you know you're. The, but the the second piece is that if there are fewer suppliers in a state, that means the prices in the state are going to stay higher for longer. So we think that uh, limited license states, um, which is which, basically most of the East Coast is, is a really really good place to be. Um, with the exception of the fact that we couldn't ignore California. Um, because of our success in Washington state, um, we thought that we were, we think, and are highly confident that we're uniquely qualified to go into California and take a lot of market share. Because not a lot of folks have, have, have spent the time on low cost production and have the brands and products that we, that we can produce at a really attractive price. So, sort of speaking out of both sides of my mouth, but you know, we like markets that are, with, that are, that are, that are big and have a lot of potential to grow with limited licenses. Um, but we aren't afraid to jump into the, uh, jump into a state like, um, like California, where we know that we're pretty uniquely qualified to go in and, and, and take a lot of share because of our low cost um, heritage. For sure. What's the next state you're looking at? If if you're willing to show a little bit of detail, or if you don't want to name names, um. oh, I mean, we we ha we feel like the assets that we have in our portfolio, we've done a really nice job of getting them up to the standards that we're seeing in in Washington, and we're at a point now where uh, we're starting to we're starting to hit our stride. Uh, we feel, and. Um, so we want to, you know, if you're successful doing that with assets, you obviously want to start collecting more assets. So the, the short answer to your question is we're waiting on, we have an application pending in New Jersey, mm. uh, which is a, a fantastic state. Um, you know, it, it had a very, very small medical market to start. And, you know, they are, they're pushing hard on having it be, you know, a bigger medical market, but it's obviously recreational. So we could go, you know, if we could get that license here and, and obviously we have to win it, um, but we, we were expecting to hear sometime uh, this quarter. Um, you know, that would be a terrific state for us. Mm. Um, 
you know, there are other states that are on the on the cusp of going wreck. You know, Maryland, you know, being a producer in Maryland would be an interesting state for us. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically big populations, limited licenses and and uh, and the rec program or they're either medical going to rec or the rec program still pretty nascent um, are all are all appealing options for us. For sure. Let's let's talk about your products for a minute. You know, you guys have what around 25 brands across flower, tinctures, edibles, topicals, others. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about how your low cost production allows you to be able to do that. Can you explain a little bit how exactly that works and what strategies you've used in order to expand that quickly? So in Washington state, our facilities, you know, are the closest thing that I've seen to CPG or consumer packaged goods in the cannabis industry. You know, you walk into our facility, it's 40,000 square feet, you know, 200 people, three ships a day, 24 hours a day. And, you know, you, you, you walk in and you'll see something highly automated. Um, and you juxtapose that to, um, you know, what you see on the East coast, you know, you'll see someone with, you know, baking, baking pot brownies and, or filling up cartridges, vape cartridges with a pipette. There's no automation. So because the prices are high, you know, in, in some of these East coast States, you can just continue to throw labor at it. And so what we figured out is, you know, how to automate, you know, the production of, of, of our infused products. Uh, and that's everything from infused pre-rolls to vape pens to, to, you know, a whole gamut of edibles, uh, tinctures. And we've, we've refined um, those production techniques. And so what, and so what we offer our consumer is a really good product at a fantastic price. And because we, we've, we can produce it at scale, we can lead with price. And so what we say at Forefront, we have all these wonderful products that have, you know, top market share in some of the com most competitive markets in the country, you know, namely Washington. And we did that with very little advertising. Mm -hmm. We did it by giving people a product at a great price that they really enjoyed. And so the way that we think about brands um, is we think that, frankly, at this point in the cannabis industry, brands are a little bit overrated. No one's walking into my store in Georgetown where we do, you know, two and a half million bucks a month or two over two, about two million bucks a month. No one's saying like, where's where's my X, Y, Z celebrity strain? They're just not. They're coming in saying, what's a good product at a great price? Mm -hmm. So the way that we think about brands is that if we can give consumers a, 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 an excellent product at a great price and we can take a lot of market share in every state we're in, all of a sudden we'll have national brands and we'll have done it by without, you know, a lot of the gloss and, and, and folder all that you have with, you know, celebrity endorsements and all that stuff that I think is going to be, you know, ultimately not drive the successful brands. Um, you know, when you look out at this industry three to five years. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting that you say that, you know, I feel like we have not seen any national brands as of late just because it was not possible to do that. You know, the, there, are, there weren't enough states to be able to really do that. But when do you think that shift is going to happen, Andrew? Um, when can we see brands actually become national and people begin to recognize things that they really enjoy and consistently buy? Like I think, I think right now the only real and truly national brand is cookies. Um, and outside of that, um, you know, everyone's kind of fighting over each other. You can look at the, you know, there was, there was a line of, of, of thinking three years ago that, you know, all the great, all the great brands are going to come out as California. California has got this really strong cannabis culture and, and, and look at all these, you know, it's sophisticated consumer base and wow, you know, all these brands are coming out of California and they're all going to be the winners. Um, if you actually look at the data in California, you'll see there, there's very little brand loyalty. Brands mm -hmm. hop all over the place in terms of who's on the top of the leaderboard. And that's because it's really price competitive. And so even if you have a, an incredible product, um, you know, you have, a, you have a, a premium vape pen that's a sauce pen that's full spectrum and 
and blah, blah, blah. You undercut that guy by 30%. You start to take all of his share. And he can't come down here and make money because he hasn't figured out low cost production. So there's a, I think brands are coming. Like we are just seeing it in Washington. We're seeing, you know, people coming in for um, not just, you know, the price and the quality, but they're saying, you know, hey, you know, they're Funky Monkey, um, which is our premium flower brand. You know, it's really consistent and it's always fairly priced and I'll take whatever. So that's, but that's six years into Washington, we're seeing that. So I think that, you know, we're probably three to four years out from any real national brands. And I think that, you know, we're all just sort of, there are a lot of brands swirling around. Everyone's paying a lot of attention to it, but I don't think there are any clear leaders yet. And I would submit that the leadership will have to have figured out low cost production to have a leading brand. Now we're almost out of time. I think we have around two minutes left. So Andrew, I'm going to ask you a question that I would like you to answer within one minute. Um, you know, you you sort of entered the cannabis industry as an investor from an investor's perspective. What's your advice for, you know, institutional slash retail investors who are looking to get in on the cannabis industry? What sort of quality should they be looking for in a company and how can they find that information? I think that it's mostly important. It's it's just so important to not buy the hype. You have to do a little research on, you know, is this a good company? And the only reason you, the only way that you can really tell if it's a good company, is if you dig in and you see are they are they driving revenues? Are they pro are they driving profitability? How are they allocating capital? So, you know, there's there it's it's an interesting market right now in cannabis because the big institutions can't play. Um, Fidelity's on the sidelines, BlackRock's on the sidelines because they can't invest in U.S. plant touching companies. And so that leaves a big chunk of our investor base is, is folks, tr folks buying these things in, in retail accounts. And there's a big hype machine around, you know, how retail investors get their information. Um, and, you know, you can, you can make some good trades, you know, following some of the hype and who has good momentum. But I would just strongly urge everyone to, you know, really make sure that the story makes sense that they're being told and 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 take the time to dig into the fundamentals, because I think there's a ton of money to be made in this space from here. Thanks, Andrew. It looks like we are right out of time. Everyone, that was Andrew Fudd, CIO of Forefront Ventures, and I'm Yaji Jesse Lee from Insider. Thanks for joining us. Take it away, Elliot. Fantastic discussion. Thank you so much, Yeji Jesse Lee, Andrew Thut. Uh, interesting counterpoint uh, to brands, to celebrity endorsements. Honestly, I don't have that or I don't hear that conversation much. So I appreciate you both facilitating that here. Thank Thanks, you. Elliot. Appreciate it. See you soon. Okay. All right, y'all. Uh, so we have a winner uh, to our upcoming uh, breakout newsletter. It's okay. We can bring the panel over. They can hear who the winner is. It's Mark McKenzie. Let's all give Mark McKenzie a round of applause. Oh, there we go. Mark McKenzie, you won our breakout newsletter lifetime subscription. We have one more giveaway. Uh, it'll be a lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro, best data platform out there for a retail investor. I use it daily uh, to watch all these guys. Uh, with that being said, Anna Saren, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm sorry if I said your last name wrong, uh, but you are the director uh, of listings development for Western Canada and U.S. for the CSE. Wonderful partner to Benzinga. We're super happy to have you and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Elliot. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Benzinga. Uh, the content that you guys produce is amazing. I can't wait for in-person events to happen again so we can see you all in a room. So thank you for putting this on. Um, as Elliot mentioned, my name is Anna Saren. I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. And I am joined today by three amazing companies and they all have very different uh, stories in going public and raising capital. So, um, so it's amazing content that you're gonna get. I know it's the end of the day on Friday, but hopefully you stick around um, because they all have great stories in the cannabis space and raising capital. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing them all, and then I'm going to let them introduce themselves before we dive into it. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about the resurgence of cannabis in the capital markets. 
Um, a big part of that is obviously raising capital. Uh, we saw as a pandemic neared uh, and shutdown occurred last year, we saw the cannabis sector softening a little bit and it has been unbelievable to watch since then. And these three companies have all been raising capital within that period of time and have gone to market and had great success. So we're gonna hear their stories. Um, so thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Fabian Monaco, CEO of Gage Cannabis that's listed with the CSC. Uh, Louise Marchand is president with CEO of, oh, I hear some feedback. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Louise Melchon is president, CEO of Flora Growth, and Kyle Kazan, CEO of Glass House Group. So thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, I am going to start by introducing you individually and let you tell us about yourselves and the company that you're with. Uh, Fabian, I'm going to start with you. Tell us about Gage Cannabis. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Fabian. I'm the CEO and director of Gage Cannabis. We are a vertically integrated operator in the larger vertically integrated operators in the state of Michigan. We're publicly traded in the ICC under the symbol GE. GF. Um, we'll promote one of cultivators. Uh, at the end of this year, we right now have eight different cultivation facilities producing Gage and Cookies branded product in Michigan. We have nine dispensaries. Moving to our internal goals to move to 20 operating dispensaries by the end of the year. And we have two processing assets that are current in operations. Soon to three, our processing asset will be the processing lab and our introduction into the track based product side of the side of the game. I'll stop there and, and let everybody. Else know. <clears throat> Thanks, Sorry, I was muted there, Fabian. I was going to interrupt you because you were um, your Wi-Fi was a little glitchy. So we might come back to you. Hopefully, the, we can get uh, get it all working for you. Um, why don't we start with you, Louise Melchon? Tell us about Flora Growth, please. Anna, uh, thank you so much, and once again, thank you to Benzinga for uh, giving us this this platform. I I too, I'm looking forward to the day where we can do this in person. Uh, but a little bit about myself. My name is Luis Merchant. I'm the president and CEO of Flora Growth Corp. We're a NASDAQ listed company under the ticker FLGC, and we actually just went public on May 11th, which marked a significant milestone for our company. Uh, Flora Growth is an all outdoor cannabis cultivator with a portfolio of products across multiple industries in which cannabis uh, will generate a disruption. Um, as I mentioned, the company listed on May 11th, but it was founded in 2019, and we went through, uh, through the significant hurdles of raising capital and taking the company public throughout the pandemic. And I cannot wait to talk to the Benzinga audience about our path. Wonderful, thank you, Louise. Uh, Kyle, tell us about your company, uh, Glass House Group. So as you can probably see by the way I'm dressed, I'm out here in Los Angeles, out here in California. Uh, Glass House Group is a vertically integrated company in California, only California. And um, we have one of the largest current cultivations, about half a million square feet. We have four retail stores from Southern to Northern. Um, we have manufacturing and we have, last I checked, it was the number two flower brand in the largest uh, market in the world, California. And um, so that, that's who we are today, although we're going through uh, the public process with a SPAC. Wonderful. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Fabian, let's try one more time because I wanted to make sure that we could find out a little bit more about Gage. Do you want to try one more time and tell us about Gage? Sure. Yeah, no, feel free to interrupt me if uh, there's the same problem again. I'm the CEO and director of Gage Cannabis. We are one of the larger vertically integrated cannabis companies in the state of Michigan. Michigan is already the third largest uh, state city on a monthly basis. Uh, they had 154 million in sales in the month of April. Uh, that's well ahead of many of the other larger uh, markets, including Illinois, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're right behind actually only Colorado, California. Uh, having eight cultivation assets that are currently in operation, growing Gage and Cookies branded product. We have nine different uh, retailers that are open as well. To hopefully by the end of this year, our internal additional stores and we get processing out. 
Okay, so we, we got most of that. It was better this time. I wonder if I can turn off the cam. Sometimes that helps with so that we can just get the dialogue. I will point out that Gage Cannabis is listed on the CSC and we have done lots and lots of stuff with them. So you can always go to the CSC website and see their newly listed clips as well as other interviews that we've done with them. So if you want to find out more information about them. Um, Fabian, let's try again, see if this works without the video. Are you there? Are you there, Fabian? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, let's try because okay. I was going to start. I was going to start with you because um, okay. I wanted to talk about um, Reggae Plus and 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 this direct listing that you did in Canada. Um, I will stop you if you do get glitchy, and we'll jump on to uh, the other two participants. Hopefully, we can we can get you at the end. Um, so so Gage Cannabis is based out of Michigan, as you mentioned, and before it went public, it did what's called a Reggae Plus. Now, this is a platform within the U.S. where you're allowed to raise upwards of fifty million dollars uh, to non-accredited investors. And this is really important for companies out there because raising capital for only accredited investors can be a, a big task. So it allows, um, you know, it, it has obviously boundaries around how you can do it, but it allows you to raise capital in a bit of an easier way privately. Um, so, so Fabian, why don't you start telling us about that raise? Because it was that raise, I believe people were trying to oversubscribe. It was a very anticipated raise, wasn't it? Yes. So, yeah, we launched our financing back, back in 2020. Uh, we were the race uh, probably in history from a cannabis company perspective to raise Okay. I, you know what, Fabian, I'm going to stop you because I just don't want to, um, I don't want to miss any of the content. Maybe they can help you log out and back in. I'm going to jump back on with, um, with Louise. Hopefully we can get Fabian sorted. Um, who are we going to next? Oh, okay. Let's, you know what? Let's actually move to Louise because we're going to talk about um, his move. He did a capital raise, a pre-IPO capital raise privately. And then he did an IPO on the NASDAQ. Um, there's not as many IPOs done on the NASDAQ in or directly in U.S., um, stock exchanges in the cannabis sector. The reason being is that uh, because it's still federally illegal within the U.S., it's not as easy. Uh, well, you can't be a U.S. company that touches the plant and be on a stock exchange. Now, Louise, you're based in Columbia where it's um, where it's legal. So you have the opportunity to list with the NASDAQ. So why don't you start by telling us about your pre-IPO raise? Because you raised, I believe, 30 million. Is that right? That's correct, Anna. And and, and I'll, I'll, I'll clarify a couple of comments that you made. Our company sure. was actually founded in Toronto. 95% um, of our operations are in Colombia, including our cultivation farm, as well as our laboratories and, and our brand development uh, product team. Uh, but you're absolutely right. In 2020, we actually ra launched a reggae offering to, to raise capital. And just in similar to, to Gage Industries, as you were, as you were highlighting, we completed a $30 million raise. Uh, you, with, with a reggae offering, you can raise up to $50 million. We requested a $30 million cap from the SEC, and we were always subscribed by October of 2020. We, we were always subscribed, and we closed the, the pre-IPO equity raise around November, December. Uh, what we were left with was a diverse base of, of, of investors, about 10,600 investors, 85% of which um, we're located in the United States. And that signaled to us that we had enough interest, not only from the investor community, but also from uh, from American investors. Uh, and, and that's the reason why we decided to, to go the, the NASDAQ listing. Wonderful. And so, so first of all, I think the one thing that's important to note about uh, the Reg A Plus is it gives you the opportunity to build out your distribution, which is very helpful if you want to do the IPO route and you have that distribution. Um, tell us a little bit about the go public process in the US. Was this easy for you to do? Was it easy to raise the capital um, and the process itself? As you probably can imagine, and the and the uh, and the audience can 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 imagine, it's not an easy process. Um, clearly, us having the the investor base that we had after we closed the the reg A and being able to raise the thirty million dollars gave gave us the confidence that we could execute on going on going public through through the Nasdaq IPO. But uh, you you probably, as you mentioned, the, the cannabis industry is highly regulated. There's there's very high barriers of entry. And a number of, of, of obstacles that you need to cross in order to be listed in a, 
an exchange such as NASDAQ. Um, we, however, decided to take this route for a number of reasons. Uh, we believe that it will allow us to show uh, our investor community that we were going to be stewards for the capital. It will legitimize our company and show that we're doing everything according to the, the toughest and strictest regulations and uh, according to capital markets that are out there and will allow us to also have access to additional uh, capital that will allow us to expand our, our infrastructure and our reach worldwide. And do you find, what is the market saturation in Colombia? I know that Colombia became a country of favor in the capital markets at one point just because the margins are so amazing there. Is there a lot of competition in Colombia? What, what do you find within the capital market space? Uh, not, not really, Anna, not in terms of, of, in, of investment. Um, early on, there's about, if, if, I, if I summarize for you the, the state of the uh, cannabis industry in Colombia, the, there's a, a lot of favorability from the government. Clearly, the government believes that cannabis will be a significant contributor to economic growth for the country over the, ne over the next decade, which means there's a lot of support to grow the, the industry, which is favorable for investors. Uh, however, there's been about 700 licenses that have been given to growers in Colombia, and of those 700 licenses, about 60 are in, in operation today. Um, less than half probably are following is solid operational standards that will allow them to export, and all but a handful are, are currently listed on exchange and have a strategic plan that will allow them to, to execute on a strategy of, of export and global expansion. Super interesting. And I mean, I guess the other thing too, is that having that shareholder base in the US of 10,000 shareholders, I know that in the US, there's a there's a severe appetite to invest in cannabis and, and it's not quite as straightforward, right? You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, clearly it signals that the, the investor base that we have signals that there's a tremendous appetite to, to uh, invest in, in the cannabis industry. And us going public into NASDAQ presents us as a very attractive opportunity to the investor community. Uh, but to highlight some of the comments that you made er, 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 early on in terms of uh, retail and institutional investments, there's also an appetite from institutional investors that is growing rapidly as regulations continue to ease and, and, the, and access to capital markets continues to become a, a, more, um, a more accessible goal for, for cannabis industries. Very interesting. Um, okay, we're going to move on to Kyle for a moment. Uh, Kyle has um, a whole other path that he took, although he did raise capital privately as well, but he is going down a different route in the go public process. Um, Kyle, first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience raising capital privately? You said earlier in our pre-chat that you, you had to get pretty creative, which I think a lot of people have had to do, um, even including debt as well as equity raises. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about your capital raising in the private sphere, and then we'll talk about how you're going to go public. Sure, 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 sure. So um, coming into cannabis, um, you know, if you look me up, you'll see I have a pretty interesting background. And one of the things I used to do when I was a police officer after college here in, in Southern California is I would, during the nighttime, I would drive my police car and go after gang members and things like that, try and do gang suppression. During the daytime, I would find troubled apartment buildings and uh, where I could use my drug and gang expertise to clean them up. And then I go out and raise capital to do that and put in, you know, do private equity. And typically I'm a contrarian. So I like to do it during the financial crisis, during the RTC. So I'm used to difficult, challenging times to raise capital and then to boot, you know, put it in a t difficult area of, of LA um, with, when it's gang infested. So anybody that flies out here from anywhere in the world to see what I'm looking to invest in, <clears throat> it's um, it, it really grabs your attention. So I started doing that in 1996. I didn't start raising capital for cannabis until about 2015, 2016. By then I had quite a, a large investor base and I, I um, so far I've never had a, a, a situation go south. So I have good reputation with my investors. This is the biggest capital dislocation I'd ever seen. Debt was, at the time, I mean, even today, debt is very expensive vis-a-vis -vis everything else out there, every other industry. And so when it came time to bring to private investors, which are high net worth individuals, um, a little bit of it, a lot of it was just betting on the jockey that they'd had good experience with me. A lot of people felt strongly that cannabis was going to be legalized and that as long as we invested smartly and could weather the storms, um, that, that this would likely have a good outcome. So... Um, 
as it turned out, um, we, we end up just starting to buy uh, assets. We typically buy the real estate because rents are crazy high. Um, and as I mentioned, you don't want to put debt on because it's really incredible. So what I would do is when we would have open funds before we rolled them all into Glasshouse Group is that I would sometimes create a debt instrument where I, I you know, when you're in real estate, you're always doing a balance juggle between debt and equity. And so I would just create my own instruments and I would sell them to different investors um, and make sure that they, you know, it wasn't a noose, a future noose around my neck. So um, I have, you know, luckily I've had many, many years of experience. Luckily, I have a lot of, of happy investors that I, they also referred people because let's face it, you know, unlike say apartment buildings worldwide where there's tons of people doing private equity deals and there's tons of, you know, you can go to Sam Zell, you can, there's lots of REITs you can, you can invest in. Cannabis, you know, we started in 2015, 2016, not a whole lot of real, real places until some of the folks started accessing the public markets in Canada. So, um, and, and I would envision that after we're through this public process and we're a publicly traded company in, in a few weeks, that we will still do some private, um, private equity raises, some private debt raises, things like that, because, um, you know, like it or, or not, it's just one of my sweet spots. And I, and I think people want to play in the, in the space, whether they're investing, you know, um, in the public, the pubco, or whether they want something more dialed in, you know, in a project or, or, or real estate or something like that. So, um, you know, by and large, most of the companies out there are using uh, private equity. Most do not have the um, the public currency, and it's and it's not an easy process. You have to be pretty sizable to do it. So, and I can attest, not an easy process to take a a plane that's flying, and then while you're doing that, to do a bunch of audits and, you know, the the SPAC situation is, you know, it's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. So you've done some raises um, privately as and built up out the Glasshouse Group. <clears throat> and what you're about to do is you're going to enter into a transaction with a SPAC. So just for those of you out there who don't know, um, if you've been living under a rock for the past year, what a SPAC is, that is a special purpose acquisition corporation. These are coined as blank check companies. And essentially what they're done is it's a prospectus, it's a public company that goes to market um, with the purpose of raising capital to go out and acquire assets. Um, they have become very much in favor within the market. I think the last quote I heard in 2020 was that SPACs had raised over $20 billion uh, within the year. Um, and I'm sure that number keeps rising. So they've been an opportunity for people to build out these companies and then go and acquire um, private companies that are already out there within operations. Um, and so this is a transaction that you are currently working on, right, Kyle? So, so yes, we are, um, and it's, it's public out there, the prospectus is out there. Um, we're way far along. We're in the middle of the transaction as we speak right now. Um, and again, there's lots of, of information about that. Um, you know, the, SPAC is sort of a loaded, it depends, you're watching CNBC or MSNBC, sorry, or, or Fox Biz or whatever. And some people love the SPAC, some people hate, hate them. And what I would tell you is if you're an investor, the best way to go into it, or if you're a company like mine, is to see what exactly this blank check company is going to acquire. So for us, when we, uh, we met up, I'm a, I'm a big jockey over the horse guys. And I really like, uh, you know, John Sandelman, is the promoter behind this particular SPAC. He was the one who did AYR or AIR um, that has done very, very well. And so when he approached us, we sat down with him and his team and my team and I sat down. We said, what is it that you want to buy with your blank check company? And he, he shared with us some companies that he was looking at and we have, he was California focused. We of course knew them and we said, let us tell you what the reason why we're at the table. And so we have over a 5 million square feet a uh, greenhouse project that's already built out. We could buy it well below replacement cost. It's, it's basically the second largest greenhouse facility in the United States. And it's everything you want for cannabis, light, uh, temperature, everything is, is right here. And, and it's green and so it fits California, everything. And then we also had a bunch of retail licenses with a group called Element 7. And so what we really needed was capital. So then the question is, 
okay, do you want to use this as a partial exit? And the way I looked at this, and, and I think the, the, the folks on the panel and many in, in, in the audience would tell you, we're still illegal. There's likely a big pop coming. And this is a brand new industry. We're not even using alcohol. We're not even 1933 yet. So we literally took zero money off the table. We looked at this as, a, as an expensive financing and an ability to raise more capital than we would, uh, we would have been able to do in an IPO. So if you look at how SPACs were originally set up, what they're set up for, it's pretty much this. It's to finance, it's acquire. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take over the PubCo um, SPAC. So I'll be the chairman CEO of uh, the new company as we and we will acquire a lot of retail licenses and we'll acquire this massive facility. So um, and everything about it fits to everything that we've we've done so far. So all of our investors uh, are in here now for for the long haul, meaning, you know, we're, we're in this believing that we will be able to, to drive value as we turn on these assets and uh, drive top line revenue and, um, and EBITDA. So we're really excited. It's going to take us a little bit of time, as you can imagine. California is maybe the toughest state to play in because it's the most capitalistic. And we also have the longest legacy of the illicit market. But uh, overall, I'm really excited by this. Um, I hear people knocking SPACs and I would say, just look at them individually, just like you would a person or another company. And so, um, and the main thing is once, once this transaction is over, we're just a public company. The whole SPAC moniker, unless you remember that that's where we were um, originated from, it's almost like, were you born via C-section or natural? That's the, nobody knows. And well, that is that's the first time I've been it compared to something like that. So that will stick with me forever, Kyle. And I think you bring up a really good point, right? And here's the thing is that this is a this is a route to raising capital. So so what the company has done is it's gone public with the capital infused into it. Investors are believing in the management team to be able to execute the fact. And I believe they have two years to go and execute the fact that they have to acquire assets. Um, and once once the acquisition has occurred, you're a public company like any other. If I remember correctly, Kyle, this will be listed on the NEO exchange in Canada. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, it will be on the NEO and also the OTC in the US. And on the OTC. And that's the other thing is we're seeing a lot of companies that are coming to Canada to list um, on our exchanges if they're US focused. And then they go and they get their OTC ticker, which allows US participants to invest in them. Um, thank you so much, Kyle. We'll we'll bring you back and talk about it a little bit more. I'm going to try again with Fabian. Hopefully we got Fabian all sorted. Fabian, let's talk about your route to going public. You raise capital with a Reg A+, plus, um, and then a very, very anticipated Reg A+, plus that was oversubscribed, and then you listed with the CSC. So tell us about your path. Sure. Hopefully you can hear me all right, and I apologize for those earlier difficulties. Uh, so we raised, uh, we raised our $50 million via Reg A process uh, back in the fall. We were one of the quickest companies to get there. Uh, frankly, I think in history, um, for any other cannabis company that completed a Reg A, we had over 1,100 subscribers, and we were well oversubscribed. Uh, so it was really a, a blessing and, and very humbling experience to see how much demand we had uh, for, our, for, our, for our brand and for our company. Uh, after that, essentially, it was, it was done quasi-private placement-like. The only difference was you had the opportunity for U.S. retail investors to participate, and which obviously plenty of them did with us getting over 1,100 shareholders um, in, our, in our cap table. Uh, post that, we went public via long-form prospectus in Canada and uh, listed on the CSE on April 6th. <clears throat> Wonderful. And and so here's the thing, and it's funny because Kyle actually brought something up earlier that I think is really interesting to point out. And that is that, you know, the I remember the Reg A Plus coming to market. I believe it was in 2015, and it wasn't used a lot. It took a it took a while for that adoption to occur. Kyle kind of brought up SPACs have been around for quite a long time, but when it comes to the sector of cannabis, it makes a lot of sense. And and there's a lot of reasons it makes a lot of sense, and that has a lot to do with the fact that you still don't have banking in the U.S. Um, and you still you know are federally illegal there. So doing a SPAC elsewhere where you can get these management teams and these checks cluttered collected makes sense. Reggae Plus, I feel like, Fabian, do you feel like that's the same, that Reggae Plus has really exploded within the cannabis sector? 
Yeah, I think it was something that, you know, wasn't really being used for, for quite a bit. And I'd say over the past, uh, you know, for the first the first year, it was used quite a bit. Then it took a kind of two year hiatus. And then it was back with a with a vengeance, I'd say, in the past 24 months. I think, you know, the past 24 months, if you took a tally or a, a poll of how many retail participants were, you know, investing in just the general stock market, let's call it 24 months ago versus today, I think you'd see it be a extremely big and stark difference. Um, there's been really a huge, huge rise of the retail investor. And I think coupled with that, you'd see, you know, ways of retail investing continue to increase and, and reggae is one of them. And so I think you're going to continue to see Reg A Plus as a, as a great way for U.S. based companies to go and raise capital from retail investors before they go public or even while they're private. Uh, really opens the door to a whole variety of other investors uh, rather than just focusing on you know, your typical high net worth and institutional investors that you have in the U.S. And with that as well, uh, you just get a better brand following. Um, I, I know, you know, there's been a variety of other companies that have you know gone public via reggae as in doing a reggae first and then going public. Uh, I think just having that brand following, having that amount of shareholders before you do go public is just is just a great and comforting way to ensure that your story is really getting out there. People are aware of your story. You're getting that recognition. And, you know, for us, it was a very, very beneficial process and obviously something we would do a thousand times over if we could. Fabian, now you are, uh, you're essentially based in Michigan. I'm sure that that somewhere in the background, well, I'm not sure, but there might be plans to expand beyond Michigan's walls. Um, but you're mainly focused there. Um, do you think that when or if the U.S. ever federally legalizes cannabis, do you think that there'll be a race to U.S. exchanges? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think what continues to 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 plague the industry is just the the small mini handcuffs that we have, and there's a lot of them. Uh, you know, from banking, from the listing abilities, um, from the tax, uh, you know, potential consequences with 280e. I think once we start to get rid of these little small handcuffs that continue to plague our industry, and obviously being able to list on a U.S. recognized exchange is one of them. I think the industry is going to explode. Uh, just for even from a custodian standpoint, obviously, you know, we're really happy with the CSC and, and what the CSC has been able to do for us uh, as a company. But, you know, when you take a look at who is able to invest, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of, you know, a restriction there, especially U.S. based investors. Uh, when you take a look at maybe from a worldwide perspective, who is able to invest, uh, you have further restrictions. And I think even from a custodian standpoint, especially because cannab cannabis is federally legal, you have issues there as well. With, you know, something like the Safe Banking Act, and I say something like, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly how it was originally proposed, but something along those lines being introduced, given us the ability to list on the NASDAQ, like, like, like Luis uh, ha has obviously benefited from, I, I think you're just going to see an explosion in interest, in capital, and frankly, abilities uh, and speed in which the companies execute, because now they have the capital to go and really, really execute on, 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 their, on their strategy in, in a quicker way. But more importantly, just the, the recognition you get from listing on a U.S. exchange is, is really second to none. And do you think that um, do you think that that's what investors are preparing themselves for there as well as companies? Let's do these reggae pluses. Let's list on exchanges kind of outside of U.S. borders, um, you know, in anticipation that this will occur. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think at the end of the day, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of talk and talk and talk, uh, not really a lot of action, not, nothing really that tangible that's happened. I think at the end of the day, if we can continue to see progress, yes, it's positive, but we really want to see actually something tangible finally come and we're, we're kind of still waiting. Absolutely. Um, okay, Fabian, I'm so glad that we got your Wi-Fi all sorted and I will yeah. hopefully jump back to you before the end of this. Um, Louise, I wanted to jump back to you because I think this is something that's important everyone has touched on is, you know, one thing is this, this dire intrigue to participate in the sector within the capital markets. You mentioned that you had 10,000 people that participated. Um, the one benefit for these companies that really is important is liquidity. If you have a lot of shareholders who have invested, it helps build liquidity within in your stock. Has that helped you as you guys have been listed on the NASDAQ? Of course, for a number of reasons, but I have to comment on Fabian's Wi-Fi as well. So good. Night and day, Fabian. <laughs> I was using 56K before. Now, now I'm on some real internet, so I'm good. <laughs> oh, 
but uh, but for all the reasons you you, you mentioned and the, all the reasons that Fabian mentioned, I think he was he was being a great spokesperson for my company and the path that we took. Clearly, uh, the 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 wide diverse investor base that we have paired with our listening Nasdaq is presenting us with a tremendous opportunity because now we have multiple ways to raise capital um, and. And that allows us the flexibility and it also allows the confidence for the investor community to invest in a cannabis company such as ours. Um, but I also want to highlight, Anna, that, that even though the path is, is arduous and difficult, there are companies such as Kyle's and Fabian's and mine that are finding ways to, to raise capital and get to, into exchanges, whether they're Canadian or, or U.S. based. And that just highlights the fact that, that uh, the, the regulations and the markets are getting ready for a more mainstream access in the cannabis. Absolutely. Well, I was intrigued this week to see that Amazon has now um, started supporting the sector in the way that it did in anticipation. And if Amazon feels a certain way, I feel like we all do somehow. <laughs> Kyle, I have a question for you. Um, you know, talking about the SPAC world, the SPAC world, um, I didn't know a lot about it. Obviously, I've learned about it over the past few years because it's really started to come to Canada and come to market. I think the main reason we didn't see as much of it in Canada is because I believe, if I remember correctly, you need at least 40 million um, as initial uh, capital infusion. In Canada, I don't know if our capital markets even equal California, let alone um, um, what's available in the U.S. So traditionally, we've seen a lot more SPACs in the U.S. Do you think if it goes federally federally legal, SPACs will just go insane? God, that's a great question. Um, let me say when it goes federally legal. The when is a is an unknown, but I think everybody watching this thinks it's just it's not an if, but a when. Um, <clears throat> you know. I've heard that U.S. regulators are going to really tighten up SPACs because there are some things about them that have um, given heartburn to the SEC and the regulators. So, um, and SPACs were in favor some years ago, and then they came back um, more recently. And as I mean, we're sitting on a thirty-four thousand Dow. We're seeing a little bit of craziness out there, and. So a lot of things do well here when maybe they shouldn't, like AMC is going crazy and GameStop's going crazy. And, you know, I'm not a Bitcoin guy, but that's going crazy and then crashing. So we're in, a, we're in some interesting times. Um, so what I would tell you is when federal legalization comes, you asked a, um, a great question to, uh, to, I think it was Luis when you said, um, are you going to see, um, are you going to see a lot of migration to the U.S.? I think you will start seeing the capital markets here just go absolutely crazy. But right now, the longer this stays, you're gonna see more things happen in Canada. And I wouldn't be surprised to see more SPACs um, happen up in Canada. It's, it's a good way to come into a, a very tough environment, um, you know, which is cannabis and acquire companies. It's, it, it's a good way. Used correctly, I, I'm a big fan of SPACs. Used incorrectly, not so much. Well, and that was my question is, I mean, obviously we're seeing lots come to Canada, but, but SPACs have this two year window that they can, that they can live without this acquisition and have a history of people building it. I've met some groups who that's all they do is build SPACs. Do you think the SPAC um, sector in the U S will explode? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like, it seems like that's the trajectory. Um, okay. I only have five minutes left. I wish I had more time with you guys. Cause there's lots more that we can dive into. Um, I do want to say as part of the, the Canadian securities exchange, it's been such an honor for us as exchanges in Canada to be able to host, um, amazing companies such as yourselves, Louise, obviously not you, but, um, but it's, it's been such an amazing opportunity for us in Canada to be able to participate in this. Um, one that is unique for most of us to see genera or generationally. Um, and I think that we'll continue to reap the benefits of it going forward. We've made a home for a lot of investors and a lot of companies. So um, I'm excited for us here that we got to be a part of this and excited to see what happens. Um, my last question of the afternoon is what do you see happening next, uh, you know, for your company um, and for the sector itself within the capital markets? Um, Louise, why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you, Anna. And once again, it was a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to meet Kyle and Fabian. They're doing an incredible job with both of their companies. Uh, as a NASDAQ listed company, and I have to remind our, our, our viewers, uh, we are under the ticker FLGC. We have hit a significant milestone by uh, publicly listing on May 11th. Now we are going uh, undergoing a period of a strategic expansion. We, we are going to 
expand our distribution into North America, the European markets, as well as APAC. We have a robust portfolio of products that is going to allow us to, to expand across multiple industries, not, not only dry flour and crude oils. We're also working on industrial uses for cannabis, such as, as uh, hemp textile clothing. Uh, so it's very exciting to, to see there's many ways in which this sector is going to drive influence across multiple industries. And I think over the, the short and long term, we're going to see uh, the capital interest, institutional investment is going to uh, uptake as companies start delivering, delivering some stronger fun fundamentals and regulations ease. And as Kyle mentioned, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when federalization happens. And I believe that when that happens in the U.S., the rest of the world will follow and the companies that are poised to, to take advantage of the global distribution are the ones that are going to be market leaders. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louise. Fabian, what about you? What What's going to happen um, both with Gage and both your view of what's going to happen in the continue to happen in the cannabis sector? Look, I, I think we're going to have still a lot of you know interest and strength in the cannabis industry. Um, not as much as we obviously want, but you know, there's a lot, a lot of people looking at the industry, doing their homework, even if they're not able to invest. You know, it, it seems like every day or you know every week. Um, you know, I have a meeting with someone that's looking at the industry, potentially looking to invest, potentially will invest in the next little while. So just a wide swath and large swath of, of potential investors that are going to come to this industry over the next, you know, 6, 12, 18, 24 months, 36 months is, is going to be staggering. It's, 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 it's one of the, the, the best opportunities from a capital market standpoint that I could possibly think of in the past 100 years. So for us, you know, those that are already publicly listed, it's, it's a massive milestone. Um, obviously, Kyle soon to be uh, soon to be listed himself. Uh, it's it's great to be out there. It, it, it's great to be a part of that club. I think you know you get also better brand recognition not only from a consumer standpoint but also from an investor standpoint by being publicly traded. You're kind of the first that you know someone will go to when and if there is a big inflection point in the industry as a whole. You know, for Gage, we're going to stay focused, uh, trying to keep our eye on the prize of being the number one operator in Michigan. And really, that's what we're focused on in the next little while. The regulatory backdrop, we obviously ha it can't, can't change anything there. We can't move anything um, you know, for, for whatever we do. So for us, we just stay focused on our company. And I'm sure everyone you know, on, the, on, the, on the conference here today, as long as we you know, continue to stay focused you know, with what we want to do and what our strategy is and what our goals are, I think at the end of the day, the regulatory piece will take care of itself. <clears throat> Well said. Thank you so much, Fabian. Uh, Kyle, let's end off, end off with you. What are you excited about? I mean, obviously you have a lot going on with Glass House, so there's lots going on for you in the next year, but what are you excited about for the company? I know there's other companies joining you, but also just the sector itself. Yeah. So number one, what excites me at this very moment was being with you and Luis and, and uh, Fabian, you know, both good companies. I learned stuff today and also in the prep meeting. Um, and so I'm really honored to be with them. You know, what, what gets me inspired out here is most folks, if you talk to the investment bankers in New York and in Canada, they think half of the brands are going to come from California. You know, we're sort of in that, you know, I always keep a bottle of Napa wine. You know, Appalachian, I think, matters to a lot of people. And we have a long, long tradition here in California of cannabis, and we have hugely discerning customers that know good from bad uh, pot. And so I, I'm really excited. I think we've gotten one of the choke points out of the way, which would be uh, a very low cost supply chain at high quality and also the retail part of it. So the shelves, you know, we have over 1500 brands in the state right now, and that's going to continue to go. And, and those are going to be the choke points. The middle are building brands. We've got some good ones now. Really excited about about those opportunities. And, you know, I uh, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong Californian, so I'm where I like to be. And um, I, I'm just super excited about the space. I don't really worry about things like when when legalization happens. I try not to lose sleep about things that I can't control. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just very, very bullish. And this is a fun ride um, that we're all on right now. We're, you know, we're playing in the illegal market. It's, it's very fun. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kyle. You know, the one thing I have to say about the three of you, you've obviously been in this sector for a long time. When this sector first came to market for us at the CSC, at the types of deals and the types of management teams that we saw, I mean, it has just exploded the type of professionals that you get to see. And you guys are really the ones out there, um, the leaders of the pack that are taking companies public, that you're raising capital. And the thing that's most important for people to remember is you're not shying away from disclosure and financial reporting and putting everything out there and running a really good business. So thank you so much to companies such as yourselves. I mean, it, it's so incredible to watch this sector. I, you know, one of my favorite stories is a capital raise that was done for Guinness breweries in the 1800s in London. Um, they, they went to open their, their private placement and people were throwing rocks through windows and police were clamoring to keep crowds of people back. And I think they went to raise like 19 million pounds and raise like 150 million pounds by the end of the day in the 1800s. And to me, that story reminds me of the cannabis space. There's an incredible amount of capital that is still sitting on the sidelines, uh, ready to act. So this, this sector is here to stay. Well said, Anna. <laughs> well said. Kyle, Luis, Fabian, thank you all very much. In the words of Gordon Ramsay, wow, wow, wow. Uh, that was awesome. I <laughs> really appreciate that panel uh, and the different strategies and paths you're taking. Uh, we'll talk to you all very soon. Anna, thank you so much for leading a wonderful discussion. Thank much you. Appreciate. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Take care. Thank you all. Awesome. Y'all, that is the conclusion of Benzinga's June February, <laughs> June Cannabis Capital Conference. I've been on camera for like two straight days, it feels like. Uh, but y'all, uh, I had a blast. I learned a ton. Uh, we got updates from a ton of public companies, both in the cannabis and psychedelic space, from Grogen, from Canopy, from TrueLeave, uh, from Item 9 Labs, from CBDD, from MCOA, from uh, 22nd Century, uh, Lowell Farms, Flora Growth, Gage, Fire and Flower. I mean, the list just goes on. Uh, this has to be one of the better agendas I've ever had the pleasure of working on and I've really ever seen in the cannabis industry. So I do. I just want to send a huge thank you out to everyone who participated into this event, all the companies, uh, all the investors. Uh, please take action. Tell us uh, you know, what came of this event for you. Send us testimonials. Send us feedback. Events at Benzinga.com. We want to hear it from you. And with that, I want to share the screen. Uh, we are going back to live events in October 13th and 14th of this year, but we still want to hear from you. Uh, would you feel comfortable returning to in-person conferences? Please take a moment to answer this. I'll leave the voting open for this so that we can have, um, you, can, you can tune in whenever you see this, and, unless, of course, it goes away, in which case it just goes away. But it'll be open for the foreseeable night. Uh, just so we can get as many answers as possible. Uh, Money Mitch. Mitch Hawk is coming up next at 5.30. First and foremost, though, Mitch is part of our wonderful YouTube team here at Benzing. 100,000 subscribers. That was achieved this morning on June 4th uh, due to the work, 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 the work from Mitch and Spencer and team. Uh, and cannabis is an active part of that. We have shows on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, in which case I just want to give a quick shout out to Javier for all the work he does on the editorial side. Uh, but him and I and Patrick co-host uh, a podcast every Thursday. You can also listen to us on Apple, Spotify. But Aaron, uh, just a real quick commercial for that. And then we'll be back on for a final send off and to announce who has won the Benzinga Pro giveaway. Uh, so Aaron, just a quick, sh uh, quick uh, commercial there. <laughs> to the Benzinga Cannabis Hour. There are more people who are in favor of legalization. I saw the benefits of it for myself. I just have to ask, was there pot pasta in the cannabis cookbook? Oh, it was gorgeous. There was pot pasta. They were... We were talking about cannabis pasta. That opened my eyes to the cannabis industry. Is this new industry where now billions of dollars are being made. We're here to bring cannabis into culture. All right, y'all. Uh, voting is going to remain open. However, I'm pulling the screen down. Uh, for the Mo, but voting will remain there. Um, all right. Uh, 
winner of the Benzinga Pro giveaway is Pat Mulligan. Congratulations, Pat Mulligan. You will not regret it. I use Benzinga Pro daily. Uh, it truly has been uh, portfolio changing, life changing if you invest enough money into your portfolio. Uh, so uh, Benzinga Pro, if you are not a subscriber, I'm sure there are deals. They have sales deals all the time. Uh, just look up Benzinga Pro on Google. You can explore what we have there. And with that, y'all, uh, that is the conclusion of my track. Uh, on Benzinga Cannabis Capital Conference. Much appreciate you all. Stay around uh, for Money Mitch. Uh, the man loves to dive into stocks, and you guys love him, so I'm sure you already know him. He's coming up next. Uh, Aaron, uh, huge thank you to you, uh, our producer, Nicole, for behind the scenes, and Sarah have been huge helps to me on this track. Uh, but Aaron is going to play us off with one more commercial, and we'll see you guys again in October. <laughs>